Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, The Bluebeard of Balak, starring Merle Oberon. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a star, Miss Merle Oberon, and a suspense play inspired by an actual recent news item from occupied France. And so, with the blue beard of Belloc and with the performance of Merle Oberon, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Stay back there. Back of the wall. How uh, how many were there this time? One. They found most of him. And? It was a soldier, a German. I heard it was an officer. Stay back. Back there. Come on. But uh, they're still digging? Yes. What officer was it, did they say? They back think it the was wall. Captain Muller. You know, the doctor. They think. They don't know. They're looking for his head. One, two, two. Of course, they found the body. Identify the body. Why don't they identify him? Identify him? The blue beard. Why they find out who he is? Listen, listen. Achtung, achtung. Villages of Belac, Saint Jean, Bralagnon, Fleury. Achtung. This morning's victim of the blue beard of Belac is identified as Captain Franz Müller, oh. medical officer attached to the staff of Colonel Strelitz. Oh, an officer. For the first it's time, the blue bear himself has been seen, and a description has been provided. Is described Monsieur, as being of medium... Yes. I must speak with Colonel Strelitz. Is he here? I have information. Information about what? About the blue beard. Is the colonel here? He's in the staff car. Over there. Please take me to him. I must see him. And uh, who are you? Cecile Combre. Madame Combre. I live on the road to Flome, just outside the village. Well, uh, all right. Come along, madam. Is that the colonel, sitting in the back of the car? Yes. Now, you wait here. I'll see. Over straight it, Corporal Brecht. Corporal. Over. There's a Frau from the Dorf here, and Madame Combre. She had angeblich information über den Blaubart. Naja, wieder so ein hysterisches Frauenzimmer, Herr Oberst. Was kann man da machen, Kreuzer? Ich meine, eine Möglichkeit. Wo ist sie? Dort drüben, Herr Oberst. Ich habe ihr gesagt, sie soll warten. Ordnung. Frau oh, Herkommen. Jawohl, Herr Oberst. The Colonel will see you, Madame. Oh, thank you. Das ist Madame Combré, Herr Oberst. Madame, this is my aide, Lieutenant Kreuzer. It was kind of you to let me speak with you, monsieur. Kind? Naturally, madame. When we were told you have information about the bluebird. Yes, I we have. You can't overlook anything. Now that he's killed one of my own officers. I know, I know. And I, I am next. So? Hmm. The bluebird is going to kill me. He's going to kill me tonight unless you help me. Unless you come home with me and stop him. This is your information? Yes. Why, every woman in Belak believes she is next on the Bluebeard's list. But I know. Madame, the Colonel's time is valuable. We thought you had real information. You don't expect us simply because you hysterically believe No, that... no, please. I know, Colonel Strelitz. How can you know? Because, monsieur. Because the Bluebeard is... is my husband. Why? Your husband is... Dr. Pierre Combre. Yes. He's the man you're looking for. I, I've known it for a long time. He is the blue beard. Tonight.
tonight for suspense, Robo Wines are bringing you a star, Miss Merle Oberon, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Bluebeard of Belloc by Sylvia Richards. Tonight's tale of suspense. In many foreign lands, wherever wine connoisseurs gather, they enthusiastically praise the distinguished character of Roma wines. Such praise of Roma wines in foreign lands can only mean that they are truly magnificent in quality. Roma wines' excellence is due to a unique combination of California's perfect soil and climate, from whence come the choice Roma wine grapes, plus age-old winemaking skill and modern knowledge. These combine to make Roma constant in quality, uniformly fine, unexcelled in value. Tomorrow, discover for yourself the delightful Roma taste and goodness enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. Simply serve as an appetizer before dinner a cool glass of golden nut-like Roma California sherry. Then on the table, place a bottle of cool, hearty Roma Burgundy. You'll be pleasantly surprised at the extra delight it adds to your meal, how it will win new compliments from family or guests. Yet... The cost is only pennies a glassful. Get Roma wines tomorrow. If your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Miss Merle Oberon as Madame Cécile Combré in the Bluebeard of Belloc. Tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Eleven o'clock. He'll be here in an hour. And if you had not come here with me... You have nothing to fear, madame. The house is well guarded. But... Won't the guards frighten him away? The instructions are to let him through. They will come in only when we have him trapped. And we are armed. Yes, and he does not carry a gun. You know, he uses a knife. Madame Combray, why didn't you come to us before if you knew your husband was the blue beard? First, I wasn't sure. Then, when I was sure, well, he was still my husband. Then why now? Because now he will kill me, and I'm afraid. I knew when he went away with the body of Captain Miller yesterday. Oh, so you saw the captain? Yes, I saw it. And when Pierre looked at me, I knew he'd kill me. Tonight. Yes, he may try. It's been weeks of fear. And the night, the endless nights. Have you been married long, madame? Long? No. Less than a year. You aren't French, are you? No. No, I'm English. I spent a summer in Flomé about four years ago, and I liked it. So I stayed. I taught English in the village school there. Dr. Combray? About a year ago, there was an epidemic in Flomé, and he, Pierre, came there to help. He seemed to me when I met him to be very kind, a very noble man. Of course, I didn't know him well, but when he asked me to marry him, I was very happy. The morning after we were married, he brought me here to Belac, to this house which had been his family's for many generations. It was a beautiful morning, early spring... We came, as you did tonight, up the hill, past the summer house, to the front door. Well, here it is, Madame Combré. (laughs) Come, I'll carry you over the threshold. Oh, careful, Pierre. Don't drop me. No chance of that. Now, this is the hall. Shall I carry you on from room to room? Oh, Pierre, no. (laughs) Put me down. Very well. Uh, Come this way. Now, here is the parlor. Oh. Hello, Captain Muller. Good morning, Doctor. I've been waiting. (laughs) I hope you don't mind. (laughs) They said you'd be back this morning, uh, the people down the road. Yes, I was held up by my wedding. Your wedding? Oh, I'm sorry. Cecile, this is Captain Muller, the medical officer in charge with Colonel Strelitz. Captain, uh, my wife, Cecile. How do you do here, Miller? Well, Doctor, (laughs) I congratulate you. I see even an epidemic can be useful. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, So what's up, Miller? 
Oh, uh, oh, 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 I wanted you to come in tomorrow to help with the vaccinations. About uh, 150 are going out and we need help. The last lot carried typhoid. I'd be glad to help. What time? Well, they are leaving at noon. Uh, if you're there at 8 o'clock, we'll have enough time. I'll be there. Very well, Doctor. Madame, tomorrow then. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Ah, now we will go on with our tour. Follow me. Dear, who's to be vaccinated tomorrow? All labor draftees being sent to Germany. Uh, this is the kitchen. The stairs go up from here. What's upstairs? Well, off that first landing there are several bedrooms, mine and others, and on the floor above still more. Before the war, there were servants. And this is a pantry? Yes. And this door, where does it... Why, oh, it's locked. What is it? Oh, that is an old wine cellar. It's not used. A cellar? Do you have a key? Uh, there's nothing down there, Cecile, that would interest you. Oh, but I'd like to see. We might be able to grow mushrooms No, or... Cecile, it can't be used. Let's look. Where's the key, Cecile. Here? Yes? That door must stay locked. But, Pierre... You understand? Yes, but... But why? No matter what happens, you must never try to go down there. Never. You see, monsieur, it was a small thing. Just a room I must not enter. He told me the room was used for his experiments, and I believed him. I was in love. But there were other things, and they added up to fear. Just the taste of fear. A shadow so light, I, I didn't know it was there. There was, first of all, the gossip I heard in the village when I went to market. Oh, good morning, Madame Combray. You're late today. Pierre worked late last night. Is there any milk, Madame Bourget? I can let you have a little pint. Oh, if that's all... Uh, does the doctor work often at night? Quite often, in his laboratory. Uh, I could not bear a man who potted around after dark. But it's his profession. Maybe, but I would not sleep a wink, not with this blue beard around. No, I like a man who is steady, so I know what he's up to. Oh, how can you bear to live in that big, depressing house? Oh, but I love it. Well, you're young. I suppose it's romantic to you. It's no place for a woman to be alone. The first Madame Combre, you know. She died there. Yes, Pierre told me. But I know he did everything he could. Oh, yes? It was very sudden. Typhoid can be very sudden. Yes, his certificate said typhoid. That's why your coffin was sealed. Oh! Jean! Jean, what is it? What is it? What's happened? Everyone's running. There's an announcement, madame. They know who one of them is. One? Uh, of whom? There were three last night. One of them was a man. Three? Why, why the Bluebeard, he killed three in one night. Cut them to bits. Oh, how terrible. All sliced up and scattered around, madame Cambray. Oh, you should have seen. Oh, no. Where, where were they? In the meadow north of the church. Why, that's near your house. The meadow? Yes, madame Cambray. If you had been awake, you would have heard him. You or the doctor. Yes, if I'd been awake, I would have heard. And one night, I was awake. My husband and I had gone to bed early and I slept well. I'd worked in the garden most of the afternoon. But shortly after 11, something, some sound woke me. It may have been only an owl screech... I lay in the dark and listened. I didn't hear it again. Then I heard another sound. And I saw there was a little moonlight. That my husband was out of bed and that he was dressing. Pierre. Oh, did I wake you? Pierre, what is it? Nothing, Cecile. Go back to sleep. Is, is someone ill? Did someone come for you? I have to go out. Go back to sleep, Cecile. I won't be long. Something woke me. I heard a sound. I'm sorry. Did someone come for you? Was it Captain Muller? No. Who is it, Pierre? Who's it? No one you know. Where are you going, Pierre? Do you have to go far? Go back to sleep. I won't be long. But, but, Pierre... I'm sorry I woke you. You didn't. I'm sure I heard... Cecile, it's best that you go back to sleep. I just wondered... It's best for you. Good night, Cecile. He went away, Colonel Strelitz, and I lay there in my bed... Rigid, listening to his steps down the dark stairs into this kitchen. 
I heard the front door open and close. Then he went down the gravel path in the moonlight. I waited. It seemed long, yet it was only a little time. That clock there, I could hear it through the floor, chime the quarter, then the half. When I heard him, it was not yet midnight, and he came slowly, climbing the hill. I slipped out of bed and went down the stairs to the landing there, from where I could watch him come into the kitchen. But when he came into the kitchen, I could not speak, for he was not alone. Over his shoulders, he carried a body. A man, I think. And he was stooped under his horrible burden. He crossed the kitchen without looking up and did not hear what I was sure he must hear, the pounding of my heart. He took a key from his pocket, holding the body with one hand, unlocked that door to the wine cellar and went into its awful blackness. Then I was back in my room. I don't remember how I got there, cold and shaking in my bed. When I heard... Oh, monsieur, it was pitiful. I heard rising from the depths of the house from where he had gone. The scream of a man in fearful agony. Cecile. Yes. Yes, Pierre. You are still awake. No, Pierre, I... I told you could go back to sleep. I was, Pierre, I did. But you are awake now. Something... I heard something. Yes, you heard... It must have been you opening the door. Oh. You came in suddenly. You must have... Yes, yes, I think I did. Well, we'll go to sleep now. Yes, we'll go to sleep. Pierre? Yes. Was someone ill? Yes. Who was it, Pierre? Did you have to go far? We'll go to sleep now, Cecile. What, what time is it? Time? It's just past midnight. Midnight was usually the hour, his hour. He always came back soon after. And the following day, there were always the announcements on the loudspeakers in the village. Bodies, pieces of bodies. It was the day when he and your men found Odette. It was so horrible for me, because she was so beautiful and still only a child. And you remember, the body was yet warm. So the whistles were blown, calling all the village to the church square. Because the bluebeard might still carry his knife or have blood on him. Or he might not get there and be known because he was missing. I was in the village and I ran to the square with the mayor. And we stood in line with the others. Everyone was there. Everyone except Pierre. What terror I felt. Monsieur, when you began to call the names. Felix Armand? Yeah. Paul Arden? Yeah. Uh, Madame Combray, are you ill? It's, it's just the sun. It's so warm, yet I feel chilly. You're very pale. Uh, here. Why, I don't see Pierre. Here, here. Oh, he's, he's probably with Captain Muller. He'll be here. Pierre Combray. Pierre. Here, here, I'm here. Don't look at me like that. You'll attract notice. You're out of breath. Where were you, Pierre? Does it matter? I'm here. But your hands, your clothes, they're wet. So you see, I still did not know. And I needed to be sure. I could not live unless I was sure. So I stole the key, the key to the cellar. Yes, it was that easy... While he slept, and the next day he went to the village with Captain Muller and left me alone with the answer in my hand. I opened the door and went down those steps, carrying a candle. We will go down there in a moment, Colonel Strelitz, to wait for him. And you will see there is a little room, bare and damp by the candle's light. I saw there was something on the table. It was his case, filled with knives, surgical instruments, not strange for a doctor. There was blood on them, fresh blood. And there was more on the table, on the floor, and much blood on a sheet which I found thrown into the corner. I found the strength to get out and to lock the door again. I put the key back that night. So again, I did not know. I did not really know until yesterday. I was sewing in the front parlor, and Pierre was walking up and down because he had an appointment with Captain Muller. 
captain was late. Careful, what's keeping Muller? Perhaps he got orders. More soldiers came into Belak yesterday. Many more. Yes, I know, but that shouldn't keep him. There's something going on. They're getting ready for something. Yes, but why would Muller... Do sit down, Pierre. Your walking makes me nervous. I've spoiled the seam and have to rip it out. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Some of the soldiers were searching houses yesterday. I don't know what they were looking for. Did they come here? Oh, no. At least not while I was here. I was in the village most of the afternoon. That's when I saw the soldiers. And there's nothing here to look for. Is there, Pierre? That's it, of course. Why didn't I think he's down there? Pierre, where where are you going? I'm going down to my cellar, Cecile. I have work. Pierre, no, not the captain. Yes, the captain and Cecile. I don't want to be disturbed. And then I knew he was going to kill Captain Muller. He was going to kill a German soldier. Worse, an officer. I knew then, Colonel Strelitz, that if he would go that far, he was no longer a man I could even attempt to reason with. His insane urge to kill might turn on anyone. Even me. I had to stop him. Ah! Cecile! Cecile, what are you doing? You can't come down here. You... you killed him. Cecile, now I'll have to... But I wasn't ready. It's not time. Captain Muller, they'll track you down. You you can't get away. Be quiet. I warned you. I told you not to. Murder. You did it. You killed him and the others. Cecile, I told you. What will you do now? Do? What do you think I'll have to do? Now, now you know too. And in a few minutes he'll come. And then it'll all be over. It's almost midnight. That's a remarkable story, madame. So he made no attempt to harm you last night? No, Colonel Strelitz. It wasn't time. Not time? He kills only when he feels the need. And he'd already killed one. So the need was gone. And it was daylight. He left then? Yes. I haven't seen him since. He looked at me. It was a terrible look. And he went. And I knew by the look that I would be the next. Tonight. And Captain Miller? He... He took the captain's body with him. Come, we must go down to the cellar now, before midnight. Very well. Lieutenant, will you bring the lamp? Yes, I'll bring it. You see, it's unlocked, as he left it. Close the door behind you, Colonel. Very well. Careful. The last step. Another door. Oh, it is small and damp. Is uh, is that the table where he... Yes. Set the lamp there, Lieutenant. You can see the stairs. They're quite dry by now. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. I see. And on the floor. Sit down, monsieur. There, where you can watch the door. I... I will stand here at the back if you don't mind. You're right. It's safest for you. Listen. I heard the clock strike. And, uh, yes, listen. It's a door. Have you your guns? Quiet. Yes, but we want to take him alive. You can. He's coming down. Cecile, are you there? Put your hands up, Dr. Hombre. Ah, visitors. Well done, Cecile. Scarcely visitors, Doctor. A bit more unpleasant for you. Now, if you'll... Put your hands up, Colonel Strelitz. You too, Lieutenant. Madame Hombre. I... Yes, I too had a gun. But your husband, he's... He's a... The bluebeard? I'll take your gun, Colonel, and yours. Mm-hmm. No, Colonel, I am no bluebeard, as you knew very well. It was clever of you to plant the mutilated bodies of your victims to drive me into the open. To create this legend of a blue beard to make the people of Belak suspect all men who work at night as I do. To make the village distrust me, their leader. But Madame Combray, 
You saw Captain Muller, saw his body. The captain? Yes. Pierre killed Captain Muller. He was his one victim because the captain was suspicious and pried a little too far into this room. Pierre had to kill him because he was... He saw our radio station behind that wall. Open it, Pierre, and let the colonel see. You see? The wall opens easily, and behind it is the nerve center for Belak, for our underground army. Army? Sneaks and cowards who set their women to lying. I lied? What else? You said that he carried in a body, that there was a scream in the night, that there was a body. All true, Colonel. Yes, I carried home a man wounded by your soldiers, and I removed the bullet without anesthesia, for we French have no such luxuries. So the blood of that patriot is mixed on the table with that of the late Captain Muller. Don't you know it's hopeless for you? Hopeless? Colonel, surely you know that our armies are in France, Americans, English, and our underground army which surrounds you? But this house is surrounded by my men! It was, you mean, Colonel. Are you still there, Mr. Porter? Porter? Yeah, what do you say, Doc? Everything quiet? Quiet as a tomb, Doc. All things down there. Who is that? We have what you call a couple of rats, Mr. Porter. Then we are finished. Okay. That is Mr. Porter. As you heard, he is an American. An American? You? He is commanding a large number of parachutists who just an hour ago dropped into our meadow. Oh. And who a few minutes ago very quietly killed the guards you mentioned. Killed? My God. Yes, and since you were here in the cellar, unfortunately, you could not hear. But now, Pierre, you have your work to finish. Your work? I have orders from my army to kill you and the lieutenant to secure this advance for our allies. So with Cecile's help, I set this little trap. Oh, listen to me. You won't. Cecile, no. do you want to share the honor? No, no, no. No, no, I won't. No, no. And so closes The Blue Beard of Belloc, starring Merle Oberon. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Have you discovered how much good wine adds to the enjoyment of food? How Roma wine makes even the simplest, most inexpensive meals really exciting events? Well, all you need do is place on the table with the meal... A cool bottle of hearty Roma California Burgundy. Serve it in any kind of glass. You will find it delicious with any food. And if you are entertaining guests, you will find Roma wine just the gracious, festive note that makes any dinner party or get-together a happy, compliment-arousing occasion. And remember, Roma wines cost you only pennies a glassful. So any home can afford the pleasure they add to everyday living to entertaining. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Merle Oberon is soon to be seen in the Columbia Technicolor production, A Song to Remember. Next Thursday, ladies and gentlemen, same time, you will hear Mr. Gene Kelly as star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is ChestertonRadio.com.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Dean, Johnny. Mono guarantee. Oh, hiya, Ralph. How are things? Rough. My wife could kill me, Johnny. For the insurance? No, just for kicks, because she's mad, because she wanted a mink coat. In short, she's a woman. I couldn't buy her a mink. I don't make that kind of money. You know how it is in the insurance game. Oh, sure, I know, Ralph. You're down to your last yetch. So what happens yesterday? I lose 80 mink coats, silver blue, worth $100,000. Gone, snatched, disappeared. Warehouse robbery? Check. Bandley Furriers out in Los Angeles. My wife's about to blow her stack. She says if I can't afford one fur coat for her, then how come I can pay for 80 of them that I haven't even got? How do you reason with a woman, Johnny? I never try. Usually I just send flowers. I've already done that. She ran them through the garbage disposer. So now what do I do? Buy some more flowers. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, 4312 Spring Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Silver Blue matter. <laughs> Item one, $152.40, telephone and incidentals and transportation to Los Angeles. I called the Mono Guarantee agent out there before I left and got a brief rundown on the case. Among other things, I learned that a man I'd known and worked with before, Detective Lieutenant Raymond Garcia, had been put in charge. And with Garcia on hand, I knew I could count on cooperation by the police. But I still wasn't expecting quite as much as I got. Flight 12 for Las Vegas, Salt Lake, Minneapolis, and Chicago, now loading. I knocked over the fur joint myself, Johnny. Garcia! The only way we get to see you. How have you been? Overworked, underpaid, frustrated, disillusioned, unappreciated. In other words, fine. (laughs) Got your luggage yet? Yeah, it's coming right there. Good. We ought to get moving. I've got a squad car outside. What's all the rush? We've got a guy downtown in the hospital I figured you'd want to talk to. Well, he'll wait, won't he? He'd probably like to, if he had any choice. He's dying? Kind of looks that way. He's one of the two night watchmen the gang slugged when they broke into the warehouse. And he's our big one, Johnny. He's all we've got. Has he been able to talk? A couple of sentences during the night. He's got to talk. What do you mean? He's the only one who got a look at them. When he did talk, what did he say? Gibberish, mostly. He did say one thing, though. They were kids. Just a gang of kids. Oh, that's going to make it rougher. Yeah, in a lot of ways. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Johnny. Come on, let's go. We took the freeway into town with the accelerator floorboarded and the siren screaming. Racing against time and against dying. Weaving in and out through the four-wheel madness that Los Angeles calls traffic. And then the other side of the coin. The solemn quiet of hospital corridors. The calm voices of the nurses. And the blank hardness of sterile white walls. We sat there beside a bed and waited for a man to talk or to die. But the slow minutes passed and he still did neither. So we waited. Guess that shot the doctor gave him is not going to have any effect. Apparently not. It's a crazy world, Johnny. No, just the people in it. I mean, yesterday, we'd never even heard of this guy. I still don't know his name. And 24 hours later, here we are, a couple of strangers, sitting around watching him die. Yeah, it's here on his chart at the head of the bed. Albert Christmas. Strangers. Not even family or friends. He didn't have any family or friends. He lived alone in a furnished room. Worked alone, too, except for one partner. So, a gang of punks jump him and bust his head open. I'm a bad cop, Johnny. I I get sentimental about things like this. How'd they work it, Garcia? It's a warehouse district. The streets are practically deserted at night. A police prowl car checks the street once about every 40 minutes, and they hit at 1.10 a.m., three minutes after the police had passed. Sounds professional. No. Just a smart bunch of kids. The only fur they seemed to know was mink. They passed up a dozen or so chinchillas worth twice as much. How'd they get in? I don't know. Chrisman hasn't been able to tell us. They must have tricked him into opening the door. What about Chrisman's partner? He was making his rounds. They slipped up behind him, slugged him. He didn't see them. He didn't know what hit him. 
And nobody outside in the street saw anything? Saw them leave with the furs or anything? Nope. Or if they did, they're not saying anything. Oh, it's a rough one, Johnny. We haven't got a thing to go on. Except Chrisman here. The shape he's in, that's only a straw. If he recognized any of them, if he lives long enough to identify... At least the poor devil can groan. I don't know. I think he's closer to being conscious right now than he's been in the last hour. Maybe you're right. Chrisman? Order? He wants a drink. Yeah. Here you go. That enough? You want some more? Who are you? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator from Hartford. I'm Lieutenant Garcia, L.A. Police. Warehouse. Look, kid, it's all right now. You're in the hospital now. It's going to be all right. My head... Do you feel like answering a few questions, Mr. Christman? Mm-hmm. It won't take long. Those kids, how did they get in? Telegram. Telegram? He showed me the telegram through the window. Yes. When I opened the door, one of them hit me. I... Did you get a look at the boy who showed you the telegram? Yes. I, I saw him. Yeah? Eighteen, nineteen. What did he look like? Five, nine... Ten, dark skin, black hair. Uh-huh. How, how was he dressed? Dark jacket. Hard to think. Any scars? Anything unusual about him? No. <clears throat> My head. Are you sure? Sure. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Any of the others? No. The only one. I... There was a mark. On his arm. What kind of a mark? My head. Oh, my head. What kind of a mark on his arm? It hurts too bad. I, I, I... Well, that's that. Yeah, he's passed out again. Well, we got a description. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Right in that area, there are about 50,000 kids who fit it. I talked with Mr. Banley, owner of the furs. Then Garcia and I went down to the warehouse. It stood on the fringe of the river bottom section, fronting the railroad yards and backed up by block after block of weather-beaten slum shacks. We looked through the warehouse, at the racks where the furs had hung, watchman's office where the gang had entered but knew how we did it that we were only going through the motions. The police technicians had already been over the place inch by inch, and they'd found exactly nothing. Finally, we stepped out the door into the street, a drab gray street cluttered with things cast off and discarded, dusty and hollow. There's the story of this whole district down here, Johnny, right there in that street. Yeah. It's a backwash, a service yard. It's something you need but don't like to look at, so you shove it out of sight. People you need, but don't want around. It's the same with them. You grew up down here, didn't you, Garcia? Yeah, I grew up down here. That's why they gave me this case. I know this section inside out. And that's why I told you this one was going to be tough. I think I get the general idea. Those kids came from that slum there to the east. One gets you nine on that. The people who live there aren't on our side, Johnny. If they do know anything, they won't talk, is that it? They wouldn't tell a cop the time of day. I don't mean they're criminals. Most of them aren't. It's just that they always put themselves on the other side. What about juvenile gangs? Do they operate around here? There are dozens of them. And there's another thing. A few of these gangs are pretty rough, and people who might talk don't because they're scared to. Oh, it's a great setup, Johnny. A fine place to look for a hundred grand in furs. You know, I've been thinking about the fact that they knew exactly the time to hit. They must have staked out here somewhere. Sure. And probably right in the place you're thinking. Hey, that lunchroom across the street? Oh, they had to be inside or the prowl car would have seen them. That's the only place open at night. Did you shake it down? Like I told you, Johnny, they won't give us the time of day. Uh-huh. What about me having a go at it? Yeah, maybe they wouldn't smell cop on you quite so strong. The owner's name is Red Wellers. He was on that night. See what you can get out of him if you want. I think I will. By the way, Johnny, 
I know you insurance guys make deals sometimes, no questions asked, just to get the loot back. Sometimes, yeah. Well, before you make any deal on this one, you better remember one thing. Chrisman may die. Say, Mac. Save your money. What do you want? Coffee? Yeah, I guess so. How's business? Buck or two a day. Farther in the hole. Want cream? No, I'll drink it black. Want to sink it with it? No, thanks. Are you Red Willis? So that's it. What do you mean? You're in a fur case, ain't you? Maybe. I thought you was the same one, but I couldn't be sure seeing you across the street. You come up with that cop Garcia a while ago, didn't you? That's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, you come to the wrong address, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. Who was in the lunchroom here just before the robbery? I don't remember. Any young kids here? No. It was all old men with long beards. I see. Ten cents for the coffee. Yeah, they got you real scared, haven't they? Haven't they? I don't know any of these. All right, look. You know Chrisman, the watchman over at the warehouse. He comes in. He didn't know any of these either. What about it? Nothing. Except he's dying. I'm at the Rokin's Hotel if you change your mind. Room 312, Johnny Dollar. Sorry, I don't see no use of me dying too. Follow me, Mac. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, fear stalks the streets, closing the mouths of a sullen and suspicious people, terrifying a lonely girl, and bringing death in a dusty alley. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. This is Red. Red Wallace, remember? Sure, sure. You run that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse that was robbed last night. Yeah, that's right. Now look, Dollar, supposing I tell you what I know about it, what's gonna happen to me? Nothing. 
As long as you weren't mixed up in it yourself. No, no, no. I mean the papers and the cops. If it gets out I talk to you, I won't last 24 hours. I think I can take care of that. What do you know about it, Red? That depends on what it's worth to you. I see. I'll have to sell out, get away from this section, so I'll need some dough. You follow me? All right. I'll see you taken care of. Now, just what is it no, you... No, no, no. I ain't safe. I'm talking from a booth. You stay right there at your hotel. I'll see you in a half hour. Right. Just you. No cops. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Beck. Mr. Beck. Uh, six quarts of milk and two pounds of butter. Sure, right away. Uh, thanks, Mr. Beck. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To the home office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the silver blue matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item four, 20 cents, a phone call to my friend Lieutenant Garcia of the L.A. Police and a call to Queen of the Angels Hospital. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who was slugged by the gang of teenage hoodlums during the warehouse robbery, was still unconscious. And Chrisman, unless Red Weller was ready to talk now, was the only lead I had toward finding $100,000 worth of silver blooming coats. I waited two hours and a half for Red Weller, but he didn't show. <laughs> Item five, $2.85, taxi to the warehouse district at the south end of the railroad yards. It was night by now, and the area was almost deserted. A lost, lonely district, shabby and worn, even in the softening darkness, and haunted now by fear. The only lights in the block were those shining from the windows of the warehouse office and from Weller's lunchroom across the street. Good evening. Hello. What would you like, sir? A cup of coffee, I guess. Oh, you're lucky. I just made some fresh. Good. Would you like some cream? No, thanks. No, that'll be fine. Is it foggy out? <sighs> yeah, a little... Not bad, though. Hey, this coffee's all right. You're a good cook. Thanks. The boss always has me make it when I'm here. He says I do it better than he does. I'll bet you do. Is the boss around, by the way? No, he he called me and said he had to go out. That's why I'm working. I'm on in the daytime, mostly. Do you have any idea where he might be? No. No, he had to go somewhere, I guess. What'd you want to see him about? He wanted to see me. Do you know where he lives? Well, he's got an apartment over on Marina. It's about eight blocks from here. Think he'd be there? No, he, he wasn't going home. He, he was going out somewhere. He, he acted kind of strange. I, I don't know what he was going to do. May I, may I ask just what business you're in? Insurance. Oh. I'm a special investigator. What do you mean? I'm working for the company that insured those furs. The furs that were stolen the night before last from the warehouse across the street. Oh. Something wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh? Can I help you gather up that silver? Oh, no, no, that's all right. I, gee, I, I, I don't know what happened. Just careless, I guess. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you live around here somewhere? Well, yes, yes, on Dalton, um, three blocks up. What's your name? Carla, Carla Monty. Why are you asking? How long have you worked here, Carla? About a year. Do many teenagers hang out here? What do you mean? Kids, 17, 18, 19. Do many of them come in here for coffee, hamburgers? Well, sometimes, yeah. I've never noticed much. Know any of them? No, no, no. I don't know any of their names. Are you sure? I don't ask them their names. Did I ask you your name? It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Well, I still didn't ask you. If you want to tell me your... What are you scared of, Carla? Nothing. I'm not scared. You're not? Of course not. Why would I be scared? For the same reason your boss is, Red Weller. He was scared when he talked to me this afternoon and when he phoned me later. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. That's why he didn't come to my hotel. He was afraid to. And why did you drop that silverware when I told you who I am? Because you're scared half to death. No. What's the matter with you people down here? What are you doing, crawling into a hole because a half-grown gang of hoodlums starts throwing their weight around? You don't understand. Then suppose you tell me about it. 
Do you think that's any kind of an answer in the long run? To pull the covers up over your eyes and let them do as they please and just keep hoping they'll leave you alone? All you're doing is making things worse. Oh, you don't know how it is. You don't have to live here. No, no, I don't have to live here, but I know how it is. Because I've seen it in other places where the mobs manage to take over. And if you let it happen here, then you'll really have something to be scared of. Maybe... Maybe they've already taken over. Who? Oh, a bunch of kids with a gripe on running in packs so they feel safe? Is that the kind of mob you mean, Carla? No. They're not a mob yet, but they will be if they're not stopped. It seems to me you'd have some sense of responsibility to them if nobody else. Maybe if other people had a sense of responsibility, kids wouldn't have to grow up in a place like this. Have you ever thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, I've thought of it. But it doesn't hold water. Well, you'd think so if you lived here. All right, so it's a slum district. And sure, these kids start out with a strike on them. But that's a pretty weak excuse for joining up at criminal bands and terrorizing a whole neighborhood, for slugging people and looting warehouses. Yes, yes, I know. Most of them find other answers. It's only a small minority that turns to crime. But if you let them get away with it, others will join them and they'll grow until finally it's too late. Well, Carla... Still nothing to tell me? I can't. I just can't. I see. Well, there's a quarter for the coffee. Keep the change. Good night, Carla. Wait. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, suppose... Suppose I, I knew someone who, who might be able to help you. I mean, I mean, who might know something about the robbery. Innocently, of course. Uh, if you talk to this person and, uh, and they agreed to help you, could you, well, could you keep them out of it? Depends on the circumstances. I do all I could, that much I promise. I don't know. I'm not sure. You're not sure of what? Of you. Oh, I, I know better when I stop and think, but I've lived in this neighborhood too long. Lived with these people and... I'm bound by the law like any other citizen. And I won't break it to help somebody cover up a criminal act. But I figure it's up to me sometimes to decide whether a thing is a criminal act. And if a person seems to deserve it, well, I can be pretty lenient. You promise what you just said? Yes, I promise. I've got to trust you. I've got to trust someone. Do you know such a person, Carla? Yes. Do you know where to find them? I think so. Well, I'm sure they'll be at one of two or three places. Not very far from here. And who is this person? Someone who grew up around here. A boy. Nineteen. What boy? My brother. Expense account item seven, two dollars and seventy cents, taxi. We went first to Carla's apartment where she lived with her brother, but there was no one there. Then we checked out a drive-in a few blocks away, a teenage hangout. No luck. Finally, we tried a pool hall down south of the yards, just off Alameda Street. It was our last hope. I know he comes here. It's not a good place for him, but a lot of the other kids do, too. And he wants to belong. Yeah, sure. Everybody does, in one way or another. Oh, gosh, it had been different if our folks had lived, but... Well, our boy just won't take orders from his sister. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. Thanks. Well, if he's not here, then I just don't know where he... Oh, wait. There he is. Down near the corner. The one with the dark curly hair. All right. Come on. And take it easy. Just tell him I'm a friend of yours and you want to talk to him. We'll get him off to one side. Well, whatever you say. Eddie! Yeah? Oh, for the... What are you doing here, Carla? Eddie, Eddie, this is Mr. Dollar, a friend of mine. We were... I wonder if we could talk to you for a moment. What about? Well, you know better than to come in a joint like this. But I want to talk to you, Eddie. I can talk to me at home. Now. Go on, get her out of here, will you, mister? It might be a good idea if you listen to her first. I thought it was her that wanted to talk to me. Go on, get her out of here. All right. If you'll go with us... What for? I like it here. It's a nice place. Yeah? At least it's better than San Quentin. 
What are you talking about? A warehouse robbery, $100,000 worth of furs. I understand you may know something about it. Innocently, of course. I thought you said this guy was a friend of yours. Well, that's right, Eddie. He's just... Who is he? He's an insurance investigator. Oh, so that's the pitch. He's promised to help, Eddie. If, if you'll tell him whatever you know, he'll protect Back you. Back it off, can... Carla. Now, look, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. I never even heard of no fur robbery. So take her with you and get out of here. This may be your last chance to get off before the boat sinks, Eddie. You're not leaving, huh? All right, then I'll leave. Eddie! Let him go. We can't force him to talk. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I don't understand him. I do. Item 810 cents. Phone call from the pool hall to Lieutenant Garcia at police headquarters. He said there was no change in Albert Christman's condition yet. He was still holding on, and he still hadn't talked. But there had been another new development, a big one. And when I joined Kyle in the taxi outside, she knew it by the look on my face. What's wrong, Mr. Dollar? Now, look. How sure are you that your brother wasn't mixed up in that robbery? Well, I... I want the truth. I... I'm afraid he was mixed up in it. Then brace yourself, Carla. Your boss, Red Weller, who was going to tell me what he knew about it was found murdered in an alley an hour ago. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lonely, broken-hearted girl, a blood-stained shirt, and a fight with a cornered rat. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at Chesterton Radio. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Wake you up, Johnny? Oh, Garcia, no, just finished breakfast. Oh, you special investigators do live. Suppose that insurance company of yours could put me on expense account? Maybe, if you found that hundred grand worth of stolen furs. Just a matter of time, Johnny. Now you're talking like a police lieutenant. How soon can you come down here to headquarters? What's up? Has the watchman talked? Chrisman? No, he's still in a coma. 
I want to know some more about that kid you mentioned on the phone last night. Eddie Monty? Yeah. Well, I... I don't know. That was told to me in confidence. Look, Johnny, I'm going to talk to you like a policeman for a minute. A man named Weller was knifed to death last night. What you told me yourself, his death is probably tied in with that warehouse robbery. Another man is dying at Queen of the Angels. So, confidence or no confidence, I want to know about that kid. All right, Garcia. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California. To the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 10, a dollar and 45 cents. Taxi from my hotel to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. The early morning fog was starting to lift and the city sprawled beneath a slate gray sky. The filtered sun should have softened things, but didn't. Gray sun, gray world, drab and dreary, and a case to match. Teenagers, not a gang of hardened criminals. A bunch of wild kids who'd broken into a warehouse and stole an 80 fur coat, silver blue mink. A night watchman had been slugged and lay dying in the hospital. And a lunchroom owner named Red Weller had been stabbed to death the night before. So it couldn't be called kid stuff. That term doesn't apply to murder. Run those four cards through, Joe. See what you can make on them. Thanks. Now come on into the office, Johnny. This madhouse out here gets you frazzled before you know it. Oh, you police detectives have it pretty soft, Garcia. That's news to me. Teletypes, photo files, record cards, crime labs. How'd you like to try working alone? On your expense account, I could suffer the hardship. Now let's go in here. Have a seat, Johnny. Thanks. Yeah, did I put the fear of the Lord in you on the phone? Uh, you were real impressive. Yeah, the chief was breathing down my neck. Well, then I'll stop trembling. Getting aside, Johnny, I've got to know just how that Monte boy figures in this. Did I say he even figured in it at all? No, you just wanted some information on him. But he figures all right. You didn't come out here from Hartford to look up the nephew of an old friend. Oh, I've done crazier things at times. He's got a record. You know that? No. Petty stuff, no convictions. Huh. Gang brawls, auto pilfering, vandalism, intoxication. Interrogative attitude, sullen, hostile, antisocial. Yeah, that's quite a nephew you've got, Johnny. Black like sheep of the family. What's the story? How did you get onto this case? Look, amigo, I made a promise on this. I hate to break it. It's murder, Johnny. <sighs> this kid's sister worked for Red Weller in that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse. Her name is Carla Monty. She's five years older than he is. They live together. Their parents are dead. So? So I put some pressure on her, and she told me she thought her brother Eddie might know something about the robbery. She took me to a pool room to meet him. How was he supposed to have known about it? Hearsay? No, no. She admitted later that she suspected him of being mixed up in it himself. Things he'd said, the way he acted. She asked me to help her try to keep him out of trouble. I think he's already in trouble, Johnny. Yeah, so do I. And I think she does, too. What did he have to say when you talked to him in the pool hall? Several things, but they added up to two words. Get out. When I wouldn't, he did. Hmm. Why do you think Red Weller was killed, Johnny? Well, I think those kids used his lunchroom as a lookout post to spot the prowl car that was patrolling that area. As soon as it passed, they pulled the job. It figures all right. I think Red realized it when he thought back and knew who the kids were. I think that's what he was going to tell me. So they found out what he was up to and knocked him off to shut his mouth. Yeah, it ends up, Garcia. Oh. Now, tell me about her. Carla? Hmm. What's to tell? She's just a girl, like millions of others. Decent, hardworking, and real sweet. But there's something about her, something special. I, I don't know what, I don't know the words to use, but... Well, it's there, you feel it. And she's kept it somehow, in spite of everything. I guess I know what you mean. Do you? I told you once, Johnny, I grew up in that district. I know how rough it is. 
Well, maybe it's even worse for a girl. It is. I know. I had a sister. Oh, I didn't know that. She was a lot like this girl Carla once. Then the district got to her, and she got to be more like Carla's brother. Uh, what happened to her? One to five. Possession of narcotics. A couple of other pretty rough charges. She... She died in Tehachapi Prison seven years ago. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Garcia. Yeah. I don't want to see this girl, Carla, hurt any more than you do, Johnny. Maybe the hurt will break her, make her lose that something special. But I've still got to pick up her brother and bring him in for questioning. Expense account item 11, a dollar and 90 cents. Taxi to the Weller lunchroom to see Carla Monte. Lieutenant Garcia had a police detail checking known fences and borderline dealers specializing in furs. But so far, none of those contacted had been approached by any member of the warehouse gang. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who had been slugged during the robbery, was still in a coma, unable to talk. So Carla remained my best, in fact, my only lead to the case. The lunchroom was closed. I paid off the taxi, walked three blocks to Carla's apartment house, climbed the stairs, and knocked on her door. Yes? Who is it? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, all right. Just a moment. Come in, Johnny. What were you expecting? A major invasion? I don't know. I don't know what I'm expecting. Easy, Carla. Easy. It's not the end of the world. Eddie didn't come home last night. Oh? I tried, Johnny. I tried to be a mother and father both to him. What did I do wrong? Well, that's the kind of question that doesn't always have an answer. Have you got a drink in the house? Have... Have I what? Got anything to drink? Well, there's some brandy, I think. All right, get it. Well, I don't know if it's a good brandy. It not. doesn't matter. Bring two glasses. Pour out a couple of stiff ones. No, I, I don't. Go ahead that. and pour them, two of them. All right. Is this a snapshot of Eddie when he was younger? Yeah. He was in junior high school then. It was taken at summer camp when he won a medal for swimming. And that was the only year I could afford to send him. Here you are, John. Thanks. All right, here's a go. Oh, I don't think Now that drink way. it. All of it. All right. <coughs> Good. You needed that. Where do you think he is, Johnny? What's happened to him? Carla, you're going to have to face it sooner or later, and I kind of think now is the time. What do you mean? You've been worried sick for fear your brother would get into some kind of trouble. And you had reason to worry. It's finally happened. No. He's in trouble, all right. Plenty of trouble. You're not the only one looking for him. Who else is? Who do you mean, Johnny? The police. There's an APB oh. out. They want him for questioning in connection with a robbery and with the murder of Red Weller. Oh, no. Eddie wouldn't kill anyone. Maybe not, but somebody did. Some member of the gang that robbed the warehouse. And it looks very much as if Eddie is a member. Yes. I suppose he is. Now, look, Carla. Is there anything you haven't told me about the robbery, I mean? No, no. I, I was just suspicious, that's all. Because if there is, let's have it. It's too late to protect him now. The sooner he's taken into custody, the less likelihood of his getting any even deeper. He was out that night. He didn't come home until almost morning. I was worried about it, but I knew it wouldn't do any good to ask him. Do you know who was with him that night? No. Who would be the most likely ones to go along on a deal like that? Any of them. Any of those he's been running around with lately. Any idea where they hang out mostly? Well, just those two places I took you to last night. That drive-in and the pool hall. Look, if they did pull that robbery, where do you suppose they take the furs? Well, I don't know. Does Eddie have a car? No, but some of the other boys do. Uh-huh. Carla, would you mind if I look through Eddie's room? No, I don't mind. It doesn't matter. I guess nothing much matters now. It's gone so far that... Wait. It's Eddie. He has his own key. All right. Take it easy now. Be careful, Johnny. Sis, you're gonna have... What the devil are you doing here? Working for you, Eddie. Yeah? What for? I think you know. Eddie... Eddie, you've got to give yourself up. Be Shut sure. up. Because I got you to thank for this jam. This insurance dick comes around, romances you up a little, and you sell me right down the river. That's not true. How'd you know you were in a jam, Eddie? I got friends in this neighborhood. They keep me posted. Did the same friends tell you Red Weller was about to make a deal to talk? You're whistling in the dark, Dollar. Maybe. I imagine Garcia will find out, though, when he gets you down to headquarters. Get your hand off that phone. Oh, so you've got a gun. Eddie, Eddie, don't. Please. Keep out of this. Move back against that wall, Dollar. Put your hands flat against that wall. You keep them there. 
Give me some clothes, Carla. Come on, make it fast. What are you going to do, Eddie? I say, give me some clothes. All right, Eddie. You're wrong, though. You're making a big mistake, Eddie. It's no use running. You'll only... Eddie. What's the matter? Down there in the street. A police car just pulled up. You're lying. So we are, Dollar. Ah, uh, that chill you, Carla. You're the one that brought him here. I'm trying to let him trap me. I think I'll pull a bullet on you before I leave. You fire one shot and you won't have a chance. They'll be in here before you can get out of the hallway. You better make up your mind, Eddie. Well, you've still got time. Stay where you are, Dollar. Don't try to come after me. Eddie, please. Give yourself up, Eddie. Stop him, Johnny. I'm afraid it's a little late. Why did you let him go? There was no choice, Carla. He'd have killed you if I'd moved. Well, you'd better give me that list of his friends. The police will want it. Heaven help him. Yeah. That's about all that can help him now. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a police net tightens and traps a frightened rat. A boy sobs in a jail cell. And an innocent man dies quietly in his sleep. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Garcia, Johnny. Are the boys in the police car still there? There are three police cars here now. They've searched the apartment house from top to bottom. Any luck? No, Eddie got away. I didn't dare make a move to stop him. He was going to shoot his sister. Well, we'll get him, Johnny. Don't worry about it. I don't intend to. My job now is to locate $100,000 worth of stolen furs, not to go after Eddie Money. It's the same job, isn't it? Probably. Did you see that list of his friends Carla gave me? I just put out an APB to bring them in. Good. They weren't all in on that warehouse robbery, but some of them were. If they were, we'll take them. We've got an interrogation room down here to sort the sheep from the goats. Yeah, I know. But first, got to catch your goats. <laughs> Thank you.
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the home office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. Item 12, two cents for the way I felt. I hung up the phone and walked to the window, stood there looking out into the street. The police were leaving the apartment to carry their search for fugitive Eddie Monty into wider territory. And Eddie's sister, Carla, sat huddled in a corner, forlorn, beaten, brokenhearted. From the window, too, the view was anything but cheerful. Dirty, cluttered streets lined by row on row of sagging tenements, drab and gray in the weakening light of late afternoon. This was the slums that had spawned Eddie Monty, raised and nurtured him, made him into a member of a gang, and had now sent him fleeing from the police with a gun in his hand. And the same slum had bred the others of the gang who'd robbed a warehouse of 80 silver blue mink coats, slugged night watchman Albert Grisman into a near-death coma, and had murdered a man who'd tried to give them away. Why, Johnny? What got into him? Why is he ending up this way? I wish I could tell you, Carla. I did something wrong. That's it, of course, but, but why? Forget it. You did all you could. It wasn't enough. Well, sometimes nothing is enough. And nobody knows exactly why. I loved him. I, I never thought of him as, as just a nuisance of a kid brother, the way a lot of girls do. Now, look. You did more than anybody could expect. You were a pretty young kid when your folks died. Too young to have to take on the responsibility of raising a teenage brother. But I tried. I tried hard. And I thought I was doing all right until lately. But now this... So it didn't work. And what's happened is breaking your heart. Well, that can't be changed. But just remember this one thing. You did the best you could. And that's all anybody could do. So don't blame yourself. Tell me something, Johnny. Yeah? You're wearing a gun. I don't think Eddie knew it when he ran from here. Maybe you couldn't have used it to disarm him. Not when he was on the verge of killing you. But you could have drawn it and killed him. He was careless. He gave you several chances. Why didn't you? I don't know. Thank you, Johnny. I'd like to look through Eddie's room, if you don't mind. All right. I'll go with you. This way, it's down the hall. Thanks. Well, somehow, I still can't believe it. Not the killing, at least. Eddie is just not that kind. Well, a kid gets under pressure sometimes and gets pushed overboard. Maybe we'll know more when they pick him up. What if he... What if he tries to resist arrest? You know the answer to that. Oh, I hope he doesn't. Well, here it is. This has been Eddie's room since he was 13. It ought to tell something. The main thing at the moment is to find something that tells where he might go to hide out. And I've also got $100,000 worth of furs to locate. But you, you go ahead and look around. Whatever you want. Okay, thanks. I'll be in the living room. You, you call me if you want me. For the sake of company, I switched on a beat-up record player in the corner. And I looked at six years of a boy's life, accumulated in one room. Comic books, hot rod magazines, school mementos, knickknacks, photographs. Junk, mostly, to anybody but the owner. I went through all of it, and through the drawers and chests and through his clothes. Nothing. I looked over the photographs stuck in the mirror, tacked on the wall. Some of the names on the boy's pictures were the same as those on the list Carla had given to the police. There were a few pictures of girls... And a lot of pictures of hot rods. I picked up an envelope of loose photographs lying on the dresser. They were views of a second-hand panel truck. And in all of the pictures, Eddie was standing beside the truck with obvious pride of ownership. One of the views showed the front license plate. I turned the envelope over. The film had been developed less than two weeks before. I called Carla back into the room and asked her about it. No. No, I didn't know he had a car, or a truck, rather. It may not be his, but I'll lay odds that it is. That look on his face is a dead giveaway. I don't know. He sure kept it a secret. He never brought it here once. Do you recognize the background on those pictures? No. No, I don't. It looks like a 
storage yard or, or an industrial place of some kind, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd call it that. Do you mind if I take these with me? Of course not. But why? The gang had to use something to haul those furs away from the warehouse. But if... If Eddie was keeping the truck a secret from me, it was because he was planning to use it for the robbery. That one or some other one. Johnny. He was in on it all along. Look, Carla... I've got a hunch Eddie is the leader of that gang. Oh, no. I think the truck was used in the robbery, and I think when we find it, we'll find the furs, and we'll find Eddie. See you later, Carla. <laughs> Expense account item 13, $1.85. Taxi fare from Carla's apartment to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. Come in. Oh, Johnny, I've been trying to locate you. Oh, what's up? We picked up two of those kids on Carla Monte's list. Friends of Eddie's. Wow, that's a start. Not with one of them. He's in the clear. Perfect alibi. We have something on the other one, though. Want to help me talk to him? Yeah, sure. Oh, say, here are some photographs I picked up in Eddie's room a while ago. We should take a look at them, Garcia. All right, let's see them. The pictures were taken about two or three weeks ago. Now, if this truck is his, his sister doesn't know about it. Yeah, he sure got that owner look on his face. Yeah, he sure has. That second one there shows the license number, see? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You think they might have used this in the robbery, Johnny? It's a possibility. And we're not exactly swamped with angles. I was wondering, too, if you happen to recognize that background behind the truck. No. No, but it looks like it might be down in that area somewhere, the warehouse district. Look, why don't you get some copies made, circulate them, and see if any of your boys can tag the place. Oh, you insurance dicks do get ideas sometimes. Oh, you'd be amazed. All right, I'll do it. And now let's go down and talk to that kid. Interrogation room 519 was on the fifth floor. Air walls painted gray, a business-like room without adornment or compromise. Furnished only with the necessary table, chairs, and lights. We stopped in the ante room and looked in through the one-way glass window. The boy waited alone at the interrogation table, trying to put up a tough, defiant front, but failing by the tremble of a lip and the occasional flick of his eyes. Well, let's go in. Get it over with. The kid stiffened when he heard the door open, but he didn't turn around. He just sat there at the table, braced and waiting. You can take that chair at the side, Johnny. Okay, thanks. What's your name? You already know it. I said, what's your name? Mario Centaurus. That's your right name? Yeah. Where do you live? In Oxman Place, my aunt. Ever been arrested before, Mario? No. Hey, you've got kind of a bad memory, haven't you? Why? September of last year. Arrest made by Officer C.J. Barton. Charge, possession of stolen articles. Hubcap, two auto radios, one camera. I wasn't convicted. I asked if you'd ever been arrested. Not convicted. It was a frame up. I didn't have any evidence. No, apparently not. Witnesses for the prosecution refused to testify. Case dismissed. Here, what are you going to claim this time, Mario? Another frame up? I don't know why you brought me in here. I don't know anything about anything. That bad memory again, huh? I just don't know what you're talking about. It's lucky for us that Eddie Monty had such a good memory, isn't yes, it? Yes. What about it. Eddie? Huh? What, what do you mean? Is he a friend of yours? I know him. He's got a fine memory, that boy. Too bad you can't remember things the way he does. What are you talking about? Oh, that's true, all right. Eddie remembers everything that happened. What he did, what Mario did. I don't know what you mean. Oh, that's because of your bad memory, Mario. Why, Eddie remembers the name of every boy who was in on that job and just what each one of them did. What job? That warehouse robbery. Have you forgotten about that? I don't know anything about any robbery. Well, there's been a lot of talk. At least you've heard about it, haven't you? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you've just forgotten. I don't know what you're talking about. When did you see Eddie last? I don't remember. Have you seen him since the robbery? No. How can you be sure? You said you hadn't heard of any robbery. What? I haven't. Still, you haven't seen Eddie since the robbery. Well, I... Come on, Mario. Tell us about it. I guess maybe I did hear about it. So? Well, why shouldn't I hear? It was in the papers. 
Everybody's been talking about it, so what if I did hear it? I don't prove anything. But you said you hadn't heard. So I forgot. Guy can forget something, can't he? Yeah. If he's got a bad memory, he can. And Mario's got a real bad memory, Johnny. Not Eddie, though. He remembers how you guys loaded those furs into his truck. How you waited across the street in Red Wellers until the prowl car passed. How you slugged the night watchman, Albert Christmas. That's a lie. How do you know it is, Mario? You don't even remember it. Eddie does, though. He even remembers the next night. When you stabbed Red Weller to death to keep him from coming to me. No. No, I didn't do that. Of course you did. You don't think Eddie would lie, do you? It's not true. Makes sense to us. Is Eddie here? Do you pick him up? How would we know what he remembers unless we picked him up? Now, how do you think we got your name? Out of the telephone book? It's not true what Eddie says. Well, if you've got anything to say, we'll listen to it. But I don't think it's necessary, do you, Johnny? No, I think Eddie remembers everything. Let's get out of here. Yeah. He's lying! You listen to me. I'll tell you the truth. I'll get a stenographer. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cautious search, an ambush, bullets and tears. And the end is violence. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. This is ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar speaking, Lieutenant Garcia's office. Johnny, you're the one I was trying to reach. This is Carla Monte. Oh, I was going to phone you later. What's happening? Have they found Eddie yet? Not yet, but the police picked up one of his friends, Mario Santoris. Oh, Mario, I know him. Well, he's been to the apartment lots of times. He in on the robbery? Yes, he just made a statement admitting it. And what did he say about my brother? He says Eddie is the one who planned the whole thing. He must be lying. No, Garcia and I are pretty sure he's telling the truth. I'm sorry, Carla. I'm coming down to headquarters, Johnny. There's no use. There's nothing you can do here. At least I can be there when they bring him in or whatever happens. It won't help. You're better off at home. Now, no, please. John. I raised him. Some of the fault must be mine. I can't desert him. I'm going to be there if he needs me. Okay, Carla. Tonight, 
And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To the Home Office Moto Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account, final page. $100,000 worth of fur coats, silver blue minks, stolen in a warehouse robbery and still missing. A night watchman slugged during the robbery by one of the teenage gang, still lying in a coma, unable to speak. And Red Weller, a man who tried to speak, lay in the county morgue, stabbed to death in a dark alley. But now one of the gang had been arrested, a 17-year-old named Mario Santoris, and he'd finally talked. Sitting in Garcia's office, I read Mario's statement through for the second time. Well, what do you think, Johnny? I think the kid was telling the truth. Eddie Monty scraped up enough money to buy that second-hand panel truck and then talked the other kids into knocking over the warehouse. That ties in with what Eddie's sister said. But he kept the truck a secret, hadn't told her about it. And also the fact that Eddie seems to be a born leader type. They even mentioned it in one of his former records of arrest. Yeah, I think we can buy it that Eddie Monte is the leader of the gang. Yeah. All right, they picked their night. They cased the place from Red Weller's lunchroom across the street. And as soon as the prowl car passed, they made their move. They got the watchman, Albert Crisman, to open the door by showing him a fake telegram through the window. That's another thing that checks out Mario's story, Johnny. Mario claims he's the one who showed the telegram. That's right. Crisman kept saying, kid with a mark on his arm. And Mario's got a bad scar on his left wrist. That's what I mean. It checks out. Mario didn't know what Crisman had told us. All right, so they got inside, and then, according to Mario's version, it was Eddie Monty who slugged the watchman. Probably true. Then they jumped the other watchman in the dark and started hauling out the furs, loading them into the truck of Eddie's. They knew they had 45 minutes before the prowl car came back through. And by that time, they'd finished and split up, Eddie driving the truck away alone and the others disappearing on foot. Yeah, I think that's about the size of it. And I think Mario's telling the truth when he says neither he nor any of the others know where Eddie planned to hide out the truck. And Red Weller, according to Mario, was murdered by another gang member. What was his name? Chewy Morel. Yeah. Well, if that's true, Eddie Monty is at least clean on the murder charge. If it's true. All you can tag him on is robbery and assault on that watchman. I'm kind of glad of it, Johnny. I feel sorry for that sister of his. So do I. She's a good kid. And she's carrying a real load of guilt. Thinks that she's responsible in some way. Oh, she was only 19 herself when their folks died. How could she be expected to hold him in line? And especially in that district. Yeah. She's on her way down here, by the way. Carla Monte? Yeah, yeah. I tried to talk her out of it. Oh, maybe she's as well off hanging around here, though, as she is waiting alone in that apartment. It's a rough deal for her, no matter where she waits. Well, at least we can tell her her brother's not in quite as deep as we can. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Garcia speaking. Good. Well, who's the other one? Yeah, yeah, bring them on in and book them. I'll talk to them later. And now we... What? When? All right. Keep in touch with me. The boys just picked up Chewy Morel and the other two. And leaves just one to go. Yeah, the big one. Eddie Monte. And he's even bigger now, Johnny. What do you mean? That watchman, Eddie Slugged, Albert Crisman. What about him? He just died. So it was a different thing we had to tell Carla when she arrived at headquarters. Not that her brother would probably get off on a lesser charge. But instead that an APB was out, that every officer in town had been warned, be on the lookout for Eddie Monty, age 19, armed and dangerous, wanted for murder. Expense account item 15, $12.50, rent on a hired car. One of Garcia's boys was certain that the background appearing in the photograph of Eddie's truck was somewhere in his district, but he couldn't tag the exact spot. So I decided to cruise that area street by street. Carla Monte, Eddie's sister, went along with me. There's an alley off to the right, Johnny. It might be worth a look. Yeah, it runs back toward a lumber yard there. That could be a lumber yard in the background of that photograph. Well, we'll give it a try. This isn't it, Johnny. Sally makes a right angle turn there before it even gets to the lumber yard. Well, we may as well check it on through. It seems to run clear on down to the railroad yards. Please let us find him. 
If it's the police, he'll fight. And he'll kill someone else. Be killed himself, maybe. It's out of your hands now, Carl. It's got to work itself out in its own way. There's nothing much anybody can do to stop it or change it. I know, Johnny. I keep trying to fool myself. All the time, I know. Well, all you can do is hope... Look! That fence ahead of us there. Next to the railroad yards. Yeah, that could be the fence in these pictures. Looks the same. And that storage shed there at the right, that's in one of the shots. Yeah. And that pile of oil drums. This is it, Carla. This is where those films were taken. The truck was parked right at the corner of that shed. Well, it looks as though that off chance paid off. I'm scared, Johnny. Now that it's so close, I'm scared. Don't be. By off chance, I meant just finding the place. He may not have come back here since the day those pictures were taken. You don't believe that, and you know it. Look, Carla, that house back at the corner has a phone. There's a wire running in from the pole. Go back there and use it to call Lieutenant Garcia. Give him the location and tell him to hit the radio and have this whole area blocked off. Got it? Yes. Tell him to cover the railroad yard, too. Sew up this whole section tight and tell him to make it fast. Johnny. Yeah. Eddie may be watching us from around here somewhere right this minute. I waited until she'd gone. Then I got out of the car and walked toward the shed and the sagging wooden fence that bordered the railroad yards. It was nearly dark now. The high floodlights had been turned on above the crisscross network of gleaming steel tracks. Shadows play tricks at such a time of evening, and I got sudden movements now and then from the corner of my eyes, but, well, yet nothing really moved, and the only sound was the sound of my own footsteps. I stopped several times and stood watching and listening, but nothing moved. There was only silence. I reached the door of the long wooden shed and found it padlocked. But looking in through a broken window, I could see the lock didn't matter. The shed was empty and long abandoned. Between it and the fence was a drive leading toward the rear. And behind the shed in a loading area, I found Eddie's truck. And in the back of it was $100,000 worth of furs. All right, Dollar. Huh? Get your hands up. Eddie, you're in a rut. That's the first thing you said to me the last time we met. I ought to kill you there in that apartment. Isn't one killing enough? I don't suppose you know it, but Albert Chrisman died this afternoon. I know. I got a radio in the truck there. This where you've been hiding out all the time? Look, if I wanted to answer questions, I'd go turn myself in. You may be better off in the long run if you do. Now get... You here alone? No, no, your sister's with me. Oh, for the love... What does she want to do? Watch me get it. Why don't you give me that gun, Eddie? It's only a matter of time. You know that. You don't have a chance. Oh, I figure I got a pretty good chance right here in my head. Chance at what? To break Carla's heart? Smash her into the dirt killer, maybe? Shut up. What more do you want to do to her before you're through? I'm not planning to be through. Oh, that's great. But the police are doing some planning of their own. They gotta find me first. I found you, didn't I? And I ought to kill you right where you're standing. Is that all you gotta think about, Eddie? To kill somebody and go on killing until one of them kills you? Shut up, will you... Let me think. Think about Carla if you want to think about something. Think about the things she's done for you, the years she's worked for you, worried about you. Yeah, that dame was born to worry. Nobody's born to worry. They inherit worries like you were inherited by her. I didn't ask her to do it. Life didn't give her any choice. But it's too late now to talk about that. It's all over, Eddie. This is the wind-up. Come on, I'll give yourself up. You haven't got a chance. Oh, and I would have if I gave myself up. Don't you hand me that stuff. The police have got this whole section surrounded. Carla went to call them 20 minutes ago. If I thought you were trying to hand Johnny. me... Johnny! Keep your mouth shut. Eddie, you don't have a chance. Johnny, Lieutenant Garcia is here. Be careful, Eddie's here. You dirty... I hit the dirt and rolled under the truck and came up on the other side with my gun in my hand. I could hear Eddie running away, but I couldn't tell where he was. Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Eddie went over the fence into the yard. Where are you? Here, the corner of the shed. Come on, let's go after him. We can't get through. I've got men working this way from the other side. Where's Carla? Back there somewhere. Come on, we can get through the fence here. Carla, stay where you are. Don't follow us. There he goes, Johnny. Behind that line of freight cars. All right, come on. He can't get too far that way. There's a train coming. There he goes. He's going to try to beat it. The crazy... Eddie! Shut the on! I don't know, Johnny. There must be better ways to die. Expense account item 16, $300.60. Hotel and miscellaneous in Los Angeles and transportation back to Hartford. 
Expense account total, $541.25. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Well, I guess Carla made the remarks for me. I don't know, Johnny. Those 80 fur coats, they'll go back into stock now. And they'll be sold to women who wear them to parties and dances and nightclubs. And they'll be happy in them. And they'll never know about Eddie or about me or what happened here tonight. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the matter of the medium, well done. And a seance or two that I think you'll like. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Edgar Barrier, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Tommy Cook, and Richard Crenna. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. listening to Chesterton Radio at chestertonradio.com. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. When Marie Antoinette was told that the people had no bread, she replied, let them eat cake. She only meant it as a jest, and she could never understand why, A, nobody laughed, and B, she would have to pay for it with her head. It all goes to prove that the public will tolerate any abuse from its rulers except a half-baked joke, which is why the story you're about to hear concerns a very serious person. How did you get in here? You don't remember me, Your Excellency? Halder. You're John Halder. Yes. But you're dead. You were shot this morning. How did you escape? I didn't escape. I was shot. You didn't die. I died. All the bullets hit me. What do you want? I only want to know the answer to one question. What question? 
Why didn't you give me justice? Our mystery drama, Blue Justice, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Psychologists suspect we are what we hate. The poets write of people who do protest too much. Is it possible, therefore, that they shout the loudest against evil whose resistance to it is the weakest? Consider Mr. Peter Littlewood. He is assistant minister of justice in a country whose language would be utterly incomprehensible to most of us. So, we have translated everything into English, or rather, American. When we said that Peter was assistant minister of justice, we also stated his problem. He would like to be the minister. He is honestly convinced he could do a much better job than the minister. Why were you in the square? The square? I... I don't remember... Yesterday, you said you had gone there to buy ribbon for your wife. I, I, I don't remember. Please, I'm so tired. Isn't it true you went to the square to join the demonstration? No, no. I went because my wife wanted me to, to buy her some ribbon. I bought her the ribbon. What was the name of the shop? Uh, oh, oh, please, I'm so tired. The guards won't let me sleep. What do you mean the guards won't let you sleep? Well, they keep shining lights in my eyes and they... Keep hitting me. Abusing a prisoner is against the Constitution. You're lying. It's true. Please believe me. You have the right to lodge a complaint. Here. Take this complaint form. No, no, no. Why no. not? Uh, well, the, the guards, they find out and they kill you. No, I won't sign that. Professor John Halder. Professor. You're a college professor. An intellectual you know the law. You must report any official who is delinquent in his duty. Well, I, the truth then must be you are not being abused by the guards. Well, I, I just Therefore, you are lying. It is, it's the truth. Then sign the complaint. And so, we establish the fact that you are a liar. No. You are lying about going to the ribbon shop. No, it's true. Where is the ribbon? The, the ri ribbon? You claim uh, you bought some ribbon. Where is it? Yes, well, I I, I must have lost it. Who are your accomplices? I, I, I don't have any accomplices. I, I, I never said or did anything against the government. You never told your students that there should be more than one political party? No, I only And that told... all parties should be free to criticize the government? I only explained that that was how it was in other countries. Why were you in the square the day of the demonstration? I told you to buy my wife some ribbon. What color ribbon? Uh, bl Blue. I remember. How much ribbon? How much? Uh, oh, uh, she said, uh, she said, John, stop at that little shop and pick up two yards of blue ribbon. She told you to pick up the ribbon? Yes. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Wait, you could ask her. Why didn't I think of that before? Oh, it's so simple. Just ask her. We have asked her. Well, then that should have... Bring in Magda Halder. Magda... Oh, Magda, tell them, tell them why I was in the square that day. Uh, Mrs. Halder, did you ask your husband to buy you some ribbon? Magda? Did you ask him to buy some ribbon? No. Magda, you did? No. You remember, Magda? Tell them my life depends on it. Tell them you asked me to buy the ribbon. Two yards of blue ribbon. Did you, Mrs. Halder? No. Magda, what did you do to her? Take her away. She, 
She's making a mistake. Believe me, it was ribbon, blue ribbon. I'm innocent. Innocent. And you hear them, Cullis, they're all innocent. You'd think there were no guilty people in the whole world. Innocent. <laughs> you have to get up early in the morning if you want to fool Peter Littlewood. And now for the toughest job of all, going up against that fat slob, the minister. Well, it can't last forever. Come in, Peter. Sit down. Quite a night's work you've done here. Uh, yes, Your Excellency. In private, you needn't call me Your Excellency. I would prefer Carl or Citizen Miller. Uh, I'm also Dr. Miller, a Ph.D. in mathematics, of all things. I prefer Your Excellency. In spite of the fact that it annoys me. The office you hold demands the title of respect. I have certain standards of conduct, and if a man... Let it go. To... Yes. Your Excellency. I've looked through these cases. Quite a batch. Forty. I'm hoping for your immediate approval so that sentencing might be carried out at once. I see all of them are guilty. Yes, Your Excellency. You mean in this entire lot, not one of them was innocent? If there were, I would have recommended immediate acquittal. You should make it your business to find a few innocent people here and there. It's good politics. I don't deal in politics. I'm guided strictly by the evidence. An effective minister of justice is not guided by the evidence. He guides the evidence. Thus, it can lead him in any direction he chooses. Dismiss the charges against 10% of this lot. They are all guilty of trying to overthrow the government. Four out of 40 will not overturn the existing order of things. Besides, it's an investment. An investment in what? In getting a good night's sleep. I have no trouble sleeping. You will. You will one day, unless you make provision. I'm afraid, Your Excellency, I don't understand. Free four of these people. But they are all guilty. Here, for instance, this one... This pathetic little college professor. This John Holder. Hmm? Yes. He just happened to be there. Says he was going to a shop to buy his wife some ribbon. She had asked him to. He denies telling him that? Yes, well. It says here, John Holder, 71. His wife, Magda, 29. Definitely December and May. Would you agree? Your Excellency, I don't see what all when of When a woman has... testifies against her husband and she is half his age, one might profitably pursue certain personal ramifications. Is she pretty? She's pretty, I guess. How do we know she isn't using this as an opportunity to rid herself of an elderly husband? Have we checked to see if there's a... Uh, a friend. The woman testified under oath. She has no criminal record. She has never been in any sort of trouble. I am satisfied the woman is telling the truth. I used my best judgment. Do I have your permission to carry out the sentences? <sighs> Very well. But uh, remember what I told you about getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> The trouble with this government is that it's still being run by the Millers. These are people who like to spend a whole day thinking. What's there to think about? It's right or wrong, yes or no, hot or cold, isn't it? What this country needs is more men of action. Men like me. Men who don't get all twisted up in their own thoughts. Men who go by the book. I go by the book. It should all be so simple. Why do people always insist on confusing the issues? Well, how was your day, Alma? As usual. Yours? Nothing out of the ordinary. Now, are there any plans for this evening? No, no, I've uh, brought home some work. And so have I. Oh, I hear you're going to receive a medal. Yes. I have increased production at the factory by 10%. Yeah, that's very good. It's my job. He's a... The uh, trial of those demonstrators. Yes. 
It's all over, isn't it? Yes. They were executed, all of them? Yes. Well, then, why do you have to keep working so late? Because the enemies of the people never sleep. Thelma, an ideal wife for a man in my position. She has her own career. She's an engineer and efficiency expert. She makes no demands of me. And we have a very happy marriage. Well, let me see. I have here the, the dossiers on Why are you so sleepy? <laughs> Well, I didn't get any sleep last night, so maybe I... Hmm. Who, uh, who could that be? Come in. Come in. Good evening, Mr. Assistant Minister. What do you mean by interrupting me at home? Who are you? How did you get in here? Don't you recognize me? Uh, I suppose not. There are so many of us. Holder. John Holder. Yes. John Holder. But, but you're dead. You, you, you were shot this morning. How did you escape? I didn't escape. I was shot. What do you want? Oh, you're angry, Mr. Assistant Minister. Please, don't be. I only want to ask a question, just one question. Yes, yes. Why did you believe Magda and not me? Why would Magda lie? Why? I never suspected it, but now I found out. She has a lover. And that's why she wanted me out of the way. I'm twice her age. I'm not very exciting. He's young, good-looking. He's everything that I'm not. But why didn't you accuse her of this when she testified? Because I didn't know. I know now why she did it. And you should have investigated. You take pride in your sense of justice. But you didn't give me justice. You shot me on perjured testimony. There were 40 others. How many of them died needlessly? It's a dream. That's all this is, a dream. Does that mean it isn't true? Does that mean my wife didn't have a lover? This is just a dream. Why don't you find out... Yeah. Are you are you all right? Huh? Huh? Oh. Uh, well, what's the matter? I was passing by your door. I heard you muttering and mumbling. Oh, I uh, I must have fallen asleep at my desk. I uh, I was dreaming. Were you? That's odd. Why is it odd? Because you always say you never dream. Well, I uh, I was dreaming this time. Oh. What did you dream about? Um, nothing. It was something that sounded terrifying. Absolutely frightful. I tell you it was nothing. Nothing. It was nothing. One thing every listener should know by now is when a character in one of our stories says it was nothing... It's a code expression for it was everything. Where are we headed? We are headed toward Act Two. And we've got a special surprise all lined up. In Peter Littlewood, we have a man who claimed he never dreamed. And why shouldn't we believe him? But now, by his own admission, he has had a dream. A very odd and disturbing dream. A dream in which a dead man has given him a certain piece of information. Information which has to be checked out. Because it could have a profound influence on the rest of his life. Was I really dreaming? 
And if I was, what was the meaning of that dream? Evidently, something is disturbing my mind. It was Miller who planted the idea in my mind that John Halder's wife testified against him because she had a lover. And so I dreamed that Halder appeared to me to verify it. I'm going to face Miller with this. Bring it out in the open. What is it this time, Peter? Uh, you accused me of being derelict in my duty. Did I? When? Where? How? When? The other day. Where? Here in this office. How? By not investigating any alleged motive Mrs. Magda Halder may have had for testifying against her husband. Mrs. Magda Halder? Mm. Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. That May and December marriage. You suggested she use the opportunity of the demonstration to get rid of him. The fact is, she did testify against him. What other reason could she have? Now this, Your Excellency, is where we disagree. There is a fundamental difference between us. I believe in my work while you... Yes? While I what? Tell me. You are a cynical man. I plead guilty. I believe in the people's government. I believe that the overwhelming majority of the citizens of this country also believe in the government. And that's why I disagree with you on Magda Halder. It only required one word, and he would have been alive and free. She condemned him to death. I say she had a reason. And I agree. And the reason was, she loves her country more than anything else in the world. Nonsense. Nonsense, perhaps, to you. You don't understand love of country. Is that a fact? I'm speaking freely. You're too wise, the intellectual. In your heart, you despise simple people. I saw that woman's face. I saw the agony. She knew she was sending him to his death, and yet she understood the love of country, the obedience to duty that stands above any personal consideration. She had no choice. You believe this nonsense? Your Excellency, Yes, I... yes, you do. <laughs> well, we disagree. You insist she was doing her patriotic duty, and I claim she was only combining duty with pleasure. I, uh, I respect your point of view, although I deplore it. And I respect yours. And, of course, neither of us will ever be able to prove he was right. Oh, that's not true. The truth is easily established. How? How? I'm surprised at you, Peter. A resourceful investigator like yourself? You could easily discover the truth. Or are you afraid? Yes? Oh. It, it... The uh, Assistant Minister for Justice, Mrs. Walter. May I come in? Oh, certainly, Your Excellency. Well, won't you have a seat? Well, I'm merely here to ask you a few questions. Oh. Now, uh, you said you did not ask your husband to stop off and buy the ribbon that day. You said that under oath. Oh, yes, and it's the truth. I swear it's the truth. You knew what it would mean. Oh, yes. You had no other motive. No. What other motive could there be? I worshipped John Halder. I was his student. I fell in love with him. For he... He was the most wonderful human being in the world. I loved him. But... But no one has the right to place personal feelings above the good of the government. I... I... I love him. Maggie, darling, bring me a bath towel, huh? Who is that? Who? It's who? Maggie. Oh, that. Oh, that. That's my cousin. He, uh, his apartment. Uh, the apartment house burned down and he needed a place to stay. Hey, Maggie, darling. Your cousin? My, uh, second cousin. Actually, his family and my family were all so close. It's, it's as if we were cousins. Sweetheart, you out there? How long has this been going on? How long is... What's been going on? I advise you to tell me the truth. Well, I... We... We've been lovers. I... I couldn't help myself. Well, John was wonderful, but... But he was old. He was so old. And I needed... 
I and mean... so you saw your chance to be rid of him. Oh, no. You lied to me. Oh, no, I told the truth. I did not ask him to buy the ribbon. I didn't. You couldn't wait to get rid of him. Well, I know this doesn't look good, but I, I did nothing to get rid of John, I swear. I told the truth. You're lying. Well, no one can prove it. No one. It's my word against his. It was always my word against his. And now he's dead. There was terror in her voice. But I could read the triumph in her eyes. What could I do about it? Could I admit publicly that a mistake had been made? Never. The government does not, cannot make mistakes. I could bring charges against her and make her pay dearly. But this would be even more harmful. It would be an admission of incompetence on my part. But that's not the worst of it. What about John Halder? Why did he appear to me in a dream? I'm not a dreamer. Whatever else I may be, I'm not a dreamer. What does it mean? What time shall we arrive there tonight? Hmm? Oh, uh, arrive where, Alma? At your minister's reception. Oh, I'd forgotten. I... I don't think I can go. Are you ill? No, no, I'm not ill. Well, you appear somewhat pale. Well, I haven't been getting much rest. <laughs> I promised myself to get to bed early tonight. As a matter of fact, right after dinner. Won't His Excellency be put out if you're not there? Uh, couldn't you go without me? Do I have to go? I think it would be good if someone were there to represent me. Very well. No, I know you really don't want to go, but... But I am very tired. What do you want me to wear? You're black. Miller is very fond of women in black. Is he? I didn't care about the reception. I simply had to get Alma out of the house. The reception would run from 8 to 12. That would give me a chance to sleep for four hours. And if I should dream and talk in my sleep, she wouldn't be here to notice. Good evening, Mr. Assistant Minister. You. Again. Why are you surprised? You knew I would be here. What do you want? Just this. I, I, I'm sorry. There, there's nothing I can do. That's a lie. Can you be brought back to life? No. Well, then... Then what can I do? Do you want me to admit publicly that your execution was a mistake? That would result in a certain amount of trouble for me. Is that what you want? I told you what I want. Justice. What is justice? This is something you must figure out for yourself. Wait a minute. Come back here. Where are you going? Peter. Come back. Come back. Peter. Come here. Huh? Where? Oh. Where did you go? Where did John Halder go? John Halder? Huh? Did you say John Halder? Huh? Oh, what? Oh, why would I, I say John Halder? I don't know. You were having a dream again. Oh, no, no, no. It, it, it was nothing. Did, uh, did you have a good time? No. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Perhaps you'd better go back to sleep. No, no, I, I don't want any more sleep. I've had my rest. I, I can go back to work. All right, if that's what you want. Alma, it, uh, it would be wise not to discuss this with anyone. I mean the fact that I've been having bad dreams. Why would I discuss it with anyone? Well, it's just that I hold a very sensitive position in the government. I think I understand. I looked at her. There was no anger in her voice. Just a statement of fact. I don't believe she's capable of anger. She's an engineer all wrapped up in physics and mathematics. Mathematics... Maybe that's why Miller thinks she's attractive. I don't see it. She's kind of pale and washed out. She doesn't have that animal excitement that, say, uh, Magda Halder has. Uh, but I didn't want a woman with animal excitement. I wanted someone like Alma who wouldn't get in my way. Magda. What am I going to do about Magda? 
she lied. Or did she? Isn't it my duty to find out? Maybe that's what John Halder meant by justice. Truth. The truth, no matter where it leads or who it hurts. I'll have her arrested and make her tell the truth. Peter, hmm? you busy? No, no, Your Excellency. Please come in. You told my secretary you wanted to talk about something special? Yes. About justice. A few days ago, you asked, what is justice? And you answered your own question. You said it was a man-made conceit. I disagree. You have a better answer. Yes. I say justice is truth. And I intend to establish the truth. We have a disagreement about the motives of Mrs. Magda Halder. I want the case reopened. I want her arrested. I'm sorry it can't be done. You mean you won't permit it? Magda Halder is dead. He killed her. He came back and killed her. What are you saying? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing at all. You can read about it in this morning's paper. It seems your friend, Magda Halder, was drowned last night. Am I... Am I in trouble, Your Excellency? Why was I arrested? You were having an affair with Magda Halder... Yes, but... Did you ever discuss how convenient it might be to get rid of her husband? Oh, no, no, never, never. He, he was executed as an enemy of the people. Well, you know about that, Your Excellency. And what happened to her last night? We decided to take a boat ride. You know, the excursion steamer. And we were on deck. And suddenly, she screamed, No, keep away from me, keep away. Everybody turned to look. She kept yelling, No, John, no, keep away from me. John? Yes. She must have thought she saw John, her dead husband. Next thing I knew, she had climbed onto the rail and she... She fell or jumped. I dove in after her, but it was dark and I couldn't find her. And before she could be rescued, she... She was dead. Very well, you may go. You mean I'm not wanted for anything? I said go. Mr. Assistant Minister. What do you want? I told you. Justice. Your wife is dead. You literally scared her to death. Hasn't justice been done? No. What more do you want? Tell me, I I see you in these dreams. I'm tired, tense, and nervous. And I let you talk me into all kinds of nonsense. It isn't nonsense. Your wife testified she didn't ask you to buy the ribbon. And now she's dead. But there's someone else we can ask. I'll lay this to rest once and for all. friend Peter doesn't have an easy job. Awake, he gets cynical flack from his boss. Asleep, he's persecuted by the ghost of the man he's sentenced to death. Wait a minute. Let's pull that last statement back. We say asleep. Peter is persecuted. How can we be sure he's really asleep? Or that John Halder is positively dead? Well, just stick with us. You know we've never led you astray yet, especially in the third act. Peter Littlewood has been serving as his country's assistant minister of justice. And it has just been called to his attention that he really doesn't know what justice is. Which you must admit is an embarrassing situation. And since so much life and death is involved, Peter is determined to find out about one particular death, regardless of how much it costs. 
Yes, sir. May I help you? Oh, Your Excellency. Do you know who I am? Yes, sir. Everyone knows you. You're the assistant justice. I have a question to ask you. On the day of the demonstration... The demonstration? Oh, sir, I wouldn't know anything. You remember that day? Yes, sir. When we saw it begin, we were the ones who telephoned the police. You could look that up. It must be on their records. The first call came from the ladies' ribbon and lace shop. Do you know a Mr. John Halder? Halder? A professor at the university. I don't think so. This is his picture. Yes, sir. Now, on this particular day, do you remember seeing him in your shop? No, sir. If he's a subversive person... Stop that. I want the truth. Don't try to anticipate me. Now, did he buy anything in your shop? That was a very upsetting day. There, there, there were so many people in here. Answer. I'm trying. I'll show you my sales receipt. The place was jammed. People were coming in and out. It was one of the busiest days of the year. Then you'd have no way of knowing? And to make things worse, once the police arrived, people became frightened. And they started jamming into all the stores. You know how the police swing their clubs and arrest everyone in sight. They have to do it. I'm not complaining. You didn't see this man? No, sir, I did not. <laughs> Peter? Yes, Alma? Oh, you're rather late. I'm sorry I kept dinner waiting. But we're not dining at home. We're not. Peter, are you all right? Well, the minister's guest for dinner tonight. When did this happen? Well, the date was made at least a week ago. Oh, I can't seem to remember. It's formal. I'm just too tired. You don't want to go? I just want to get some sleep. Well, then you'll simply have to call the minister. Would you do it for me, Alma? I can hardly keep my eyes open. If you want to go, well, you can. Oh, I find your minister a bore. And why would I want to go alone? Besides, I have work to do. Hello? Dr. Miller? Oh, it's you, my dearest. I'm afraid Peter and I must disappoint you this evening. Peter's not well. A pity. Really a pity. We'll just have to make it to the table. Shall I uh, set the car for you, darling? Uh, just a moment, Your Excellency. Peter, mm -hmm. the minister insists I come alone. He's invited some people to discuss plant security with me. I hate to impose, Alma, but it might be better. Uh, Your Excellency. Yes, my darling. I'll wait for your car. Champagne is cooling. Hurry. Goodbye, Your Excellency. I am sorry you're in for a boring night, Alma. I'll manage to get through it somehow. If Halder dares to show up now, I can face him. I have the evidence. He's a subversive. He said he was in that shop and bought the ribbon. If that were true, he could have proven it. But his wife denies sending him there. The shop owner can't remember seeing him there. He can't prove he was there. But I can prove it. Who? Yes, John Alder. What do you want from me? Justice. You said you could prove you were in the ribbon shop. How can you prove Look it? Look in this bag. This small brown bag. Look at what's inside. The, uh, the ribbon. Yes, the ribbon. The blue ribbon Martha asked me to buy for her. And uh, here, the sales slip. When you were being interrogated, you were asked where the ribbon was. You said you lost it. That's true. But, but, but how did you lose it, and how did you find it? I walked out of the shop, and the police descended upon the square, grabbing at everyone. I dropped the bag. It fell against the building. I remember that. After I was executed. And so I went back there. Later. And it was still there. Here. Take it. The ribbon. The blue ribbon. The ribbon. Well, what am I supposed to do? Take it. Use it as a symbol for justice. Justice? Take my place. 
My place in the underground. No, oh, no, you, you, you're crazy. No. There will never be justice as long as this government exists to make a mockery of it. Help fight for a true government of the people. No. You say no. But you do it. You do it because now you believe in justice. I must wake up. Wake up from this nightmare. You will not wake up until mm. you hear me out. Look at your people. How they cower in fear. No, I'm not listening anymore. There you are. I have brought you the symbol, the blue symbol of freedom and justice. This blue ribbon. Let me alone. I will go away now. But you will remember every word I said. And you will act. You must. Or else. I and so many others will have died in vain. Uh, goodbye, Peter. I know I leave the fight in good hands. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Coffee? Thank you. Enjoy dinner last night? No, it was the usual bore. I am sorry. Well, at least I got a wonderful night's sleep. Oh, well, I'm glad. Oh, uh, did you by any chance happen to see some blue... Yes. <laughs> now, this is going to sound crazy, but I had a dream. Mm -hmm. A dream that someone had given me a piece of... <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It was only a dream. And yet it was so real... I half expected it would be there when I woke up. You'd better see a doctor. Those dreams seem quite ravaging. <laughs> the dreams are all over. How do you know? I discovered why I was dreaming. Oh? You see, the dreams were a substitute for action. What sort of action? The right sort of action, which I realized an answer that leads you no wiser than before. Mm. Well, I shall be late for my office. <laughs> I wanted to say, wait, don't go. I want to talk to you about an entire change in my life. But I looked at her face. Her sallow face. So devoid of expression. She wasn't the kind of woman you talk to about danger and excitement. Yes? Peter, did you come to my office, please? Well, is it important? I have some documents. Very well. What is it, Your Excellency? Hey. What are all these people doing here? Well, this should be familiar to you. You've attended so many in the past. It's an administrative trial. A trial? Who's been tried? You are. I am. Sergeant, place the handcuffs on him. No, no, wait, wait. Be seated. I demand to know what you this is all. You have your chance to be heard. You are charged with the murder of Professor John Halder. Murder? But I sentenced him to death, and you approved the sentence. I was not in possession of all of the facts. You had withheld evidence. What evidence? Evidence that would have proved John Halder's innocence. That you murdered him. That isn't true. Why would I want to murder him? I didn't even know him. You knew his wife. His wife? You were attracted to her. That's a lie. And so you deliberately withheld the evidence. I defy you to produce any evidence. Do you recognize this? But it's the bag. Yes. The bag which contains the purchase Professor John Alder made at the ribbon shop. Two yards of blue ribbon which could have proved his innocence. Well, where, where... How did you get that bag? How do you think? Your wife brought it to me. My wife? Alma, you're here? What are you doing here? Mrs. Littlewood, will you tell us how you came into possession of the bag with the blue ribbon? I found it under, uh, under my husband's pillow. And what made you bring it to me? I knew about the case, and I... I heard him talk about it in his sleep. How he loved her. That isn't true. 
John Halder brought it to me. John Halder is dead. Even so, he gave me the ribbon. Pretending to be insane will not save you. The fact is, the ribbon which could have saved John Halder was found in your possession. Thanks to the patriotic gesture by your wife, it is ours. Thelma, Thelma, why? Why did you do this to me? It was my duty as a citizen. You have committed the most heinous crime an official can be guilty of. Abuse of office. Now, is there anything you wish to say before sentence is passed? Thelma. Thelma, where did you get the ribbon? It, it was only a dream. Alma, answer me. You needn't answer him, my dear. What? My dear? My dear? Is that it? Is that what happened? But he's... He's twice your age. What, what do you see in him? Take him away. No. No, please, Your Excellency. Wait. Thank you, gentlemen. The trial is over. <laughs> Champagne, dearest. Yeah, my darling. And so the Honorable Peter Littlewood, assistant to the Minister for Justice, was finally brought to justice himself. You may say he deserved to die for all the people he had cruelly killed. And, of course, he also deserved to die for the cruel way he neglected his wife. But I shall not neglect you. I shall return in just a few moments. engaged in the dispensing of justice would have to ask himself that question? Or is it so odd? How many of us know the meaning of our daily task? Or in other words, how many people really know what they're doing? The opponent? No, it's not. Our cast included Leon Janney, Jackson Beck, Evie Jester, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Is your name Slate Shannon? That's right. And this is Miss Duval. I'm very happy. Then I'm happy too. Hello. My name is Cameron. I have a plantation outside of San Tomas. Sugar. Sugar? For the time being, just call me Sailor. What can we do for you, Mr. Cameron? I've never come to a man and, and begged before in my life. Well, then you've come to the wrong man. You don't have to beg anything from me. It's about a girl. 
A young girl, wild, impetuous, and spoiled. No, thanks. Mr. Shannon already has one. Sailor, why don't you go and put a new point in our desk pen? Where am I going to get a new point? Post office is closed. Please. It's about my daughter. It's about Kathy. Kathy and the Blue Moon. Oh, yes. There's a gambling ship in the bay called the Blue Moon. Look, if you're a man in trouble, I'll listen to you. If all you want to do is hire someone to spank your daughter for gambling, get yourself somebody else. Because nobody else can do what I want you to do. You haven't told Slate yet what it is. Maybe he won't Do you want... mind if I make my own decision, sailor? Go ahead, Miss Cameron. Kathy's involved with a man named Norton. Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He owns the Blue Moon. How did your daughter get mixed up with a guy like that? I don't know. All I know is that since she's met him, she's... Well, she's changed. She's a stranger to me. She's on that boat all the time. I have an easy solution. Why don't you just tell Mr. Norton to buy your daughter from the boat? I've tried that. He laughed in my face. He told me... Hold it a minute. Sailor, there's a guy over there at the cigar counter. Take care of him. Go ahead, sailor. I'll remember every word Mr. Cameron says and tell you later. All right, Cameron? Well, Norton knows something about Kathy I don't. I know my daughter. It's more than just a lust for gambling. Please, will you help me, Shannon? Go there, talk to Kathy. Convince her that she she need never go back to that ship again. Please, please, I'll, I'll give you anything. Put your wallet back. Your daughter's in trouble with Norton? I'll, I'll try to straighten her out. You don't understand, Shannon. I'm a rich man. When I bring Kathy back, you'll give me a box of lump sugar? You're not too loud, Paul. You disturb our boss. Tell Greg I want to see him. Our boss sleeps. His brain goes all the time. He needs rest. Wake him up, Mickey. I've got something for him. I don't wake up, boss, till he asks me. Wake me up, Mickey. Who wants me? It's your croupier, Paul. The wheel jockey says he's got something. He can keep it to himself till you get your share of sleep, boss. Let him in. Our boss says for me to let you in. I'll let... Uh, you have something for me, Paul? Well, give it to me, but make it tender, because I just woke up. I uh, was in Shannon's place a little while ago. And you had fun. Rub my neck, Mickey. There's a crick in it. Yeah, thanks, boss. Ah. Oh, that's good. That's very good. There was someone else there. Kathy Cameron's father. Now the other side, Mickey. Ah. He's sick with worry about his daughter. Wants Shannon to take her away from you. You three must have made a jolly group. They were so wrapped up in it. Shannon, his girl, Cameron. They thought all I wanted was to buy a pack of cigarettes. You're a good boy, Paul. The thing of many talents. Shannon's coming out here to the boat. I thought you'd need to know. Paul's a good boy, isn't he, Mickey? I'm better for you, boss. He can't do the things for you I can do. He can't... Of course he can't, Mickey. Nobody can that's why I keep you around, isn't it? See? See? That's why he keeps me around. That's why... Sure, he... Mickey. <laughs> so they want to take Kathy away from me. And Kathy will never leave me. Because I fixed it that way, didn't I, boss? Mm-hmm. Because you threw yourself in front of her car because she thought she'd killed you. That's why you've got to keep out of her sight because for as long as she thinks you don't exist, she belongs to me. Till I use her up. Her and her daddy's money. And so clean. She loses it to me at the roulette table. Clean and legitimate. Boss, this Shannon could... No one's going to spoil it, Mickey. Not a well-paying corpse like you, I give you my word. Look through the porthole, Greg. That's Shannon's boat coming alongside. Go hold his hand, Paul. Then bring him to me. I want to tell him how he can't part two sweethearts like Kathy and me. You do me and my gambling ship great honor, Mr. Duval, Mr. Shannon. Your boy brought us to you. We asked for Kathy Cameron. He didn't want to deny me the pleasure of meeting you two. He has standing orders to deliver to me first the illustrious, the renowned. You see, Slate, I keep telling you that's what we are. You never believe me. Go on, Mr. Norton. You were saying... That I would have shuddered if you came aboard and deprived me of yourselves. Gee, you're smooth, Mr. Norton. The way you talk. The waxed mustache... That's the only word for you. Smooth. So you saved yourself a shot, Norton. 
Now, is it all right if we go find Kathy? She may not care for you disturbing her at the gambling table. Now, what did you want with Miss Cameron? We're going to take her back to Havana with us, Norton, because her father's lonesome for her. He's a funny guy. He thinks his daughter ought to spend more time at home. Any objections? Uh, I only asked you because you stuck your nose in. <laughs> no objections. I only fear for you. You think you can stop me? I know I can. However, Miss Cameron is in the casino on A deck. And uh, please sign the guest book. I'll want something to remember you by. Number 12 on the black. Black page, 12 page. Miss Cameron? What? Mind if we talk to you? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Place your bets. You mind if we talk to you? Go away. Oh, I can't do that, Miss Cameron. Why don't you two try the poop deck? It's a good place to jump from. Jump from? Oh, your preposition is dangling, Kathy. Your father must have picked the wrong finishing school for you. My father? Oh, it made me miss my bet. Sailor. I know. You want me to kibitz that hot game of old maid over there. Come on, Kathy. Let's get some air, you and I. Oh, you're hurting my arm. It's an advice I use to make myself clear. Come on. I made a suggestion to you before concerning the poop deck. Or if that doesn't suit you, why don't you try it from this rail? Oh, you're just a kid, Kathy. You've got to grow up a little more before that kind of talk becomes you. Oh, you think I'm a kid. Nineteen, twenty. Kids that old and women over 40 use lipstick the way you do. Another suggestion. A girl 19 is better for you. Want to know why? I'll put my arms around you and show you. Hey, take it easy. And hold you. Okay, Norton. Yes! Yeah! <clears throat> ah. Did you notice, Miss Cameron? I only had to do it once, right in back of the neck. Get him out of here. I think I'll give him back to Miss Duval. <laughs> Don't you think I'm considerate? Mr. Slate, he stood on moonlit deck. Man from behind hit him in he neck. Lady sailor, she bring from ship blue moon. Her winnings to date, Mr. Slate in a swoon. Because they tried to do one very good deed. Bring daughter back to father who cried his need. He waved at them, a face full of war. Mr. Slate, he said, don't cry, I go. You see, Slate, if you didn't make such a hobby of helping people, this never would have happened to you. Yeah, that's just what a fellow needs at a time like this, sailor, a kind word. Now you are hurt, Mr. Slate, because you love a good deed too much? <laughs> yeah, I live for the moment when I can bring a wandering girl back to her daddy. Let Norton have her. I don't think I could go through this again. You go through with it. Your neck is my neck. I read that once in a poem. I'm going back to the Blue Moon, sailor. Mend me real nice because I've got some things to do there. I want to look good. Uh-uh. If you go back, they'll kill you. Those were Norton's parting words to me. He said, tell him not to come back. Next time, I'll give them to you in pieces. You're a complicated man, Slate. I could never put you back together again. Give me another whiff of your smelling salt, sailor. That ringing noise is back in my skull. You're a ham bone. That's the telephone. Shannon's place, Sailor Duval. Mr. Shannon, please. Oh, uh-huh. For you, Slate, the man who grows sugar. He's in a tizzy. Anyway, he makes sounds like a tizzy. I'll let you know. Slate Shannon speaking. Forget it, Mr. Shannon. Forget I arrived called on you. I don't need you any longer. Where are you, Mr. Cameron? I'm at home. But you're not to come here. You're not to... Get me a clean shirt, sailor. I've got to see a man who doesn't need me. <laughs> What's this all about, Cameron? Did anyone follow you here? I didn't bother to look. Let's go inside. If they followed you... Inside. Up. Norton's got you scared, too, huh? You don't know what you're doing coming here. Who did he threaten? You or your daughter? Get out of here. You made a big noise when I first met you, Cameron. Now all I hear is chicken. Your daughter needs help. 
What happened to all your worry about her? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You're kidding. Oh, let go of me. You're going to oh. calm down. There. That's better. Now, don't let us throw you. It's just a matter of age and condition. They'll kill her. No, they won't kill her. That's not what you're afraid of. Yes, yes. They're taking all your money through her. Killing you would be a safer investment. That way, they'd get the money a lot faster. I... I don't want to die. Well, neither do I. You started something with me. Now it's got to be finished. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. I give you two words, Slate. You're crazy. Yeah, I get psychotic when I'm beat over the head. Now, look, it's three o'clock in the morning. Go get some sleep. I've gotten better prizes than you on the bottom of a crackerjack box. Why don't you do what I tell you? Look, if you tried to handle the bold venture now, you'd drive her into the rocks. In your condition, you... have got a condition. The man said he'd kill you if you came out to the blue moon again. He said that... He... Aren't you going to help me aboard our boat? All right. Sometimes I wonder why I even bother. I had a spaniel once who had better manners than you. Talk to me, Slate. Out of the way. <laughs> You're going to give me trouble. Who are you talking to? Out of the way. Taylor. What do you want? Come here. Look at the motor. Wires all over the place. Someone's... Someone's come aboard. Who's there? I can't see your face. Who is it? But you can see my gun, can't you? Who are you? How about you, Mr. Vall? Can you see it? Uh, move it a little to the left. Thanks. My, it's pretty in the moonlight. If you get that boat fixed, take it north. If you take it south, you might get too close to the blue moon. Then everything will blow up in your face. I've been pushed around long enough. I've got about... And next time, I'll put the bullet into your head, Shannon, instead of into the woodwork of your boat. Want to try? No? <laughs> See? You can be sensible. Good night, mechanics. You do yourself nicely on my money, Paul. Your apartment, charming. The decor, excellent taste. And now that I've performed the amenities, you have something for me? It'll take Shannon a long time to fix his boat. And you convinced him not to annoy us anymore? Mm, it's hard to tell with a man like Shannon. Yes, you're ever so right. But it's up to you, my dear Kathy. If Shannon should discover you're a murderess, a hit-and-run killer, they'd take you away from me. And that would make you desolate, wouldn't it? You wanted me to do something? Just tell me. Don't claw at me like a fat cat. Emotions have their way with you, don't they, my dear? All right, Call Shannon's place. Ask for Miss Duval. Tell her to come here because you need her so desperately. In ten minutes. You do need her, Kathy. So you won't waste your precious life away in prison. Shannon's place, Sailor Duval speaking. This is Kathy, Miss Duval. Kathy Cameron. Is Mr. Shannon there? No, he's sitting up with a sick boat. He's up not... Good. Listen, you must come here alone. 16 Paseo Gomez, apartment 12. In 10 minutes, if it matters to you whether I live. Well, that's the other side of town. How do I get there this time of night? There are no cabs. What do I do? Wave a wand over a pumpkin? Oh, you must. Please, find a way. Well, maybe King Moses will lend me his jalopy. What's wrong, Kathy? Why do you In want... In 10 minutes, Mr. Val. The way you wanted it, Greg? 
Your choice of words was exquisite, my dear. And it is a matter of whether you live. <laughs> Dum, da, dum, dum, da, da, da. Hey, watch out, you crazy fool! <laughs> Look, I, I didn't see you. I, oh, you're hurt, aren't you? I'll go get help. Hey there! Am I glad to see somebody? This man. I saw what happened. Get a doctor, will you? Your car was weaving from side to side. You ran this man down. What are you talking about? He just ran out in front of the car. And you tried to run away. If I hadn't stopped you, you'd have just left the man lying there. You know something? You don't have anything to worry about as long as you listen to me. You know something? Now your voice fits your face. First it was your face. You spin the wheel on the blue moon. And your voice happened a little while ago, aboard our boat. Wait a minute. It doesn't matter who I am. You hit that man. Ouch! Are you out of your mind, lady? Did I pinch you too hard? You're supposed to be dead. Hey, we got a clever one on our hands, Paul. Yeah, she's done being clever. Throw her in the car, Mickey. The boss will tell you where to throw her after that. Welcome, Mr. Slit. I got coffee perking for you in the kitchen. Ah. Uh. Thanks, King. You didn't have to wait up for me. What I have and have not to do, Mr. Slate, is my own affair. I go bring your coffee. No, no coffee. Stay here, King. Sing to me. Right now I need sleep. I do not think sleep will come to you, Mr. Slate. You just sit there and watch it. It will not come because Miss Salo is not here. If she wants to roam Havana this time and I'd let her. I got other things on my mind. Two hours ago, there came a phone call. Miss Saylor, scribble address on pad, borrow my auto. Here is the address. I think you better go look for her, Mr. Slit. Because <laughs> you're afraid she looks gone with that heap. Take 20 bucks out of the register, King. That'll take care of it. Because the call came from Miss Kathy Cameron. Huh? I told you sleep would not come, Mr. Slit. You banging on the right door, mister? Yeah. Banging on the right head. Oh! Ah. Now we'll drag you inside. Come on, up on your feet. Get with it, Buster. Start talking. What's the matter with you? Oh. Up. This is where we were ten seconds ago. Start talking. Uh, not gonna get you any place, Shannon. You know my name. Huh? Oh. That's for taking the liberty. What did you do with Sailor? Blue Moon. She's there. How come she's there? You're going to answer me, Buster, because you happen to be fresh off the Blue Moon. You're the guy who spins the roulette wheel. I tried to frame her. Didn't work. How? Make like hit and run. Blackmail. Little guy, Mickey, used to make a living at it. Run in front of the car, make out he's hurt. People get scared. Pay off. Sailor was too smart. Didn't bite. Same gambit you pulled on Kathy Cameron, huh? Get out of it, Shannon. You know, for a guy who spins a roulette wheel all day, how come you keep one in your apartment? Hobby. Uh-huh. Hobby. And you'll enjoy this. I read where a croupier in Monte Carlo practiced and practiced. He got good. He could put that ball in the black slot or the red slot almost every time he wanted. You're buying grief. He couldn't do it every time, but his average was great. All right, all right. Like you and Norton are doing to Kathy Cameron. Blackmailing her on a hit-and-run caper. She pays her off by playing the wheel, loses money every night. Knows it's rigged against her and can't do anything about it. <laughs> Stealing money legal. Uh-huh. Because I woke you from a deep sleep. Oh! I give it back to you. Hey, amigo, your boat for hire? Let me hear a number, senor. Five bucks. Not the right number. Try Carlos with the catboat. Ten. Ten bucks. Put your money where my hand is. Here. Eight bucks and change. 
Blue moon, Skipper. She's anchored a few miles out. First, I count the change. Well, look, you. Do you want the blue moon, senor? Then let me count the change. 97, 98, 99. Oh, here is the other penny. You, you almost didn't make it, senor. You want I should wait for you, senor? Yeah, wait. I give you a hand up the side. Now, this rope hanging down from the side. Just hold the end of it. I'm going up hand over hand. And uh, now, pick a cabin, Shannon, and see how your luck is. Sailor. 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 Hey, it's the middle of the night. Yeah, isn't it, though? I'll get back to you. Sailor. Is that you, Slade? Let me in. I can't. The door's locked. You got a hairpin? What's the matter? The night wind playing hard with your hair, too? Slip it under the door. All right, here. Where did you learn how to pick a lock? A friend of mine taught me. Gee, that reminds me, I owe her a letter. I'll stay like this, sailor. It's been too long since I felt your arm against my cheek. Just think. All this while, there's only been a hairpin. But... Get back in there, sailor. Put your hair up. I'll be back. Can't get away, Shannon. You made a mistake, Shannon. I'm going to find you in that boiler room and kill you. I see you, Shannon. Well, I've got to hand it to you, Shannon. You tried. Too bad you had to die on a coal pile. You almost did. Come on down to the coal pile with me. I'll bring you. Start with this. I can still hear you. Can't hear you anymore now, Norton. Slade, are you all right? Look, I spoiled a nice clean shirt you washed for me. I'll wash your other one. First, there's a couple of guys on this boat. I've got to collect them for the police. What about Kathy? She's got nothing more to worry about. Her father can get her. Well, it happened again, Slate. You did your good deed, and you got your lumps for it. Don't you get tired of it. Till the next time. Let's get out of here, sailor. All fixed, sailor. The last wire's in place. The bold venture's gonna run like a dream. Fine. Where are we going? Well, I didn't say we were going any place. I just said the bold venture'd run like a dream. You want to hear it? If it makes you happy. All right. Wait till you hear that motor purr. What kind of a dream does that sound like? Oh, I had it running a minute ago. Let me try. What'd you do to it? Touched it gently. You want to see how? See? Your eyes, your cheeks, your lips. You purr too, don't you? <laughs> Full speed ahead, sailor. There's a smooth sea tonight. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture.
from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Jane Wyman in The Blue Veil. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When I first met Jane Wyman several years ago, I was impressed with her beauty, her talents as a pert ingenue, and, of course, her sense of humor. I thought she undoubtedly would win some sort of an award with this delightful combination. But I didn't predict that it would be the coveted Academy Award and that Jane would receive it for her performance in a highly dramatic role. Tonight, we present Jane Wyman in a characterization for which she received another Academy Award nomination. RKO's moving drama, The Blue Veil. Now the curtain rises on The Blue Veil, starring Jane Wyman. But he didn't stand a chance of getting away. And then he stopped and began firing at us. That was his big mistake. The sound of the shot stampeded the cattle. And by the time they were driven off, our suspect had been trampled to death. Oh, uh, Inspector Donnelly suggested it. You should have been home long ago. It's too bad you lost that man. Yeah. I've been waiting for you to say that. But at least we know who he was. His name was Gus Hatter. Where he lived, fingerprints, driver's license. Donnelly's got men planted at the hotel and on his telephone. If anyone tries to get through, they'll take him. I suppose that's the best way to look at it now. Try not to think about the other kidnappers. The ones who are waiting for that man to... Meantime, we'll look for something else for you. Oh, I'm certainly glad to see you, Mrs. Mason. And I hope, uh, I hope that as you get accustomed to the house and to the little fellow here, that you'll be happy and glad you came to us. Well, thank you, Mr. Begley. But you realize that I'm just filling in until you can find someone. Oh? Oh, well, I, I didn't know. But you will stay until I do get someone. Oh, yes, of course I will. Uh... May I tell you something, Mrs. Mason? For ten years, my wife and I prayed to have the joy of a child. And when she died to give him life, the joy became a great sorrow. I am only now getting able to speak of it. I try to hide it as much as possible, but I do Mr. feel... Mr. Begley, I think your son needs some rest now, don't you? What? Oh, oh yes, ma'am. Rest he shall have. When it comes to Fred K. Begley, Jr., I'm your obedient servant at your beck and call. This way, Mrs. Mason. Let me show you to your room. As the weeks went by, Mr. Begley discovered that finding someone to replace Louise was anything but easy. It became their custom on Sunday mornings for Louise and her employer to take the baby to the park. I give up, Louise. I've interviewed five nurses this week. Oh, you'll find someone, Mr. Begley. <laughs> you've spoiled us, you know. You've not only been so good to little Freddie, but the way you've brightened up that gloomy old <laughs> house. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Louise, how is it that a girl like you, young and attractive, is doing, well, this sort of work? I like it. <laughs> well, I must say, that's a perfect reason. But then I suppose I'd like any kind of work that has a lot of Freddie in it. He's such a sweet baby. <laughs> uh, Louise, that man back there on the bench, you spoke to him before. Oh, yes, that was Frank Hutchinson. He owns the toy shop. I stop by there quite often. But, uh... You call him Frank and me, Mr. Bakley. <laughs> well, I'll call you Frank, too. <laughs> My name, as you well know, is Frederick and has been for some time. Uh, Louise, let's sit here for a while. There's something I would like to say. Yes, to Mr. Bagley. I, uh... I've had lots of time to think since Margaret died. I, I, I know I'm not a young man, but I do have some standing in the community. I own the fourth largest corset house in the East, and I have the goodwill of my employees... And, well, I hope I don't seem big-headed or anything like that. Oh, no. I, you have so much to be proud of. Well, wh what I'm getting at is that I... I find myself increasingly lost without a woman close to me. A uh, wife, Louise. And I was wondering whether, since you two are... Uh, oh, Freddy, darling. Uh, oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's a nice doggy. He was just playing with you. Oh, now, now, you mustn't cry, dear. <laughs> Just frightened, huh? 
I think he's more tired than frightened. We'd better start for home. Home? Oh, oh yes, 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 of course. That's a good boy. There, now you see? The doggie wants to walk with us. Oh, well, we had a fine time in the park, didn't we? Uh, yes, didn't we? May I come in, Louise? I've brought some ice cream. What a nice surprise. Yes, come in. What? Oh, I take it my son is asleep. Shh. Yes. My, this is a treat. Louise, did you hear what I said to you in the park this morning? No. What? Nothing, I said. Well, you were you were telling me about your situation. I, I was proposing to you, Louise. I mean, well, I know you love Freddy just as much as I do, and since we're both... Well, what I'm saying is, will you be my wife? It's kind and good of you to ask Maybe me. Maybe you don't find it such a bright prospect, but on the other hand, it's nothing to dismiss lightly, is it? Oh, no, it isn't. No. And I understand what you mean by loneliness. It's frightening. But one mustn't act hastily because of loneliness, Mr. Beckley. Oh. Then the answer is no. Oh, don't put it that way, please. I like you very much. But I feel that my place is with little Fred. Big Fred can fend for himself. He always has, and he's done very well. It, uh... It was good of you to listen to me. I want you to know I'm proud of having been asked. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Good night. Some months later, Mr. Begley married his secretary at the factory, a good and devoted woman. Little Freddie had a mother again. And to Louise came the bitter realization that she'd have to leave him. But whenever she felt in special need of cheering up, she could depend upon the man in the toy store, Frank Hutchinson. Look at this train. Just look at it. The workmanship. Well? It's too good for children. They don't deserve it. Now, what have you got against children this time? Uh, they act like a privileged class just because they're little. When they're infants, they're nothing but an elementary canal with noises attached. And then the older they get, the more they resemble adults, and you know what that leads to. Is there no one you like, young or old? No, don't start fishing for compliments. I have a criticism to make of you, too. Now what have I done? I'll tell you, as soon as I get rid of this monster. He's just a little boy. Now be nice to him. All right, all right. Now what do you want? You should be ashamed of yourself, pretending to that little boy that you didn't know what he wanted. Well, any fool would know he wanted a kaleidoscope. Then why wouldn't you let him buy one? Because all he could call it was a thing. Let him learn words. Nobody knows how to speak anymore. No language. Everything's a thing. You were going to tell me what's wrong with me. Oh, I was indeed. Why do you want to go on looking after other people's kids? The first thing you know, that silly nurse's blue veil of yours will be a permanent fixture, a way of life, a habit. A bad habit, Frank? I'm warning you, Lulu, mind what I say now. And I love you dearly, but you haven't been right about anything as long as I've known you. <laughs> Mr. Hutchinson! Well? The thing I wanted, it's, it's a kaleidoscope. A what? You know, a kaleidoscope. Hmm. Spell it. <laughs> Yes, Louise had taken another position, this time with a wealthy family in Connecticut, the Palfreys. They had two boys, Harrison and Robbie. The Palfreys had a tutor for Harrison, an energetic young man named Gerald Keene. So it was the younger boy, Robbie, who was Louise's special care. It's just thunder and lightning, Robbie. Don't be afraid. It woke me up. It scared me. Well, you know what that old thunder does. He's here to wake up people who are sleeping so he can tell them to get up and close their windows or they'll be rained on. But why is it so loud? Well, sometimes it's loud because it wants to make little boys brave enough to jump out of bed and turn on the light. I can turn on a light, I think. Well, good. Let me see how brave you are. There. Why, that's wonderful. Now, turn the light off and show me that you're not afraid of the storm in the dark either. Now. There. Oh, Robbie, I'm so proud of you. Now back to bed and go to sleep. I'm sure Harrison's been asleep for hours. Aren't you going to tell me a story? Again? But I have to fall asleep again. Oh, well, all right. Now, where did I leave off? They were in danger. 
danger. And it sure looked bad. Oh, yes. The Enchanted Prince was pitching. All the bases were loaded when along came a five-eyed giant swinging five bats at the same time. Why did he have five bats? Oh, I don't know. He was that kind of a batter. He went up to the plate and the umpire said, Excuse me, sir, but aren't you using more bats than the rule allows? And the five-eyed giant said, Well, excuse me, sir, but I was always under the impression that a batter could use as many bats as he cared to. Now this puzzle can unwind. Mr. Keene? Oh, I, I thought I heard someone down there. Shh, we just came home. Harrison and I, we've been seeing a cowboy movie. You and Harrison? Well, where is he? I told him to sneak up the back stairs. Oh, my, how education has changed. <laughs> I never thought a cowboy movie would find a place on a tutor's course of study. Oh, come on in the kitchen. I'm hungry. How was the movie? Oh, it was good. It was very good. Yeah. Mind if I take off this wet coat? You better take off those wet shoes, too. You can put your feet in the oven. Oh, the nicest extras come with this job. You like this job? Well, it'll do till something better comes along. And something may, too. Oh? Mm, I've got applications all over the place. An instructor in Mexico, something rather with Standard in China, a faculty job at the American School in Beirut, Syria. Mexico, China, Syria. Adventure, Lulu, adventure. New horizons. Hey, where are you going? Oh, this milk I've been warming is for Harrison, not for you. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to fix some eggs. Well, thanks. I'll eat them in the morning. Good night, Mr. <laughs> They saw considerable of each other in those next few weeks, Louise and Jerry Keene, the tutor. And then one afternoon in the garden, he brought her some exciting news. It's a cablegram, Lulu, from Syria. Well, something better did come along, didn't it? Congratulations, only, Jerry. Only now I'm not so sure that I want the job. I'll miss you, Lulu. They don't leave you much time, do they? No. And by the way, you're going to a party with me tomorrow night. Oh, you're way ahead of no, me. It's just a few friends giving me a send-off. Say yes, Lulu. Well, I'm not sure that I could get off. Oh, I've already fixed it with Mrs. Palfrey. Oh, you're too efficient for me. Yeah, we'll, we'll have dinner in New Haven, go on to the party, and be back here in time for me to catch the 140 for Washington. I have to meet some of the trustees down there. How about it, Lulu? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I'd fit in with your professor friends. Oh, utter, absolute, horrible nonsense. Lulu! Oh, it's Robbie. Excuse me. Wait a minute. Is it a deal? Lulu! Uh, uh, yes, it's the deal. The party was a wonderful success, for Louise especially. Jerry's friends all liked her very much. And then, while they were driving back to the Palfrey estate... I liked your friends, Jerry. Why, they didn't scare me a bit. And thank you for such a nice evening. Oh, gosh, how fast can things happen? One minute I'm tutoring a rich man's son, and the next minute, <laughs> Syria. A whole new life ahead of me. Oh, you're so lucky. I envy you so. Hey, I just got a great idea. You're going to Syria with me. Oh, Jerry. No, 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 no I'm serious. Oh, but that's a mad idea. Well, what of it? Haven't you ever done anything mad in your life? Now, look, we can stop at the house, you pack your things, and we'll still be able to catch the train. We'll sail on Wednesday and be married by the ship's captain on Thursday. What do you say? Well, what about Robbie? Robbie? Well, he's a palfrey, isn't he? Oh, he still needs me, Jerry. And so do I. Oh, come on, Lulu. The minutes are slipping by. Well, aren't you being a little impulsive? Oh, sure, but I'm asking you to be impulsive with me. And we haven't much time. Shall I drive fast or slow? Well, uh, not too fast, Jerry. I heard you drive in, Mr. Keene. I wanted to say goodbye again. Thank you, Mrs. Palfrey. You've been very kind. I'm glad you heard me. I was just about to leave a note for you. Oh? I'm... I'm not leaving alone. Louise is coming with me. Louise? When did she decide to do that? Tonight, Mrs. Palfrey. Just, just like that. And you're going to be married? Yes, on board the ship. Well, I hate to dampen your enthusiasm, but I must say I'm a little bit startled. You're angry with us? No, but you haven't known each other very long. And marriage is a big contract, you know. We know that, Mrs. Palfrey. But because some quick marriages fail, it's no reason to condemn all of them, is it? We're very fond of Louise. We'd be sorry to see her hurt, that's all. And you, too. But I shouldn't have spoken. I hope both of you will be very happy. Thank you, Mrs. Palfrey. Lulu? I, I just came in to kiss you, Robbie. Now go back to sleep. Where have you been? I was out. Oh, you 
going out again? Yes, I'm going out again. Why? Well, I'm going away for a little while, Robbie. No, Lulu, no. Oh, oh, Robbie, darling, you, you've got to let me go or I'll be late. I won't let you go. Don't go, Lulu. Please don't go. Lulu? Darling, we're on our way. You happy? Almost. Oh, it's Robbie, Jerry. I, I just couldn't tell him the truth, but somehow he knew I'd never be back. Oh, he'll, he'll get over it. After all, you had to leave him someday. Well, it's done now, and I'm very happy to be here. Oh, you don't know how glad I am to hear you say that. You know, you had me worried. But why? I... I didn't think you seemed sure. Well, what do you mean, Jerry? Well, I had the feeling that I took advantage of you. I mean, and use, using the pressure of time to rush you into this. Oh, but I liked being rushed. Yes, but w would you have accepted if I'd asked you yesterday, when I showed you the cable? You're trying to say something. What? No, I just want to be sure. Well, aren't you sure? Oh, come here, darling. That's my answer, sweetheart. Are you convinced now? You're going to love the trip, Lulu. You're going to love the country and the people and all the things we're going to see. You don't, you don't have to convince me, Jerry. I'm not trying to convince you. It's just that I, I want so much for our marriage to be a success. You aren't very confident, are you? Well, of course I am, but... Well, you're the last person in the world I'd want to hurt, Louise. I hoped you'd have something else to say to me. I am a little hesitant now. Oh, but you've got me all wrong. I just thought it was being fair to you to mention the dangers. The point is... We're going to succeed in spite of them. In spite of them? You haven't lost your nerve, have you? Oh, no. You see, I had a feeling it was wrong to rush into this like a couple of kids, and and then when I saw Robbie... Well, you, you don't mean that he makes any difference now. Well, I had no right to hurt him, and I did. Jerry, if this thing is right, our getting married, it doesn't have to be this minute, does it? I'll go back. Go and, back? And we'll wait a while... We can write to each other, and then in a couple of months, after you're established, and and you still feel, then I'll follow you. Well, if you really think that we... And by that time, then Robbie will understand, and I won't be running away at his expense. Well, I guess that is more sensible. But I hate to be sensible. I know. I know. They changed trains in New York. Jerry went on to Washington, and Louise went back to Connecticut. Early in the morning, Robbie stirred in his sleep, his eyes half opened. He saw a familiar figure sitting at the window of his room. Hi, Lulu. Hi, darling. In just a moment, we will continue with Act Two of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Today, one of our outstanding ambassadors of goodwill is Nelson Rockefeller, grandson of John D. With his brothers, Nelson has invested $3 million in a business partnership with South American nationals. The official title of this venture is the International Basic Economy Corporation what South Americans call it El Plan Rockefeller. With American equipment and techniques, among other things, Nelson Rockefeller has built a profit-showing fishery in Venezuela, a reconversion plant to turn powdered milk imported from the United States back into fluid milk, a food warehousing and distribution concern, a series of model and self-supporting farms, and a 300-acre hog farm. Throughout South America, the Rockefeller plan has set up thriving businesses, enthusiastically supported by the people and the governments of the two nations. Part of the plan's profits go back into other projects for food production and distribution, where little or no production has been done before. Part will help finance the American International Association, a non-profit organization set up to study scientific nutrition, sanitation, hygiene, and child welfare. In 10 years, when the International Basic Economy Corporation is fully established, its stock will be sold to citizens of the countries in which it now operates. As Nelson Rockefeller put it, the people of South America don't want Santa Claus gifts. They want to be partners and, with us, do the job of helping themselves. Mr. Rockefeller knows only too well that by helping others, you help your country. 
Now our producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Act two of The Blue Veil, starring Jane Wyman as Louise Mason. Jerry Keene went to Syria. Louise never saw him again, nor did they ever write to each other. When Robbie was a few years older, Louise left the Palfrey home and went to work for Annie Rawlins. Annie was in musical comedy, not so young anymore, but still a star. She had a daughter, Stephanie. Well, tell me, Lulu, the dress. How do I look? You look very lovely, dear. Well, all I have to do is finish the hem, and that's it. I wish Mother were here. She should have phoned by now. Well, she will, darling. Lulu, this confirmation dress, it's like a wedding gown, isn't it? I mean, with a veil and everything? Yes, it is, a little. When you were married, did you wear a beautiful wedding gown? Was it exciting? No, it was a pale blue chiffon dress. I mean being married. Were you madly in love? Lulu, what's it like to be in love? Oh, Stephanie, my goodness, I don't even know that I'd remember. Oh, yes, you do. Was it long ago? How many times were you in love? Once. Once and a half. How did you feel? What's it like? Well, it's, it's mostly a glad feeling, like... Like when school's out for summer vacation. Is it really? Of course it isn't any one thing, Stephanie. Sometimes it can be very exciting, like when bells are ringing and whistles are blowing on New Year's Eve. And sometimes it... Well, I wonder who that is. I'll get it, dear. Good evening, Mr. Ashworth. Hello, Louise. For heaven's sake, what have we here? Hello, Uncle Bill. Well, you modeling for a wedding cake? She's being confirmed tomorrow. Oh, good. It'll never hurt you, Steffi. I've been confirmed for years. A confirmed bachelor... For which your mother is entirely to blame. Where is our Annie? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Ashworth. She was supposed to be home early. Take the dress off, darling, and it's way past your bedtime. Good night, Uncle Bill. Good night, honey, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Good night, Lulu. Good night, dear. What's going to happen to Annie? Oh, I really don't know, Mr. Ashworth. Well, why won't she quit? She's had a great career. She's had everything an actress well, could possibly... Well, look possi who's here. Oh, hello, darling. Oh, there's no business like show business. Hi, Louise. Good evening, Mrs. Rollins. Things have been happening. Well, tell me. Well, here I am worrying about the show closing when who do I bump into but Peter Allen. He's written a new show and he wants me to audition for Tad Joplin. Joplin, that old wart? Don't tell me you're hello, going to... Hello, Mama. Stephanie, oh. darling. Oh, but what are you doing out of bed? to see you. I was worried about you. Oh, I know, honey, and I'm awfully sorry, but I got tied up. I was just coming in to see you. Will you sit up close tomorrow at my confirmation? Of course I will. What time do you go on, sweetie? Eleven o'clock. Well, I, I have an audition at nine, but I'll be there in loads of time. You hope. Oh, don't pay any attention to him. Now go to bed, sweetheart. I want you to be bright and pretty in the morning. Good night, Mama. Thanks for coming home. Good night, baby. Joplin, huh? Annie, be sensible. Give up this rat race. Well, believe me, I was ready to until I met Peter Allen. Oh, darling, come over to the piano. Let me show you some of the songs. No, Annie didn't make it at church the following morning. It wasn't her fault. Joplin, the producer, enjoyed keeping people waiting. So it was Louise who took Stephanie to church. Louise, who met Stephanie's friends. And then later on at home. I tried, Steffi. I tried to get away. Oh, baby, are you mad at me? No, Mama, it's all right. Louise was there. How was the audition? Oh, it's a big day for us, Steffi. I got the job. I'm going on the road again. But today we'll celebrate. We'll do anything at all that you'd like to do. Can Louise come? Well, sure, if you want her to. Where is she? In the kitchen, fixing lunch. All right. Now, you get into a pretty dress, and then we'll... Well, you make the plans, huh? I'll think of something real special. And thank you, Mama. Louise. Oh, hello, Mrs. Rollins. Lunch will be ready soon. How was the ceremony? Very beautiful. And so was Stephanie. Well, I got the job. Oh, that's fine. Three weeks rehearsal. Boston two weeks, then New Haven, then New York. Mrs. Rollins, I, I'd like to leave if you could find someone to replace me. Louise. Well, I've been meaning to say something about it for some time, but I find it so difficult. Don't you like it here? Don't you like Stephanie? Well, I'd rather not go into that. But I insist that you tell me. I've been on the verge of leaving before, Mrs. Rollins, but each time, well, you'd get another show and I'd postpone doing anything about it, and each time it would get worse. Well, I just don't understand. I thought you were happy with us here. I thought you loved us. Oh, I do. And believe me, it's because I do that I have to leave. Oh, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Mrs. Rollins, I know you don't mean to, but... You see so little of Stephanie. She's been turning to me more and more, and now she's turned completely. Oh, that's 
silly. No one could take the place of a mother in a child's life. This morning at church, the children, some of the parents, well, they wanted to meet Stephanie's mother. Stephanie introduced me. She told them that I was her mother. But it was just... just a gesture, Louise. No, no, it's more than that. Unless I leave, Mrs. Rollins, you may lose your daughter, and that would be the worst mistake you ever made. It's good of you to tell me. Excuse me, I'm going to phone Mr. Joplin. I'm turning down that job. <laughs> We're all going out, Lulu. I've decided, well... Lulu, what's the matter? Don't you want to come with us? Well, perhaps it would be better if I stayed here, Stephanie. What's wrong? Something must be wrong. What is it? Mama! Mama! Stephanie, I'm leaving, dear. What? Did, did you two have a quarrel or something? Oh, no, darling, not that. I have a new job. I just didn't want to tell you about it until after you were confirmed. That's right, Angel. Well, you're just going for a short time, aren't you? No. Why? Why are you leaving? Well, you see, you're getting to be such a big girl now, and I, I should be taking care of smaller children. Is it anything I've, I've done? Oh, no, darling, you mustn't think that. Who are you going to take care of? There's, there's a little girl. I don't want you to go. Oh, don't be selfish, sweetheart. You've had Lulu to yourself for a long, long time. I don't. I want you to go. I really don't know what to do, Stephanie. The people called me last week. They said it was pitiful how this little girl needed someone, and I told them that it was up to you whether I would leave or not. I thought that maybe you'd let me go. But if you want me to stay, then I'll stay. You don't love me. Isn't that the truth? Oh, no, no, darling. It's far from that. But then why Do you, you remember what the bishop said this morning? He said that you're an adult now. You're like mother and me. You're responsible. And if that's true, then aren't we all responsible for people who need help more than we do? Well, I... I suppose if the girl really needs you... She doesn't have a mother like you do, darling. We're both going to miss Lulu very, very much, Deffy. Now come inside, darling. I have something else to tell you. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not even going to... Take... Stephanie... Oh, Stephanie. So just as little Freddie Begley had gone out of Louise's life as Robbie Palfrey had, now Stephanie, too, was only a memory. Except that part of Louise's heart remained with each child. Her next two charges were both boys. There was Dennis Rice and then Tony. Tony Williams. Louise had been with the Williams family only a few months when the war broke out in Europe. And Tony's father, being English, was called back to London. And then some weeks later... Oh, I'm so glad you're back. Oh, Louise, Louise. Why, you've been crying, Mrs. Williams. <laughs> What's wrong? Louise had been with the Williams family only a few months when the war broke out in Europe. And Tony's father, being English, was called back to London. And then, some weeks later... Oh, I'm so glad you're back. Oh, Louise, Louise. Why, you've been crying, Mrs. Williams. What's wrong? I've had bad news. My husband, he, he's, he's been wounded. Oh, is it serious? I don't know. All I know is that I've got to go to him. I wanted to go with him in the first place, remember? Oh, Louise, I've been thinking. Oh, I know, it's a wild notion, but... Well, what is it? I've, I've just been... Well, I was wondering if you'd take care of Tony for me while I went over. As soon as you is all right, I'll be back. Well, I... Oh, I... please. Please say yes. You're the only person I'd trust with Tony. Please say yes, Louise. Well, you're not to worry, anyway. We'll, we'll work something out, Mrs. Williams. Just please don't worry. So Tony's mother went to England. For a while, there was a letter every week and a check every month. But then the letters and the checks became less and less frequent. Through the years, Louise had one friend who'd never changed. The man in the toy shop, Frank Hutchinson. Yes, I hate to admit it, Louise, but that's quite a boy you got there. Quite a boy. Three years old already. Well, what about it? What about what? I want to know why Tony's mother isn't back. First, it was because she'd enlisted in the ambulance corps. Then came word that her husband had been killed. 
That was two years ago, Louise. Two years. Well, you read the last letter I got. She's remarried. That's just what I'm saying. If she's married again, why can't she come back now? Well, they're having such a hard time of it. And after all, she's doing her part and I'm doing mine. Uh, She'll be back as soon as they get on their feet. Little Miss Sacrifice. Oh, now, Frank, stop it. I'm enjoying it. It's the first time in my life I've had a child all to myself. And I like the feeling, as long as it lasts. They'll be back one of these days. They're taking advantage of you, shameful advantage. How can you say that? You don't mention they've stopped sending you money. Who said so? Oh, you can't fool me, Louise. Moving into that tiny flat, skimping on yourself right and left. Look at that dress. Well, I, I've always dressed conservatively. You just never noticed it before, that's all. <laughs> well, do you intend to wait on your customer or not? All right, all right. I know how to run my business. Lulu, Lulu. Do you want a cookie, Tony? You do. All right, darling. Here's another cookie. But Tony's mother didn't come back, and the years rolled by. Tony was ten years old now and quite a baseball player. Every Sunday afternoon, Louise would go to the park and watch him play. How'd you like that, Mom? That's three hits out of four. Boy, are we giving him a shellacking. Well, this is your last inning, Tony, and... Frank's, too. Oh. You're some umpire, Frank, calling those first two pitches strikes. Anything wrong with your eyes? Just myopia, stigmatism, and a tendency to blindness. <laughs> now get out in the field. Yes, sir. So, it's my last inning, is it? You know what I promised, Dr. Berenberg. Just look at you, and at your age. You know, for all the boasting around you do, we might as well be married. <laughs> what a proposal. What an acceptance. Who said I accept it? Now, you listen to me, Lulu. At our stage of life, we're no longer Siegfried and Brunhilde. Just very old friends. But nobody can make soft-boiled eggs the way you do. And I'd be happy to marry you for just that. Furthermore, you can't go on supporting that boy just by doing needlework. He'll be taken in washing next. And I choose to think you prefer me. I think we'd better continue this conversation after dinner. I wouldn't want you hit by a fly ball. Well, I suppose after 30 odd years, I can wait till this evening for a simple answer. Come on, Frank, umpire! And this is your last inning, or we boycott your dinner. I'd just be there on time for a change. Six o'clock, and I don't mean 6.30. When Louise got home, there was an envelope under the door, a cablegram from England. Tony's mother and her husband were coming back. Boy, what a game, huh, Ma? Hey, did you see me drop that fly ball? I can't figure it Tony, out, huh? we're not going to Frank's tonight. You mean we're staying home? Uh, no. We're going away, darling. We're going to pack some of our things, and we're going away. In our moment, we'll continue with Act Three of The Blue Veil. Pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on the Blue Veil, starring Jane Wyman as Louise Mason. So they disappeared, Louise and Tony. The boy's mother started to search for them, which was why one afternoon a detective came by to see Frank Hutchinson. I'm here to see you about Louise Mason. Oh? Where is she? Well, that's what I want to know from you. I'm from the police. I, I have no idea where she is. What do you want to know for? Because Louise Mason may be charged with kidnapping. How silly can you get? That boy's mother abandoned him long since. Louise Mason has devoted eight years to that child. You've seen them together often? Of course I have. You related to Mrs. Mason? No, oh, just friends. For how long? Oh, years and years. You've been no more than friends, huh? Get out of here. Go on, get out of here. You're a disgrace to your badge. All right, all right, don't get excited. Mr. Hutchison, is anything wrong? I'm afraid I've upset the old boy. Didn't mean to. Throw him out. I won't have him in my shop. Mr. Hutchinson! I, I can't 
saying, Mrs. Mason, that my office had quite a time trying to find you. You, uh, you know who I am. Yes. You're the district attorney. Now, you admit having received a cable from Mr. and Mrs. Hall, hmm? Yes. That's when I decided to leave. Where is my boy? What have you done with him? He's all right. You'll see him soon. Now, you didn't mean to kidnap him, did you? You were excited, perhaps not in your right mind when you ran away with the boy. I was never so calm. I've never done anything so deliberate. But Mrs. Mason, believe me, I'm trying to help you. Now, to begin with, Tony is not your son. He's Mrs. Hall's son. She has no right to claim him. Uh, Burgess, bring in the boy, will you? He's happy and content as my son. They've had a life of their own. They can have children. What do they want with mine? His mother's very angry about your disappearance. For a month, she didn't know whether Tony was alive or dead. For five years, she didn't know. And she didn't care. Lulu. Oh, Tony, darling. They wouldn't let me see you. Oh, I know, sweetheart, I know. But why are we here? Oh, we have to answer some questions, dear, but nobody's going to hurt us now. Now, you come and sit down by me. How much does he know? Nothing. Don't you think you were wrong to let him lose all memory of his parents? Do you have to in his presence? Oh, I'm sorry, I really am. But it has to be done. Uh, all right, Burgess, tell the halls to come in. Tony, you know, uh, you have a real mother. Louise took care of you when your mother went away. But now she's back and she wants to have you with her and uh, your new father. I want to stay with Lulu. Yes, I know, Tony, but after a while... Tony. you. Oh, Tony, Tony. Aren't you going to say anything to me? Go and kiss your mother, Tony. And this is your new father. How are you, son? You have no right to call him son, and neither do you. Louise. A son is a person you live with, not a piece of baggage that you check. Look, Mrs. Mason, there's a little matter of kidnapping, and I'm Officer, not... take the boy in the other room. It's all right, Tony. You can come back in a little while. Lulu, Lulu. Mr. Hall... Do you intend to take the boy to Chicago with you? Yes, naturally. Are you going to take Louise Mason with you, too? Certainly not. We were very grateful to her, but when she stooped Never so... Never mind most... that. Oh? Why not? Well, Mr. Hall, I'm not at all clear just who's to be prosecuted. I'm not sure that this isn't a case of child desertion and abandonment. Oh, please. There was no idea of abandonment. When I went to England, I joined a service. I was in uniform. I know all about that. Now, tell me... How much do you figure you owe Mrs. Mason for the care and education of the boy? Well, I, I sent her about $1,400. In eight years. Yeah. That comes to about 50 cents a day for salary, food, board, clothing, doctor bills, and love. I take it you trusted Mrs. Mason to make up the difference. How much did you spend, Louise? Oh, I don't know. I... I don't know anymore. Well, Mr. Hall, how much are you going to give her? Well, I, uh, I've made out a check. Here, I thought this might be fair. I don't want anything. I... Are you going to let them take Tony away from me? As much as I regret to say it, the law doesn't allow that he be left with you. She's never been a mother to him. Giving birth to a child doesn't make a mother. What about the thousand and million things she doesn't know? That she'll never know about him. Louise, please. What does she know about all the things that frighten him? Or how to comfort him when he wakes up in the night crying? And the little things about him. What if he'd never, he'd been neglected? And suppose there hadn't been a savings to see him through. Suppose no one worried about his measles and whooping cough and pneumonia. And what does she know about getting on her knees and praying to God to take her life instead of his? What if there had been no love in all this time? No love. Do you know what that means? Yes, I, I think I do. Uh, Burgess, bring the boy back, please. Mr. Hall, do you still want to press the charges? Well, I, I don't know. My lawyer said... I advise you not to. I further advise you to get out of here right away. Now, there's the boy. Take him and go. Come along, son. Everything's going to be all right. Lulu! Lulu! 
Mrs. Mason. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm very sorry. Have you any relatives? Any old friends? I did have one. I telephoned him yesterday, but the young lady said he had died. It was quite sudden. The district attorney had slipped the hall's check into Louise's purse. For a while, anyway, she'd be able to get along. But Louise couldn't live without children. The employment agencies told her she was too old now for a nursing job. Parents wanted younger women. So she took the only other job she could get and still be near children. She went to work for a private school. You wait for me. I, I'll be back in a minute. Hello, little boy. Did you forget something? Now, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm just the cleaning woman. I, I Was it your book? Or your cap? Hmm? Oh, maybe it was your lunchbox. My glasses. They were in a case. Your glasses. Oh, well, we must find those. I, I don't see so well myself. I, I'm going to have to get glasses one of these days. Here they are. I found them. Oh, well, that's fine. That's fine. Now, what's your name? Jackie. Jackie? Well, my goodness, Jackie, you come <laughs> over here where, where I can see you. Oh, that's better. I, I have to go now. You can talk to me just for a second. Uh, how old are you? Six, going on seven. Six, going on seven. Well, now, when is your birthday? You know, when a little boy has a birthday, he's... I found them! I found my glasses! Hey, Tommy! Louise didn't do anything about getting glasses until one day when she was crossing a busy street and a car almost hit her. The traffic cop told her about the clinic at the city hospital. Nothing radically wrong with your eyes. It's just a condition caused by a deficiency in your diet. Everything in diets these days. I'm prescribing some pills and some eye drops, and uh, you'll feel better if you wear tinted glasses for a while. Now, what's your name, please? Louise Mason. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, just take these prescriptions down to the dispensary. and Oh, uh, about the glasses, uh, tell them to talk to me, to Dr. Palfrey. Dr. Palfrey? That's right, Mrs. Mason. You're not Robert Palfrey? Why, why, yes, I am. Did you have an older brother named Harrison? Yes, I did. He was killed in the war. Did you know him? So, your little Robbie, little Robbie who was afraid of lightning. Why, why... You're a Lulu. Lulu, I... I can't believe it. I, oh, my, my goodness, what are you doing now, Lulu? I, well, I... I just can't get over it. All oh, those days all come back to me now. Oh, I have many pictures of you when you were a little boy. I carried them around with me all the time. You do? Yes. I, I have a little album of all my children. May I... May I see it? Oh, yes. Now, that one was taken the day we went on the picnic with Harrison and Mr. Keene. Mr. Keene. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, this is wonderful. Louise, could I borrow these pictures? I'd like to show them to my wife. Why, certainly. But uh, you mustn't lose them. Oh, oh, no, no, of course not. I, and I don't want to lose track of you either. I'll tell you what. Why don't you have dinner with us some night soon? Oh, I'd like that. You would? Uh, well, let's see now. Uh, how about next Tuesday? Oh, fine. And about these prescriptions, I'm taking you down to the dispensary myself. Oh, why, that's very nice of you, Robbie. Thank you. So on Tuesday night, Dr. Palfrey called for Louise and brought her home. And here she is, Mary. This is Lulu. Oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Mrs. Mason. 
I feel I've known you for years. <laughs> You're very kind, Mrs. Palfrey. Robbie and I were so worried, we thought you might have forgotten about tonight. Oh, my eyes are weak, I suppose, but my memory's fine. Oh, my, this is a very handsome house. Not as elegant as the old place, Lulu, but it's ours. And you have a very beautiful wife. <laughs> You should be proud of yourself. <laughs> he doesn't have time for that, Lulu. I have to be proud for him. Well, now if you'll just open the door, dear. Well. Oh, so many people, Robbie. I, I didn't know you were having company. Don't you recognize anyone? Uh, recognize? Lulu. Stephanie. Oh, Lulu. Lulu. My dear Stephanie. Did you think I could ever forget you? Oh, my goodness. And this young man, this is your husband? No, Louise. I'm Freddy. Fred Begley, Jr. Little Freddy. What a big boy you are. I can't get over it. And uh, Dennis. You, Dennis. Lulu. Little Dennis who hated girls. <laughs> I want you to meet my wife. This is Marjorie. How do you do? She's very pretty. Dennis, Robbie, you did this from all the names in the album. Are you surprised? Oh, my, yes. I... There's someone on the phone who wants to speak to you, Lulu. It's long distance. F for me? Oh, yes. We had quite a time arranging for this. But go on. Go on, talk to him. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I... I can't speak. Uh, where are you, Tony? Oh, oh, that's nice. That's very nice. It's so nice to hear your sweet voice. Uh, you are? D during your Easter vacation? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I am... Uh, I'm very happy, very happy, <laughs> yes. Uh, goodbye, Tony, all of you, all my dear, dear children. And two more, Lulu. But I don't remember these two. Well, these belong to the house, Lulu. This is Andy, and this is Judy. They're yours now. Hello, Andy. Hello, Lulu. Hello, Judy. Hi, Lulu. In a moment, Jane Wyman will return. Here's a story that has sort of a special tug at the heart when you hear it. An American soldier with a camera spotted a cute little Japanese boy playing outside the family home in northern Japan. He asked him to pose, and the boy did. The soldier went his way. One month later, tragedy struck at the household. The little seven-year-old boy was dead of influenza. His father, realizing that there was not even a recent snapshot to remember his son by, remembered the passing serviceman and he asked the United States Army for a copy of the picture. <laughs> Ordinarily, that would seem like a pretty hopeless task, to find among all the Army's picture-taking soldiers the one guy who'd taken that picture. But one man set out to do just that, PFC Stephen Toole of the 19th Infantry Public Information Office. He wrote letters, he broadcast over the radio, searched Army records. Eventually, halfway around the world, he traced Sergeant Leroy McIlvain in a little Kansas town. Yes, the sergeant had been in Japan during that time. Yes, his hobby was photography. Yes, he had pictures of little Japanese boys, some 4,500 of them. <laughs> Painstakingly, he searched through them, and he found the right one, the one that could make a grieving family just a little bit happier. This is a story that that community in northern Japan will not soon forget. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings and Jane Wyman. Janie, you are simply magnificent. We all want to congratulate you. <laughs> and 
Mrs. Dean, congratulations are also in order on your recent marriage to musical director Freddie Carger. We want to wish you both every happiness. Well, that's very nice of you, Irving, and we both thank you. I am amazed at your versatility. No wonder you were invited to place your footprints in the famous concrete blocks in the forecourt of the Chinese theater. They don't look like much alongside of Jimmy Durante's famous nose. <laughs> Al Jolson's hands and knee prints. Well, that's only because you have very small feet. I love to sing their praises. And we love to hear you. Speaking of singing, Janie, reminds me that Warner Brothers just completed their Technicolor production of The Jazz Singer. Yes, and Danny Thomas and Peggy Lee are just wonderful as the stars. And now, Janie, I want to tell our audience about another great picture we have for them next week. It was a gigantic undertaking to film, and the stars undoubtedly gave two of the most hazardous performances of their careers. Because the picture was filmed in deepest Africa on the thrilling search for King Solomon's Mines. And as the stars of this Metro Goldwyn Mayer screen triumph will be the original romantic team of Deborah Carr and Stuart Granger. It was certainly a breathtaking picture, Irving. And good night. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in our cast tonight were Dan Riss as the narrator, William Conrad as Begley, Bill Johnstone as Frank, Gloria Blondell as Annie, Lamont Johnson as Keen, Herb Butterfield as the district attorney, Yvonne Patey as Helen, Tom Brown as Dr. Palfrey, and Norma Varden, Stanley Farrar, Marlene Ames, Peter Votrian, Mickey Little, Eddie Marr, Charlotte Lawrence, Martin Dean, Harry Shearer, Leon Ledoux, Marvin Bryan, Harvey Grant, Lee Norix, and Dave Alpert. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's foremost actors, Mason Adams and Santos Ortega, in The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip. And it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. 
Our story begins in that part of the Caribbean Sea known as the Great Bahama Bank, which lies north of Cuba. In the calm, sparkling sea are two ships, a British destroyer and a small schooner. The schooner is a derelict and barely afloat. There's great activity aboard the destroyer as its longboat returns from the schooner. A few moments later, Chief Petty Officer Warren reports to the captain of the destroyer. Oh, yes, Warren? The schooner's American, sir. The Golden Queen out of Key West. We found one man aboard. He was unconscious. He's in sick bay receiving medical attention. Well, has he regained consciousness yet? No, sir. He's in bad shape. We found him lying in the hold of the schooner. The cabin and rigging were completely gone. As well, evidently, the schooner received the full force of that hurricane ten days ago. Probably the other crew members were swept overboard. Yes, sir. I have a letter which might throw some light on the subject, sir. Is it a letter? Yes, sir. I found it clenched in the unconscious man's hand. Here you are, sir. Let me see. Hmm. Written in pencil. The pages are dry now, but they seem to have been soaked with seawater. Yes, sir. It's a bit difficult to read. Let's see, it begins... Uh, it seems impossible that with the hurricane that is now sweeping over this ship... Anyone will ever read these words that I am writing. The rigging and cabin are gone, and the ship is taking on water. As I lie here in the hold, I feel it can only be a matter of moments until the end. But if by some miracle this ship should survive, I leave this letter as a record of the cruise of the Golden Queen. It all began last December 5th, when four companions and myself sailed out of Key West. All of us, Chuck Riker, Sam Morris, Pete Ross, Harry Martin, and myself, Bill Storm, had been in the Navy together during the war. We had all pooled our savings and bought the schooner Golden Queen. Our destination, Flamingo Cay, some 450 miles to the southeast of Key West. Our objective to recover treasure from an English pirate ship reported sunk by a Spanish man of war at Flamingo Cay in 1632. As we reeled off mile after mile, the days were hot and bright, the nights a dark blue velvet with a sky full of stars, and a good breeze filled a high white spread of sails. As we sailed the same waters that countless treasure ships had sailed only a few centuries ago, there was a growing sense of excitement and anticipation aboard the Golden Queen. At dawn on the sixth day of our trip, our look outside at Flamingo Cay. Hey, there she is. Three points to starboard. Bill, that is Flamingo Cay, isn't it? That's it, all right. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. Now, here, hold one end of this chart down. Sure, Bill. Now, uh, here's Flamingo Cay, and here's Pirate's Lagoon. Pirate's Lagoon. Yeah. According to the log of the Spanish man of war, that's where the English pirate ship headed in, trying to escape the Spanish. Uh-huh. The pirate captain sailed across the entrance to the lagoon, and a hidden reef ripped the ship's bottom wide open. Sank with all hands in less than a minute. And with all its stolen treasure still aboard. Yep. If that 300-year-old log of the Spanish man of war is right, the pirate ship is on the bottom of that lagoon directly ahead. That lagoon is sort of big, isn't it? Yeah, it isn't going to be easy to locate the wreck. Steady as she goes! A few minutes later, the Golden Queen drove through the small opening in the jagged ring of reefs and slid into the calm, smooth water of the lagoon. The anchor chain clanked as the big hook splashed into the water and found bottom. We had arrived at our destination. That afternoon, we lowered a small boat and began the tedious job of rowing back and forth across the lagoon, peering down into the crystal clear water, looking for some indication of the wrecked pirate craft. Our eyes began to ache from the reflected sunlight as we scanned the bottom of the lagoon hour after hour. As one day of searching followed another, our spirits fell. It was on the sixth day that our luck changed. Hey, stop wrong. Bill, look. What? I don't see a thing. Now, keep looking at the bottom where I'm pointing. Well, it just looks like a large mass of coral covered with marine growth. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, but the marine growth, can't you see the muzzle of a cannon sticking through? Hey, you may be right. It does look like the muzzle of a cannon. Do you think that marine-covered mass could be the... Sure, it's the pirate wreck. Sam, I think you found it. Chuck, drop a boy to mark the spot. Right, Bill. Now let's get back to the Golden Queen and get the diving equipment ready. This may be it. An hour later, I was in the diving suit. 
Sam gave the helmet the eighth turn that fastened and locked it. The faceplate was slammed shut, and I could feel the air coming through my lines from the pump. I stepped onto the diving platform, and a moment later was descending into the clear, warm water. Fish of all colors darted about me as I was slowly lowered. My weighted boots struck bottom at 130 feet. Following the beam of light over my helmet, I peered into the wall of water around me. Suddenly, my heart began pounding with excitement. For less than 200 feet away was the large, marine-covered mass of coral. I began to cautiously make my way toward it, keeping a careful eye out for sharks and mores which abounded in these waters. As I made my way closer, I could clearly see that the marine growth covered an old hulk. The ship lay on its side with a huge, gaping hole in the broken hull. Scattered on the floor of the lagoon were ancient barnacle-encrusted cannon, guns, and timbers. Beyond a doubt, it was the wreck of the English pirate ship. I signaled on my line, and Sam sent down the explosives that were to be used to blast the hull. I wasted no time in planting the charges in the hull. It was just as I had finished that I heard his voice. So you've come for Captain Murdoch's treasure, eh? I whirled about clumsily, instinctively, but I was alone. Then I heard it again. They've all come for my treasure. Cutthroats and cut purses, gulls and conies. And they've all left their skins. Again, I whirled about seeking for that voice, but there was nothing, nothing at all. I could feel a scream welling up within me. As the voice spoke again, I gave three sharp tugs on my line. It was the emergency signal. You'll be back, laddie. But remember, it's Captain Murdoch you've got to deal with. Captain Murdoch! Keep the pumps going, Pete, until I get the pace plate open. Okay. Hey, Bill. What was wrong? Why'd you give the emergency signal? He's as white as a sheet. Bill, what happened? Was it an octopus? An octopus? Yeah. Ah, uh, sure, these waters are full of them. You should have taken a saddle and torch down with you. They don't like torches. Yeah. You just take it easy for a while. Bill, did you plant the explosives? Sure. Pete, detonate the explosives. Okay, here it goes. They didn't go off. Bill, you sure you made the connections? I made them all right. Well, they must have gotten loose. We'll just have to try again. What about my going down? No. Why not? Well, because... Because Chuck's only a beginner, and he, he's never gone down that deep. Uh, you got a point there. Well, okay. Means we'll have to wait until tomorrow. Yeah. Bill will go down as soon as it's daylight and plant some more explosives. Right, Bill? Right. Well, that night I lay awake in my bunk, going over and over in my mind the dive I had made and the strange voice I had heard. I kept telling myself that it had been an hallucination. That must be it. Being in pirate waters, the excitement of the search, going down to 130 feet, all had combined to create this hallucination. It was the only possible answer. What other answer could there be? Morning came and I donned the diving suit. Sam handed me an acetylene torch. And a few minutes later, I was descending into the calm green water. I touched bottom only a few feet from the wreck and signaled Sam to send down the explosives. As I waited, I found myself constantly turning in a circle, peering through my faceplate at the well of water which pressed in on me. The explosives were lowered to me and I planted them in the hull. As I finished, I heard that voice once again. I have come back, have you? As he spoke, I could feel cold shivers running through my body. And I fought the impulse to give the emergency signal. Aye, that's the curse of treasure. Once a man kens it, there's no turning back. Ask me, laddie. Captain Murdoch, I'll tell you. Where, where are you? Where am I? <laughs> Ask the fish that stripped me of my flesh and left me bones as a warning to the likes of you. <laughs> Look at you. Quarreling about like a jack and apes to see me. Hey, you fool. Did you think the spirit of a man could be kenned? 
What do you want? For three centuries, I've haunted this accursed wreck, waiting for the likes of you. And now you've come. I've treasure, laddie, such as you've never seen. Rubies and diamonds, pearls and sapphires, silver and gold. The wealth I tore from a dozen Spanish galleons. I'll share it with you, if you agree to my terms. Terms? Aye, laddie. Turns. First, I'll share with you and only you. For the others, a dagger or the plank. A dagger or the plank? Aye. <laughs> Many's the crew that's felt my steel when there's been treasure to share. You mean murder, Sam, shock? And the others? I... Your voice. What you're saying. It's all an hallucination. It must be. I'm just hearing things. I cannot words. What manner of weeping is this? What the steel do the men have done? Stop talking. Stop talking. Do you hear? I won't do it. I won't. You'll do it, laddie. Or you'll ne'er take my treasure. Who's to stop me? A voice? A sheer hallucination? Captain Murdoch, laddie. Captain Murdoch. You're just a voice. You can't stop me. But no, no, no. You're choking me. Stop. You can't see me, laddie. No. But you can feel no. me wrath, can you not? Let go. <sighs> You'll find me a reasonable captain if you follow my orders. But if you don't, laddie, you'll ne'er see the sun again. Now these are my terms. Pay heed to my words. How is he, Sam? Uh, uh, oh, he's, he's just coming to. Uh, uh, All right, take it easy, Bill. Just lie where you are. Uh, what What happened? Well, I signaled you while you were on the bottom, but you didn't answer, so we hauled you up, but fast. We didn't even stop for decompression stages. It made you pass out. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe your airline got snarled on the rack. Maybe. Did you plant the explosives? Yeah. All right. Pete, detonate it. Okay. Hang on to something. That did it. Look at all those pieces of wood and dead fish coming up to the surface. Yeah. That explosion must have ripped the wreck wide open. Ought to be soft pickings from here on in. What do you say, Bill? Yeah, soft pickings. All right, come on, boys. Let's get the diving equipment in A1 shape. Tomorrow's the big day. All that night, I lay awake in my bunk, staring into the darkness, trying not to think of that voice. But there was no escaping it. I could hear his every word over and over, relentlessly pounding into my brain till I could no longer think for myself. As I donned the diving suit shortly after dawn, I could see Sam and the others eyeing me curiously as they helped me on with my equipment. Fifteen minutes later, I was on the bottom, making my way towards the wreck. The stern portion of the hulk had been blown into hundreds of fragments, and the floor of the lagoon was littered with old firearms, metal armor, broken gun flints, and cannonballs. As I picked my way through the debris, he spoke. Come for the treasure, eh, laddie? <laughs> now that you and me are partners, you're welcome to it. And what a treasure it is. Where is it? You'll find four chests buried under that wreckage to your starboard. There? Aye. It took 12 ships and a thousand lives to make up that treasure. Wait till you set eye on the precious stones I plucked from the San Cristo Domingo. Worth the king's ransom. These chests are filled with treasure? Aye. And the well you might gape. Lash that rope around them, laddie. It is heavy they are. They must each weigh at least 500 pounds. Aye. Lash them snugly. It is our fortune you have there, laddie. It will buy the world for us. <laughs> All right, hold still, will you, Bill? I'm trying to get your helmet off. There. Look at it, boy. Poor chest, Bill. Filled to the brim with jewels and gold. Just look at it. Sam, what do you think it's worth? Ah, oh, five million, maybe ten, even twenty. Who knows? 
Look at this diamond, why, it's the size of an egg. There's no telling what it's worth. And some of the other diamonds are almost as big. Boy, we've really hit the jackpot. <laughs> I Bill, what's wrong? You haven't said a thing. I guess I'm tired. Help me out of this suit. Why, sure. Give me a hand, boys. <laughs> this is the guy who did it for us. He sure did. Uh, I don't mind helping you, but this is hardly the <laughs> kind of work for millionaires. <laughs> ah, now you're talking, feet. And boy, just as soon as we get Bill out of this diving suit, we'll weigh anchor for Key West. Swell, no. I got a... What do you mean, no? Let's stick around so that I can make another dive tomorrow. I may have overlooked a couple of chests. Well, that's hardly likely. Oh, you've done enough diving, Bill. I don't mind telling you that you've had us all worried these past couple of days. Yeah. You've been acting kind of strange. Ah, uh, that's wrong with him that a million bucks won't cure. <laughs> Sun's already setting. We'll leave tomorrow. Okay. I guess another night here can't make much difference. We'll weigh anchor at dawn. Now let's get these four chests below. That night I lay in my bunk, waiting, watching. It was first Sam, then Pete, then Harry fell asleep. I slipped quietly out of my bunk, crossed the cabin, and stepped out on deck. A full moon shone down on the Golden Queen, and I could see Chuck, who was on watch, standing near the wheel, smoking. As I approached, he turned and saw me. Hello, Bill. Couldn't sleep, huh? No. What about the others? They're sleeping. Don't see how they can do it. I'm so excited, I couldn't. All I can think of is the treasure and what I'm going to do with my share. Yeah. Say, what's the matter with you? Don't sound very enthused. I guess I'm just tired. Those dives you made must have taken a lot out of you. Yeah, they did. It, is that a ship out there? Where? There, three points to starboard. I'm looking, but I don't see any. I caught him as he dropped, and I carefully eased his body over the rail and let go. He hit the water with only a small splash and was gone. When dawn came, the others had followed. I was alone on the Golden Queen. Alone? No, that isn't quite correct. He was aboard. I couldn't see him, but he was with me all right. With his assistance, I weighed anchor. A half hour later, using the auxiliary engine, the Golden Queen slipped through the opening in the lagoon and out to sea. For a day and a night, I stood at the wheel, and when I was exhausted, he took over. It was on the fourth day that the hurricane caught me. Within the first hour, it swept the rigging and cabin overboard and left me helpless. Mountainous waves, one after another, are breaking, breaking over, over the over Golden, the Golden Queen, Queen. And only, and only a, miracle a miracle can save me. If I go down, as surely I must, at least he'll go with me. I realize now, too late, that... Huh. The letter ends at this point. What do you, Mikevitsi? Make of it? Well, it's obviously the letter of an insane mind. Bill Storm, the unconscious man that you found aboard the derelict, became demented when his four companions were swept overboard during the hurricane. And, as a result, wrote this <laughs> fantastic letter. Uh, sir, while searching through Storm's pockets for the identification, I found these. Huh? Oh. Three coins. Yes, sir. If you scrape the brown crust off him, You'll see their gold pieces. As you look here, these coins are hundreds of years old. Yes, sir. Well, then that part of the letter about recovering sunken treasure might possibly have been true. Did you find any chests aboard the derelict? No, sir. It was swept as clean as a whistle. Hmm. Well, perhaps it wasn't only the loss of his four companions, but the loss of the treasure as well that sent Storm out of his mind. Yes. Sir, do you... Do you think there might have been anything to do with this Captain Murdoch he mentions in the letter? Certainly not. Don't be ridiculous. I'm amazed at you, Warren. Next, you'll be telling me that you believe in ghosts. Oh, sorry, sir. Come along to the sick bay. We'll see if Storm has regained consciousness yet. Uh, uh, this spell of Storm, he seems to be regaining uh, consciousness, sir. Uh, He's opening uh, his eyes. Can't make out where he is. All right now, Storm. Just lie uh, quietly. Uh, Don't uh, try to speak. Uh, You're quite uh, safe now. You're aboard a British destroyer. Uh, 
The doctor says you're going to be all right. Well, He's uh, trying to say something, sir. No, no, don't try to speak, Storm. Just lie quietly and take your treasure. Uh, what was that? He was asking you, sir, about the treasure. Oh, yes, the treasure. Well, I'll, I'll get to that storm in just a moment. But the main thing to remember is that it's a miracle that you survived. You know, I read that fantastic letter you wrote, and I can only attribute it to the shock and grief of losing your shipmates in the hurricane. Never read such utter claptrap, pirate ghosts and deeds. As for the treasure, I'm sorry to say that the hurricane swept your schooner clean. All that Chief Warren found were these three gold coins. The rest, I'm afraid, is gone. Gone? Yes, my good man, swept overboard. Swept overboard? Why, you, 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 snarling, perfumed, white-bellied girl. Do you think the likes of you can keep my treasure from me? Ask the others that tried it. Black Irish, Billy Bones, the Frenchman, Captain Bull. They felt my steel and left their bones to bleach in the sun. Bring me my chest or I'll rip your tongue out and hang you to the highest yardarm. As sure as my name is Captain Murdoch. My good man, go with me. You're out of your mind. Warren, help! Kill Captain Murdoch's treasure, would you? Let's see out of the I world, laddie boy. Grip, as I did the other. Help! You'll never keep Murdoch's treasure. <laughs> no you struggling, laddie. You're done for. <laughs> the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? Or was the captain of the British destroyer choked to death? Oh, no, he was saved. But he's never been the same since. As for poor old Bill Storm, well, he's now safely under lock and key. He still speaks in 17th century English and insists he's Captain Murdoch. And now and then, he buttonholes one of his attendants and whispers of fabulous loot to be won on the high seas through piracy. But so far, he's been unable to muster up a crew. Uh, that reminds me of next week's story, uh, The Accusing Corpse. It's about a murderer who discovered that the dead sometimes arise from the grave to... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of The Mysterious Traveler is played by Maurice Tarplin. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Little Boy Blue, starring Jeannie Crane and Patrick McGeehan. Wallace Ford is your host. More things are rocked by prayer than this world dreams of. As your host this evening, I want to welcome you to Family Theater. All of our new listeners, and I want to say thank you to all of the old friends and whose loyalty and enthusiasm for the program and its purpose have been expressed in so many ways. Your letters giving suggestions and ideals and experiences of happy family life have been a great encouragement to all in Hollywood associated with the program. We'd like to hear from you because Family Theater is your program. 
was made possible by all those in the radio audience who wanted a program like Family Theater to express the fundamental things we deeply believe in. It was made possible by the executives and the performers and the technical people in pictures and radio who believe, as you do, that a nation of happy homes is the most wonderful, the most important thing for our nation and for every nation. Yes, we want to keep our families, your family and my family, together and happy. And we sincerely believe that family prayer, prayers asking God for his help and prayers acknowledging that help, will keep our families in close understanding and harmony. You'll find this true. Family prayer is the key to the kind of home you want to have. Family prayer is the key to a happy home. He wrote these words. God, in his providence, obscures the gold beyond this veil of sorrow and smiles at men in pity when they seek to penetrate the morrow. With faith that all is for the best, let's bear what burdens are presented that we shall say, let come what may, we die as we have lived, contented. St. Joseph, Missouri, in the 70s. Along the boardwalk of the main street, a young man with hat on the back of his head and necktie streaming away from his high collar half runs, half walks through the late afternoon crowd. Excuse me. Excuse me, please. Well, really? Oh, excuse me. Gene, Gene Field, when did you get back? No time to talk now, Josh. Hey, Gene, wait up a minute. Excuse me, please. Yes? Well, Mr. Field, I thought you were in Europe. I was. Yeah, I, I was in Europe. Uh, t tell me, tell me something. Has your father left yet? Well, I, I think he was just going out the side door. Out the side door? Thanks, I'll try to catch him. Of oh, all oh, 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 the confounded... Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I... Oh, oh Mr. Comstock. Field, I might have known. I, oh, let me help you up, sir. I was hurrying to see you. I just got back from Europe. Uh, and did you knock people down like that all the way? Oh, yes. Sir. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. I... Sir, I've talked to Julie. Uh, I assumed. And I've got to talk to you, Mr. Comstock. Uh... We want to get married. So you informed me two years ago. And what was my answer? Well, you said we'd have to wait two years till Julie was 20. Correct. And what else did I say? You said I should be established in business. Well? Well, I've decided that the most important business I have to attend to is marrying Julie. Indeed. Young man, don't you realize Julie is still a girl? Ah, well, she'll outgrow that, sir. Uh, I'd be a fool to give my consent. Well... Are you implying that I am a fool? Oh, no, no, sir, no. Well, as a matter of fact, I am. Always have been where Julie's concerned. Field, if you make that girl unhappy, I'll take it out of your hide. Julie. Yes, Jean? He said yes, Julie. Oh, Jean. We'll be married next week. And a honeymoon in St. Louis? St. Louis? New York, Julie. Nothing but biggest and the best for the wife of Eugene Field. That's the uh, new elevated railroad, Julie. Just one of the sites in New York. You mean it, it runs way up there above the street? That's right. Oh, it's fabulous, Jean. Unbelievably so. You're beautiful, Mrs. Field. Unbelievably so. <laughs> Waiter. Oh, oh, waiter. Oui, monsieur. Uh, pig's feet a la St. Joe for two, please. Pig's feet a la St. Joe, monsieur? That's what I said, sir. Surely an establishment far famed as the Waldorf Astoria would wish to make two honeymooners in St. Joe's, Missouri, <laughs> feel at home. <laughs> oh, Jean. And tonight, Julie, we see Frufu. 
Frou-frou. A musical comedy at the Fifth Avenue Theater. Oh, I didn't think there could be another theater in New York. Well, I, I guess this is the last. Be happy, Julie. I'm with you, Jean. <laughs> A trip to Europe, a wedding, a honeymoon in New York. Undoubtedly a costly one. And now I'm home, Mr. Gray. Yes, and I presume broke again. You came to ask for another advance from your father's estate. Is that correct, Jean? Uh, well, I came primarily to see you, Mr. Gray, but, well, I won't deny that some money would be welcome. Mm -hmm. Eugene, I think it's about time you and I had a serious talk. The estate your father left in my trust is not endless, you know. Oh, I know. Now, mind you, I'm not accusing you of squandering. I consider the trip to Europe a reasonable part of your education. Your marriage, and I suppose even an expensive honeymoon in New York, can be justified. But you've got to settle down. Well, I... Yes, I, I suppose you're right, sir. You've got to think of a career. And I consider it my duty to force you to think of a career. Therefore... Uh, therefore, no money. No money. I deserve that, sir. You're absolutely right. Hmm. And I'm resolved right now to launch on a career, on the variety stage. See, now, see here, you're not going to talk about going on the stage again. Oh, but I am. I forbid it. But you said I had to have a career. My friends consider me entertaining. Gene Field, you can't do this. A cheap entertainer. Think of the family name. Oh, I have, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't think of using my own name, of course. Well, at least you show that much sense. So I've decided to use your name. Yep. Melville L. Gray, banjo and specialty artist. Gene Field, you, you, you wouldn't dare. You wouldn't have the audacity to do... Yes, sir. Oh, this is another one of your preposterous jokes. Needing money is no joke, I assure you. <sighs> Very well. Very well, you'll get your money again. But I tell you, this is the last time. Positively the last time. Mr. Gray, you're one of the most understanding men I've ever known. Someday I'm going to name one of my children after you. Oh, you get out of here. Take this check and get out before I change my mind. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Thank you again. And uh, Julie would want me to thank you. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. What now? I'm editor of the St. Joseph Gazette. You're what? I've got a job as editor of the St. Joseph Gazette. I start tomorrow. You mean to tell me all this time you've had a job, you deliberately... Gene feels you're impossible. Thanks for the check, Mr. Gray. Thanks, indeed. If it weren't your own money, it would be robbery. I tell you, if that wife of yours survives even a year of married life with you, I'll be amazed. Gene, your first pay envelope. Uh-huh. Open it up. Not even a dime out for a haircut. But the envelope, wait, it's made out to me. Oh, that's just, uh, just an error, I guess. Oh, thank you for a nice error, Jean. A valentine. What, a poem? Oh, Jean. In all these months we've been married, you've thought of me as just a newspaper man. You didn't know I was going to win fame and fortune as a poet, did you? Oh, it's a beautiful poem, Jean. Of course. It was written for a beautiful woman. What in heaven's name makes you so quiet, Jean? Working on a poem, of course. It's entitled, To the New Baby. The New Baby. Our baby. Oh, it, it's so wonderful. I'm almost frightened. Wait a minute. Frightened? Never be frightened of the future, Julie. We'll make a wonderful family. Something else, Julie. What, darling? A while after the baby comes, uh, I might make a trip down to St. Louis. I've heard tell they need a good man on the paper down there, and they might even be interested in someone like me. Oh, gee. <laughs> Well, here you are, Jean. Thanks for the lift from the station. I can't wait to tell Julie the good news. Oh, don't blame you. Getting a good job in a big town like St. Louis? Well, see you later. Thanks. Uh, give my regards to the family. Julie! Julie, I'm back. Julie, I... Hello, Jean. Well, Mr. Gray. Uh, Mr. Comstock. Jean, this is Dr. Mason. Doctor? Julie, what's happened to Julie? Not Julie, Jean. I'm sorry, Mr. Field. The disease struck suddenly. I 
I did all that could be done for him. The boy. We tried to send for you in St. Louis. We, we couldn't find you. Where's my wife? I want to see Julie. Julie. Jean. Oh, Jean. Julie, my beloved. Oh, we tried so hard to find you. I shouldn't have gone. I shouldn't have left oh. you. Oh, don't say that. Oh, Jean. Now I don't know why I've been frightened. But it was so awful knowing I was powerless. Knowing there was... Please forgive me. Cry, Julie. <laughs> why don't you cry? <laughs> we were too happy, Julie. I've been a fool to think that happiness can be of our own making. I've been too much of a coward to accept reality. What? Jean, what are you saying? I... I don't know, Julie. I don't think you do. I'm not afraid of the future, Jean. Are you? With God standing by us? I'm not afraid of the future, Julie. The St. Louis Journal, Eugene Field, editorial writer. Kansas City Times, Eugene Field, managing editor, announces the birth of a daughter. The Denver Tribune, Eugene Field, managing editor and columnist, celebrates the arrival of a son. Eugene Field. Oh, hello, Julie. What's the matter? Eugene Field, I want an explanation of this. Oh, I noticed you called me Eugene. What have I done now? We came out here to Manitou for a restful weekend. Is that right? That's right. To get a few days' vacation from the children. Uh huh. And for the meeting of the Denver Press Club. Then would you please explain this poster? That? Well, it's self explanatory, isn't it? Tonight, Monster Benefit Show. Manitou Hotel Main Dining Room. Come one, come all. Admission 50 cents. <laughs> Isn't that clear enough? Oh, it's all too clear. Putting posters all over town announcing a show when you know very well there isn't any show is bad enough. But to suggest you might charge admission. But how else can you raise money if you don't charge admission? It's for a worthy charity. Oh, yes. What charity? Well, uh... Uh, the children need new shoes, and they could use some new toys. Oh, Jean, and... you wouldn't have the nerve to do a thing like that. Why, people might really come. Of course. But there isn't any show where they can't just sit there. Julie, darling, I'm surprised at you. They won't just sit there. If the people of Manitou will provide an audience, heaven will provide the entertainment. Oh, Jean, please. I'm serious. So am I, precious. And by the way, here's your free pass to the show. I'll probably be busy at the box office tonight taking in the money. I can't believe it, Carrie. He's really done it. Yes, and quite a turnout, too. Looks like the whole town's oh, here. Oh, what's he going to do, Carrie? Taking money from these miners. Well, they might not like it. Yes, I know. Oh, hello, Evans. Evening, Carrie. Hello, Mrs. Field. Evans. Is there... Have, have any entertainers? No, Mrs. Field. No entertainers. There's nobody backstage at all. Well, I hope Jean hasn't carried this joke too far. The crowd's getting a little impatient. Wait a minute. There he is getting up on the platform now. Say, he's going to the piano. Oh, no. He's not going to try to play himself. But he is. Oh, this is awful. This is simply awful. Julie, how was it? Oh, Jean. Oh, I couldn't have been that bad. It was a miracle they liked you. Getting up there and entertaining for two hours, all by yourself. Was it really two hours? It was. Oh, but that's not what I want to talk about. Uh-huh. Jean, please listen to me, because I mean it. I insist that you return every cent of that money. After working that hard? Oh, really? No, Julie. Jean, please listen to me. I'm not laughing. I don't think this was a funny joke. You really mean that, don't you? I do. Well, I guess you're right. I don't exactly know how I'll get in touch with all those people again, but hey, excuse me, dear, the door. Oh, come in, Mrs. Arsati. Mr. Field, I, I can't... 
<laughs> Mr. Field, that was the most wonderful thing anyone has ever done for me. Oh, Mrs. Orsatti, my wife, Julie. Mrs. Orsatti, what? You see, I... Mrs. Orsatti's husband was killed in the mines the other day. She had several children. Uh, of course, if you insist on some. Oh, no. Money, no, Jean. There's a little more than $200 in this envelope, Mrs. Osati. A gift from the people of Manitou. Oh, thank you, thank you. I don't know how i The I'll people ever... of Manitou don't expect any thanks, Mrs. Osati. Now you go along to those kids of yours, huh? You have an angel for a husband, Mrs. Field. Thank you. An angel, Jean Field. You're a devil. But she needed the money, Julie. I had to. And you let me think you were going to use that money for... All I said was that the children needed shoes, and, and they do. I told you the money was for a worthy charity. You didn't really doubt me, did you? Oh, of course I doubted you. You don't know how many times I've doubted you. Really? But I won't anymore. I can promise you that. I'll never waste another second of my time doubting you again. <laughs> No, I won't. No, sir, it's mine. You already had three gooseberry tarts. I didn't either. I only had two and a little old smidgy. Why, Junior Field, I saw you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute here. Mother, I was under the impression there were knives out in the kitchen. Well, there were last time I looked. Uh Uh-huh. Then it seems to me this last tart could be cut in four pieces. That is, unless you all want me to do. Oh, Oh, no! (laughs) I thought so. Melville... Suppose you go get the knife. Yeah, and I get to cut it. You don't either. I'm the oldest. Wait a minute. Mel? Huh? Say, that's a beauty of a shiner. Come closer. Let me look. Oh, it don't hurt. Doesn't. All right, doesn't. Say, did you see this, Mother? Yes, I saw it. Don't tell me you got in a fight, Mel. Nope. Freddy just left his old rag dog on the stairs again. I only fell from the first landing. Yes, and Freddy's always doing that, too, Father. I think you should speak to him. Mm, maybe I should. Remind me to speak to you, Freddy. Uh-huh. How would you fix my soldier? He's busted. He's broken, Freddy. Uh-huh. And he's busted, too. Hey, when are we going to get the knife and cut this tart? I'm awful hungry. <laughs> Very nice, Mary. Bravo. Your music's coming along fine. Now this is the life, Mother. Concert after dinner. Well, I got another new piece I can play, well, too. Well, uh, don't you think we'd better let Freddie play his piece for Daddy, dear? Oh, has Freddie got a piece, too? Uh-huh. Oh, he only plays with one finger. Well, just the same. I think we should hear it. Oh, gosh. We've been hearing it all day. But, Penny, darling, not at a concert like this. Come on, Freddie. All right. Oh, gee. Red all by blue, come blow your horn. The sheep's in the meadow, the cows in the corn. Where is the boy that looks after the... Oh. Oh. That is all in bed, Julie? At last. Tired? A little. You working? Well, I've got pen and paper out. No idea yet, though. Slayson Thompson wants me to do a poem for the first issue of his new magazine, The American... Oh. Well, that's nice. I won't bother you then. Oh, no. Wait, Julie. Don't go just yet. What? I just want to say that's a wonderful family of yours. Ours, Jean? Uh Grave Alice and Laughing Allegra. Edith with the golden hair. What's that? Children's Hour, Longfellow. About his family, I guess. But it might be about ours. How do you mean? I was noticing tonight, grave Freddy, laughing Mel, and Penny, with an appetite like a mule. (laughs) Oh, to say nothing of our 11-year-old grown-up Mary. Oh, it's strange, isn't it? How they're each different, one from the other. Like snowflakes. They all look the same until you get them under a microscope. Jean. Yes, dear? I wonder what... The other one, what it been like? Yes, Julie. I've often wondered about him, too. He would have been 
14 in three months now. Almost a young man. On the football team, probably. Having his first sweetheart. And different from all the rest. Yes. Well, this isn't getting your work done. I suppose not. I'll go then. Please don't stay up too late. Good night, dear. Good night, Blue Eyes. <sighs> Let's see. Idea. Idea. Jean, I wonder what the other one would have been like. Toy soldiers busted. Broken. Busted, too. <laughs> a poem about... Almost a young man having his first sweetheart. Freddy just left his old rag dog on the stairs again. Little boy blue, come blow your horn. Little boy blue. Little boy blue... Little boy blue. Yes. <clears throat> little boy blue. The little toy dog is covered with dust. But sturdy and staunch he stands. <laughs> Hot breakfast. Oh, this is going to be so really hot. Oatmeal. Oatmeal, Hot oatmeal for everybody. Hey, Penny, what'd you do with my skate key? Well, if you take better care of it, you wouldn't be losing it all at time. All right, all right. At the table, everybody. Come on, Freddy. It's your turn to say grace. Uh huh. On to God for health and food, and all that in our lives is good. We give our hearts in gratitude. Well, well, all the happy faces here. Oh, Good morning, Blue Eyes. You'd better have a poem for us after working all night. Oh, I have, Julie, I have. Oh, have you, Daddy? Will you say it for us? Not quite, everybody. Daddy's got a poem. Yeah, yes. everybody quiet. All right, all right. And, Julie, I want you especially to listen. I think you'll know what it means. Well, has it got a name, Daddy? Uh-huh. I call it Little Boy Blue. Here it is. <clears throat> the Little Toy Dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands. The little toy soldier is red with rust, and his musket molds in his hands. Time was when the little toy dog was new, and the soldier was passing fair, and that was the time when our little boy Blue kissed them and put them there. Now don't you go till I come, he said. And don't you make any noise. So, toddling off to his trundle bed, he dreamt of the pretty toys. And as he was dreaming, an angel song awakened our little boy Blue. Oh, the years are many, the years are long, but the little toy friends are true. Eh? Faithful to little boy Blue they stand. Each in the same old place, awaiting the touch of a little hand, the smile of a little face. And they wonder, as waiting the long years through, in the dust of that little chair, what has become of our little boy Blue since he kissed them and put them there. Well, Julie, what do you think? I love you, Jean Field. And so through the many years he lived with his friends, his children, and his beloved wife, Julia. And when, at last, the many years were through, his own words went echoing on. That we shall say... Let come what may, we die as we have lived, contented. You know, 
While I was listening to tonight's program, I got to thinking of the past and the way our parents and grandparents lived a generation or two ago. Today you hear people worrying about the age in which we live. They say it's complicated and confusing. You read in the newspapers about juvenile and parental delinquency, broken homes and neglected children, and you get to worrying about your own family. You don't want anything like that to happen in your home. Well, it's good to remember there are millions of us who feel the same way about our homes as you do. It's encouraging to remember that in every day and age, the same fundamental things are true. There are the same hopes and joys, the same disappointments. It's always true that good people make good homes. No matter how complicated and confusing life may be, it's equally true that prayer, family prayer, will bring happiness and peace. Yes, and strength and courage to you and to your family. God's wonderful help can be had for the asking. So pray together as a family, tonight and every night. Because a family that prays together stays together. Before saying good night, I'd like to thank Jeannie Crane for her performance as Julia and Pat McGeehan for his portrayal of Eugene Field. Special word of thanks also to Everett Tomlinson for writing tonight's play and to Max Tear for his music. Mel Williamson directed and John Ryder produced the program. Others who appeared in our play tonight were Ruth Peterson, Ralph Moody, Alan Harris, Frank Nelson, Joel Davis, Don Bender, Bill Blackburn, and Robert Ellis. Next week, our family theater star will be MacDonald Carey in A Point of Law. Your host will be Cesar Romero. And this is Wallace Ford saying good night and God bless. <laughs> This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by the actors and technicians in the motion picture and radio industries. This program is heard overseas through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Services. Tony Loprano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. which was overshadowed by the suspicion of murder. It's the quandary of a young man who suspects that the lovely young widow of his brother may be a diabolical poisoner. And as our stars, we have popular Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire creating two unusual roles in this suspenseful motion picture from 20th Century Fox. But for a moment, let's listen to Ken Coffin. They say it's springtime that will turn a young man's fancy to uh, thoughts of you-know-what. But I know that a really feminine-looking gal can turn a man's fancy and his head any time of the year. And there's nothing more feminine than sheer, lovely nylon stockings. And, of course, no care but Lux Flakes care for them. 
96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. It pays you to follow their advice because Lux Flakes care can actually double the wear you get from every pair. So always give your nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. And uh, when you're picking up Lux Flakes at the market, be sure to get the new Lux, too, Lux Liquid Detergent. It's made just for the dish's job. Even though the carpenters have been using Lux Liquid for months now, I still can't get over how quickly it floats grease off plates and glasses. And so little will do so much. Just a teaspoonful does a dishpan full. While it's rough on grease, Lux Liquid is gentle on your hands. Every bit as mild as you'd expect a Lux product to be. The can it comes in is special, too. It has a wonderful new dripless spout that makes it almost impossible for anyone, including me, to mess up the sides of the can. Yes, Lux Liquid is the next best thing to a dishwashing machine. As good for dishes as Lux Flakes are for nylons. If you don't agree, both are all we say. Lever Brothers will give you back whatever you paid for them. Now, act one of A Blueprint for Murder, starring Dan Daly as Cam and Dorothy McGuire as Lynn Cameron. The telegram was waiting for me in New Orleans. The telegram from Lynn. I took the next plane back and rushed to the hospital. Late that afternoon, the doctor was able to give us some real encouragement. And so I think our worries are over, Mr. Cameron. But she was a mighty sick little girl. You still don't know what was wrong? Not for sure. The tetany test was negative. Tetany? Those muscular spasms she was having, they're quite characteristic. Well, I'm sure she'll have quite a comfortable night. I understand you're the child's uncle, is that right? Yes, her father's dead, and my brother. I'm very attached to both children and their stepmother. Well, Mrs. Cameron's had quite an ordeal. Why not uh, take her home? We uh, will have a special nurse on duty, and if anything at all yes. comes up, I'll, I'll try and get it leave now. Oh, I wouldn't think of leaving here if it weren't for Doug. Oh, poor little boy. He doesn't know what to make of all this. I'll phone him and tell him I'm coming. There's a booth down the corridor. Cam, now that you're here, how about spending a few days with us? I'd really like to, then, but I should get back tomorrow. We're opening a new field in Venezuela. <laughs> You're always roaming all over the world. Did it ever occur to you that we might like to see you once in a while? It's so important to the children, especially Doug. He never quite got over Bill's death, and he's so fond of you. Let me see what I can do. Maybe I can stay over a few days. Oh, I wish you would. Well, here's your phone booth. I'll look up a public stenographer. I got some letters and a couple of telegrams. You know, I'll meet you at the house. Wonderful. We'll expect you for dinner. And Cam, thanks for everything. Gosh, Lynn, do I have to go to bed? Can't we play just one more game? It's way past your bedtime, Doug, and tomorrow's school. But Uncle Cam's only going to be here for a few days. And we're going to have fun for those few days, too. How about the ice show tomorrow? Oh, boy. Gee, I wish Polly could go, too. It was awful last night, Uncle Kim. The way she kept yelling, don't touch my feet. Yes, uh, I know, but I think we should try and get that out of our minds, Doug. Dad was just like that when he died. Just like that? Well, I'm afraid Doug's letting his imagination run away with him. But he was. All stiff and funny, too. Just, just the same as Polly. Is that right? Well, there was some similarity, I suppose. But the doctors all agreed that Bill had virus encephalitis. Anyway, there must be a lot of things with the same symptoms. Yes, I suppose so. Have you told Uncle Cam about your baseball team, Doug? Boy, have we got a team. I knocked two home runs last week. Uh, we were up in Boston, Slugger. We could see the Red Sox play. Say, how about letting Doug spend the summer with me? Oh, please, Lynn, please. Well, why not? Sounds wonderful. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, let's see. I've still got the sailboat out in the Cape. I know that they care of the weekends, and during the week... We... Lynn took us up to Lake George last summer, and I learned a lot about boats, Uncle Ken. Seems to me Lynn's been mighty good to you. She sure has. Well, good night, Uncle Cam. Good night, Doug. Good night, Lynn. Sleep well, dear. And just call if there's anything you want. I will. See you in the morning, Uncle Cam. You've been wonderful. 
The way you're bringing up those kids. They're nice kids. It hasn't been hard. When their mother died, I thought no one would ever be able to take her place. They really love you, Lynn. I don't see how they can help it. I always thought Bill was a lucky man, and now I'm beginning to realize this how... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes, we'll be right there. Cam, that was Dr. Stevenson at the hospital. Holly? He told us to come right over. She's had a relapse. When did you hit town? Hello, Fred. Well, come in. Hey, Maggie, look who's here. Oh, this is wonderful. We haven't seen you in ages. Had your breakfast? Fred, uh, I've got bad news. I wouldn't be here at this hour except... It's Polly, Fred. Polly's dead. Dead? Cam? Well, of all the wonderful surprises. Take it easy, honey. Some terrible news. Little Polly Cameron. She's dead. She's what? I just can't believe it. Accident? No, no. She took sick. When, Cam? When? Early this morning at the hospital. Oh, what a tragedy. And Lynn and poor little Doug, how's he taking it? Well, they're both under sedatives. Your breakfast, please go ahead. You'll have some coffee anyway. I'll get another cup. I've no right to barge in like this, and I should have phoned you first. That's a fine way to talk to an old friend. Fred, you're still handling the estate, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course. Cam, what was wrong with Polly? Well, the doctor seemed rather uncertain. He doesn't know? Sometimes it's hard to tell, I suppose, but there's one thing about it that bothers me. Well? Apparently, Polly had the same sort of convulsions that Bill had before he died. Cam, are you sure of that? I'm not sure of anything. I, I only know that Polly kept screaming, don't touch my feet. That's, that's very curious. I don't see anything curious about it at all. It's, it's just that I'm afraid there might be something hereditary in all this and that it could hit Doug, too. Cam, you weren't here when Bill died, were you? No. Well, what did the doctors tell you he died from? Virus encephalitis. It was sort of a sleeping sickness. Yet in Polly's case, they don't know? Somehow back in my mind, that don't touch my feet rings a bell. Maggie, please. She still writes for those pulp magazines. You know what an imagination she has. This has nothing to do with imagination. This was research I did at a medical library a couple of years ago. I had an idea for a story. And That's I... what I thought, a story. Well, maybe you're right. Forget it. Well, if there's something on your mind, say it. Well, I was looking up a murder case. The victim also had convulsions and kept screaming, Don't touch my hand. So? He died of strychnine poisoning. Oh, Maggie, for heaven's sake, how can you even suggest such a thing? I only mean there's a, well, a similarity. You know nothing about what's happened, nothing. Maggie, don't you think the doctors would have recognized strychnine? Oh, I don't know. They didn't in the case I looked up, and they apparently don't know what killed Polly. Let's see what the encyclopedia says about convulsions. Why do you always have to dramatize everything? You're really going off the deep end, Maggie. Well, look it up if you want to. She sees a man take a pocket knife to sharpen a pencil, and right away she starts building up a murder case. Well, tell both of you jump on me. I only mentioned it as something that should be looked into. Anyway, here it is in the encyclopedia. Let me see it. Well, they, they list eight causes. Tetanus. Only tetanus would have required a cut. Obviously, it wasn't rabies. Epilepsy? There's no history of it in the family. With all these others, like a brain tumor, there would have been earlier indications. All except one. Well? Read it. Poisons, especially the alkaloids such as strychnine. That doesn't prove anything. No, of course not. I'd like to use your phone. I'd like to call Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> We, well, we thought of the possibility of strychnine, Doctor. You're serious about this, Mrs. Sergeant? I don't mean to be rude, Doctor, but you do admit you don't know what that child died from. Is this your idea, too, Mr. Cameron? I haven't any ideas, Doctor. But you told me it wasn't tetany, and yet that's what you put on the death certificate. Because that's what we were treating the patient for. She responded to the calcium, so we continued it. As a matter of fact, I suggested an autopsy. Oh? Lynn couldn't stand the idea. I agreed nothing could be gained by it. Mrs. Sergeant, just how do you think the child got the poison? I don't know, of course, but I don't see how it could have been accidental. I hope you realize what you're saying. 
Meanwhile, Mr. Cameron, I'm afraid I don't want any part of all this. I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. Come on, Cam, let's go. Thank you for seeing us. You're quite welcome, Mr. Cameron. Who could have done it, Maggie? Who? Oh, several people. For instance? For instance, Lynn. Good day, Dr. Stevenson. Maggie, what's got into you making a crazy crack like that about Lynn? Now, doggone it, I'm getting mad. I only said it was possible she could have done it. And it is. You've got her all wrong. She certainly made Bill a good wife. He was very happy with her. Do you plan to stay on? Till the end of the week. For three or four days, huh? Can I drive you anywhere? No, no thanks. Think it over, Cam. It sounds ridiculous, I know. But is it? Say hello to Fred. I'll, I'll see you both in a day or two. I was with Lynn most of the next few days. More and more, I realized what a wonderful person she was. Her warmth and affection for Doug helped so much to soften the blow of his sister's death. Never did Maggie's suspicions seem more fantastic than now. Must you really leave tomorrow, Cam? I've stretched it as long as I could, Lynn. But I'll be back as soon as I can. You can rely on that. I don't know what I would have done without... Yes, Anna? It's the phone, ma'am, for Mr. Cameron. It's Mr. Sargent. Tell him I'll call him back later, Anna. No, no, no. Go on. I'll run upstairs and see if Doug's asleep. I'll take it in the study, Anna. Yes, sir. Am I just wanted to know if you're still leaving in the morning. Yes, of course. Why? Well, I... I hesitate to talk about it on the phone. It's about your brother Bill's estate. Well? Under the terms of his will, Lynn shares in trust. She receives only the interest unless... Well, unless what? Unless what? Unless both children were to die. Both Polly and Doug. Fred, what the devil are you trying to say? Well, it could provide a motive. I'm amazed at you. I know how all this must sound, Cam, but I think you ought to stay over another day so we can talk it over. All right. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, no, no. Fred just called to say goodbye. Oh, I hate that word. I told him he was being premature, and I've decided to stay a day or two longer. That is, if it's all right with you. You know it is. Was Doug all right? Oh, yes, thank goodness. I'm worried about him. He doesn't look at all well. It's been the same for him as for the rest of us. Mm. Such a terrible shock. No, but Doug hasn't been looking well for weeks. I'm thinking of taking him out of school camp, maybe a trip to Europe. Why? Well, he needs a change. Everything here only reminds him of his father and Polly. And it would be good for me, too. How long would you be away? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a year or so. That long? Hmm. Might be very good for him. Visiting all the little out-of-the-way places and just taking it easy. I'm not worried about his schoolwork. He's such a bright boy. We could take some sort of study schedule with us. And that way... point in getting excited about it, Cam. We're just talking about it among ourselves. But I can't close my eyes to the fact that Lynn did have a movie. I don't care how it adds up. You'll never convince me that Lynn is capable of murder. Bill, that's a lot of money, Cam. Almost a million dollars. And now you tell us she's thinking of taking Doug abroad. Yes, to those out-of-the-way places in Europe. Well, what do you want me to do? Be objective. That's all. Cam, I've gone through every book on poison cases I can find. There have been plenty of women who were poison murderers. Stop it, Maggie. Please. Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, Lydia Trueblood, dozens of others. Many of them were young, beautiful, intelligent, and cultured. You still refuse to answer a very simple question. If it was Strickland that killed Polly, why didn't the doctors recognize it? Because they weren't looking for it. Here's the dope on lots of famous poison cases. Not in one instance did a doctor call the turn based on medical diagnosis. You just can't dismiss it as impossible, that's all. At least I can't. And here's something else you might look over. This happened in Philadelphia. More than a hundred people killed by arsenic before even one of the cases was suspected. Yet that's the only case reported in Philadelphia in the last 20 years. All right. How do they account for it? Because there are so many diseases, apparently, that simulate poison symptoms. 
And the idea of murder seems so utterly incredible to the doctors that it doesn't even enter their minds. Don't think I'm sold on this theory, Cam, because I'm not. Too many things don't make sense. If Lynn were guilty, for example, she'd have had Polly's body cremated. Lynn did want Polly cremated. I talked her out of it. Bill wouldn't have wanted it. I see. I, I, I didn't know. Then Polly could have been poisoned. Cam, we... We just can't dismiss this lightly. Well, I can and I will. And if Doug should also die, Cam, then what? Doug, would you ever be able to forgive yourself? You're a lawyer. What do you suggest? I'm afraid there's only one thing to do. Talk to the police. Get a court order for an autopsy. All right. Let's get it over with. Cam? Aren't you coming in? Dinner's ready. Hmm? Oh, oh. What's the matter with you? You've been staring out of that window for half an hour. Ever since you got that phone call. Where's Doug? I told you. He's having dinner at his friends down the street. Lynn, uh, I've got to talk to you. Well, can't it wait until after dinner? No, it can't wait any longer. Lynn, uh, I don't know how to begin. That phone call before, it, it was about Polly. Polly was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. Oh, why, it just couldn't be. Cam, there must be some mistake. I'm afraid not. But how? How could it have happened? The police think it was intentional. Police? Yes, it was their medical examiner who performed the autopsy. They want you and the servants down for questioning tomorrow morning. Oh, but this is impossible. It doesn't make any sense. The police, what, what gave them the idea of performing an autopsy? Lynn, you know Dr. Stevenson wasn't certain what caused Polly's death. No. Well, uh, there was a reason for thinking it, it could have been strychnine. The symptoms are almost identical. And you knew about this, and you didn't even mention it to me. I didn't think they'd find anything wrong. There was no purpose in upsetting you. I, I know it's miserable being dragged down to the police for a lot of oh, stupid well, questions. Well, that can't be helped, but there's one fact we can't get away from. If Polly was poisoned, then somebody did it. And it's up to us to find that somebody. Yes, ma'am. I'll need your help more than ever now. I'll be here. Thank you. continue with Act Two of A Blueprint for Murder, let's hear from Francis Scully. Well, I've been having spring fever, Ken, so I went to see Metro Goldwyn Mayer's romantic hit, Rhapsody. Well, I'd say that has the perfect cast for romance, Francis. Beautiful Elizabeth Taylor in Technicolor and those two sensational screen discoveries, Vittorio Gossman and John Erickson. Yes, and in the picture, they are brilliant young musical artists. And you'll hear some of the world's greatest music. So I'm told. Doesn't Elizabeth Taylor play the role of the spoiled, willful girl they both love? That's right, Ken, in the most romantic performance of her career. The picture is in a delightfully carefree mood, and the background swiftly changes from Switzerland to Paris and the Riviera, as the three young stars bring us the absorbing love story. Well, it looks like MGM has another hit for their 30th anniversary. Good night, Francis. And now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of A Blueprint for Murder. Starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam. Lynn was questioned the following morning at police headquarters. Lieutenant Cole seemed almost apologetic. He dismissed her in a matter of moments. Then he brought Fred and me to Captain Pringle's office. Well, Lieutenant, where's Mrs. Cameron? I just let her go, Captain. She was very cooperative, but I'm afraid we didn't learn very much. Nothing from the servants either. They're all very loyal to her. What'd she have to say about them? Nothing but the best. But it all seems to boil down to Mrs. Cameron, or the cook, or the maid, or the chauffeur. They were the only ones in the house the night the little girl took sick, except the little boy, of course. They had dinner at 7 o'clock. Polly took sick about 11.30, and no one admits giving her anything to eat in the meantime. Yet Strickland would have started to work in half an hour or so. Well... That's about it, I suppose. You don't sound very hopeful, do you? These poison cases are always dillies. It'll be very tough proving anything. I don't get the idea we're laying down, Mr. Cameron. 
but there have been only two poison murder convictions in the whole city of New York in the last 50 years, both based on confessions. There's nothing else you want us for? Uh, just one thing more. We're having your brother's body exhumed, Mr. Cameron. Why do you have to do that? I think you'll agree that if we find out that he was poisoned too, it may go a long way toward helping us find the one we're looking for. He's right, Cam. You start on a case like this, and you never know where it's going to lead. We'll be in touch with you, Mr. Cameron. Thank you. Fred, where will you be late this afternoon? Maggie and I? Well, we're meeting for cocktails at the plaza. Any chance of joining us? Not for cocktails. But I may want to see you. Why? Well, I may have something. I may need some advice. Cam! Cam, over here! Hello, Maggie. Well, I've just come from the library. Oh, no, not you, too. I went through all those books on toxicology. Lynn couldn't have done it, only now I can prove it. How? You die of strychnine during a convulsion. You die of suffocation. Well, what does that mean? It means that somebody gave Polly a second dose in the hospital. In the hospital? She was getting better. How could convulsions start over again nearly 20 hours later? I never thought of that. No, and neither did the police or anyone else. Besides, I called the medical examiner and he had to agree. Well, of course, in all the strychnine cases we looked up, they either died in a few hours or they got well. And it proves that Lynn is absolutely innocent. But how could the hospital have given Polly strychnine? By mistake? That's what I've got to find out. I'm seeing Dr. Stevenson again in the morning. Well, here it is, Mr. Cameron, the patient's chart. The only medicines administered were all quite routine. They were supplied by our hospital pharmacy downstairs. What medicines? What was Polly given the night she died? Mm, at 10 o'clock, she was given calcium chloride pepsin in capsule form. We've been giving her other calcium preparations, but she's complained of the disagreeable chalky taste. So at, uh, at 6.30, I switched to these. She was given a second capsule at 10.30. Well? No ill effects indicated. She took the third capsule at half past 11. Half an hour later, the convulsion started. Could the strychnine have been in that last capsule? Well... Possible, of course, but I'd like to remind you it came directly from the hospital pharmacy. Well, I'm scheduled for surgery. I'd like to check with you later, if I may. Thanks. I appreciate your help. Frankly, though, I, uh, I don't know what more I can add. Mr. Cameron, you want to see me? I'm Miss Brownell. The supervisor said you're the nurse who was on duty here the night my niece died. Oh, yes, and I can't tell you how sorry... Do you recall Dr. Stevenson asking you to have a prescription filled about 6.30? Well, yes, vaguely. May I ask where you took the prescription? Well, the hospital pharmacy downstairs. They never saw that prescription. The pharmacy downstairs was, was closed. They close at 6 o'clock every night. They just told me so. Oh, of course, I remember now. I was just about to send it out when Mrs. Cameron offered to get it filled. Mrs. Cameron? Well, yes, the child's mother. I remember it very clearly now. Oh. Is that all, sir? Yes. Thanks. But that wasn't all. In the morning, the police sent for the nurse. She reported to Captain Pringle's office. Now, tell us, Miss Brownell, how did you happen to ask Mrs. Cameron to get the medicine? Well, I didn't ask her. The hospital pharmacy was closed, and she offered to get the prescription filled herself. Who delivered it to the hospital? Well, she brought it back. What time was that? Oh, I imagine about 7.30. The capsules were in a bottle? Yes. The bottle was sealed? No. No, it was just an ordinary bottle cap. And it would have been possible for someone to have tampered with the capsules without you knowing about it, huh? Well, yes, I... Oh, so. That'll be all, Miss Brownell. Thank you very much for coming here. Not at all. Goodbye. Who's next? Uh, Miss Cameron's chauffeur, a fellow named Wheeler. Okay, bring him in. Now then, Wheeler, you say Mrs. Cameron left the hospital just after 6.30 and you drove her to that drugstore. Yes, sir. What time did you return to the hospital? Oh, about half past seven. Uh, a little earlier, maybe. How long did it take to get it filled? 
Mm, ten minutes, maybe. Then you should have been back at the hospital long before 7.30. Well, on our way back, Mrs. Cameron stopped off at her apartment. Oh? Why? Mm. She didn't say. How long was she there? Not very long. A few minutes. Do you remember if she had the bottle with her when she went up to her apartment? Well, she, uh, well, she must have. Uh, she put it in her purse. You're positive? Uh, yes, sir. That's all, Willie. You can leave now. Thanks. Yes. Well, you've seen the nurse, the chauffeur, the cook, and the maid. Only where are we? Who's waiting in your office? Uh, Mrs. Cameron, brother-in-law. That lawyer, sergeant, and sergeant's wife. Okay, we'll talk to Mrs. Cameron. Um, we'd better have a stenographer in here. Well, that sounds encouraging. I can dream, can't I? Please sit down, Mrs. Cameron. Oh, uh, you don't mind if the stenographer takes some notes? No, not at all, Lieutenant. I want to cooperate fully. Well, first of all, Mrs. Cameron, the nurse at the hospital tells us you offered to get that prescription filled. That's right, I did. But instead of returning to the hospital, you went home? Yes. Why'd you go there, Mrs. Cameron? To pick up some things for Polly. What things? Um, comb, brush, toothpaste, things like that. The night before, there wasn't time to think of anything except getting the child to the hospital. Yes, of course. Um, how long would you say you remained in your apartment? Only a few minutes. Did you open the bottle containing the capsules? No, why should I? Then you had the chauffeur drive you back to the hospital where you handed the medicine to the nurse. Is that right? Exactly. You admit handing the medicine to the nurse? Admit? That's a strange word. You realize, Mrs. Cameron, that the fatal dose was definitely administered at the hospital. That's been proved. So I understand. Well, our next step is to find out who was responsible. You and Mr. Cameron were the only visitors? That's right. You and the hospital attendants were always present while Mr. Cameron was there. I know. So that rules him out. And there was always someone present while I was there. Nevertheless, the poison was somehow slipped into the calcium capsule, and all the medicine came directly from the hospital pharmacy except the bottle you gave the nurse. Now, this bottle was in your possession when you stopped off at your apartment. This gave you the opportunity to put the poison into the capsules. What's more, Mrs. Cameron, you're the one person with a motive. I'm sure you must realize what you're saying. Yes, yes, I do. The death of the two children would make you a very wealthy woman. You wanted the child cremated. You opposed an autopsy, though there was doubt as to the cause of the child's death, and Dr. Stevenson requested it. You think I did this thing? That I killed Polly? It's beginning to look that way, Mrs. Cameron. I love that child as if she were my own. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't. I couldn't. Well, that'll be all for now, Mrs. Cameron. If you'll just wait in the other room, please. I'd like to speak with my brother-in-law. That's where you'll find him. I'd like to speak with him alone. Very well, Mrs. Cameron. Just come with me. Sam, they think I did it. They think I killed Polly. Yes, I, I know. Oh, I'm... I'm trying to keep calm. I mustn't get unnerved. I, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. But I must. I, I must. Lynn. If, if things should go against me, Cam, what about Doug? From the way they talked, I may be held over for a trial or something. Well, yes, I suppose Cam, so. Cam, if it does happen, will you take Doug until it's all over? Of course. Of course I will. And try... Try not to let him ever hear about this. He must have known. But that day when I left police headquarters, I left with Lynn. They released her again, and for three more days, nothing happened. Nothing at least that we knew about. But they were very full days for the police. Checked and double-checked everything, Mr. Henderson. That's why Cole and I have come to you. We're ready to turn the case over to the district attorney's office. You know how I feel about all this. I need a lot more answers than I've got now. Maybe we can give them to you. All right. What about the other pills in that bottle? There were a dozen capsules altogether. The child was given three. She had no reaction from the first two. The third was it, Strickland. I'm talking about the other nine. Negative. Exactly. You've drawn nothing but blanks. Where would she have got the poison? In a drugstore? Not if she's half as smart as you think she is. What about the apartment? Well, in sector science, we've gone through it twice with experts. Same with everything in the medicine cabinets. No trace of strychnine or any other poison. Yeah. 
And this is the case you want us to bring before a judge and jury? Huh? Yes, sir, because we know she did it. She must have done it. All right, leave everything here, all the reports. And keep digging. I can't take it to trial unless we get more evidence. Okay, okay, we'll keep trying. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. At the end of the following week, I went to the district attorney's office. I've told you a dozen times, Mr. Cameron, if we bring this woman up for preliminary examination, I'm absolutely certain no judge will hold her over for trial. Not on this evidence. You believe she's guilty, don't you? Well, what if I do? Captain Pringle, those two, so does Cole. She's planning to take my nephew to Europe. Six months, a year, even five years from now, he suddenly die in some obscure place. You could be right, Mr. Henderson. And then by the time we hear about it, the body will have been cremated. That's all quite possible, Pringle, but it's supposition, not evidence. If there's no chance of winning the case, there's no sense bringing it into court. You mean you base your reputation on winning cases, not on losing them, so you play only the sure bet. He meant nothing of the kind. But if we don't come up with some new evidence, we're dead. So is the boy. The boy's life is in your hands. I don't appreciate your putting it quite that way. There's no other way to put it. I think there is. I think that we... Hello, this is Henderson. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, that was the medical examiner. There is no evidence of poison in connection with your brother's death. That at least would have been some help to us. That still doesn't alter the need of protecting my nephew. All right, Cameron. I don't like this, but under the circumstances, I suppose I have to. Pringle. Yes, sir. Get out a warrant for the arrest of Mrs. Lynn Cameron. The final act of a blueprint for murder in a moment. Now a moment with the beautiful young actress. Charlotte Austin. An extraordinary one, too. She made her debut at the advanced age of two weeks. Well, it wasn't even a walk-on part, Mr. Cummings. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I was walking at two weeks. Being the trooper you are, though, I suppose you want to tell me about a new picture of yours. Not mine, I'm sorry to say. 20th Century Fox, Cinemascope, Technicolor, the works, but no Charlotte Austin. <laughs> you must be in Prince Valiant. A tremendous production, I hear, with a tremendous cast. James Mason, Janet Lee, Robert Wagner, and Deborah Padgett. Isn't it Hollywood's premiere on April 2nd? Uh-huh, and the New York premiere will be April 6th. Well, I guess just about everyone has read the wonderful adventure strip it's based on. Grown-ups and children alike. 20th Century Fox went all out making the picture, too. Director Henry Hathaway traveled 10,000 miles through Great Britain to find authentic locations. Well, stories about King Arthur's times will always be popular with every age group, Charlotte. So will pretty girls with pretty complexions, pretty luxe complexions like yours. Well, thank you. Janet Lee and Deborah Padgett will make you and Lux Charlotte so proud of them in Prince Valiant. They're like me, you know. They wouldn't be without Lux. Nine out of ten stars depend on mild, gentle, luxe toilet soap to care for their valuable complexions. Lever Brothers will return your money if you don't think Lux is every bit as wonderful as we say it is. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> rises on Act Three of A Blueprint for Murder, starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam. Lynn agreed it would be better for Doug if he stayed with me until it was over. The boy and I moved in with Fred and Maggie Sargent. Then came the hearing. We got exactly nowhere. All the judge did was echo what the district attorney had been saying right along. The state has failed to offer any tangible proof that Mrs. Cameron put strychnine in a calcium capsule. Undeniably, Mrs. Cameron had a possible motive for such a crime, but as the defense pointed out, she's not the only one. Mr. Whitney Cameron, her brother-in-law, also stood to inherit the fortune should both the children and Mrs. Cameron die. Mrs. Cameron is a woman of high repute. 
Witnesses have testified that she was an affectionate and indulgent mother to both her foster children. I find that the state has failed to establish probable cause, and I hereby order the defendant discharged forthwith. <laughs> that, Mr. Cameron. We're licked, unless we can find new evidence. You spoke to her a few minutes ago, just before she left the courtroom. What'd she say? She asked about Doug. He's been with you all week, hasn't he? He has a Fred Sargent's house. The boy know about what's been going on? No, I, I, I told him she was called out of town, Chicago. I asked her just now if I could keep the boy until tomorrow. She agreed. I said I'd bring him home in the morning. She's pretty sorry, huh? No, that's just it. She doesn't realize I've had any part of all this. She thinks it's been entirely a police matter. It's a tough break for all of us. I can't leave the boy in her hands. I've got to get him away, and I've only got until tomorrow. Well, just don't you do anything foolish, Mr. Cameron. Don't you do anything you'll be sorry for. The way things stand, the boy belongs with her. She has legal custody. Legal custody so she can poison him, too? You all know she's guilty. What do you do about it? You throw up your hands and offer your sympathy. Now, look, you're all upset. That's perfectly understandable. But why don't you just losing my mind, that's all? Now, you stop by tomorrow. You do that, Mr. Cameron. You bring your lawyer, friend. Maybe, maybe we can figure something out. All that night, I tried to think of something. Fred and Maggie, too. Some legal way of getting Doug away from her. There was no use. There just wasn't time. The next morning, I brought Doug back to me. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting, Cam. I took Doug upstairs to show him some presents I brought for him. He seemed so glad to get home. Yes, I'm, I'm sure he is. He was telling me all about the plans you two have been making, about spending the summer together. Yes, I'm looking forward to that as much as he is. This isn't easy to tell you, Cam, but I'm afraid we'll have to postpone it. Remember I told you I was planning a trip to Europe? Well, yes, but I've I just told... got to get away from all this unpleasantness. You can understand that, can't you? It's all been such a nightmare. When? When do you want to go? Well, I've been lucky. I've got reservations on the Victoria, and it's sailing tomorrow night. That soon? Hmm. We'll probably be gone for about a whole year. I'm planning quite an itinerary. We'll spend two or three weeks in England, and then France, Switzerland... And then it's up. I left the house a few moments later. There was only one thing left to do. I went first to the steamship office, and then to one of those little stores that sells garden supplies. Well, if you're looking for something to kill ants, I think this ought to take care of them. Uh, what is this stuff, a liquid or a paste? Hey, it's a liquid. They put honey in it to attract the ants, and then, of course, the arsenic does the rest. But if you got any children, you better be careful where you put it. Yes, yes, I will. You know, it's a funny thing. We got lots of insecticides today that don't hurt humans. But people keep on asking for these old standbys. You certainly seem to carry a variety. What are these things? These white pills? Hmm. Innocent looking, aren't they? They look like aspirin. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Every one of these pills is stamped with a W. There, you see? That identifies them. But what are they? Strongest stuff we ever carry. Rodenticide. Kills rats and gophers. Put out by a Midwestern concern. Arsenic? Strychnine. Enough to kill a horse. Well, good luck with the ants, mister. Come back. When the Victoria sailed the following night, I was aboard. Doug was delighted to see me. Then seemed rather pleased herself after the first shock of surprise. Later, when Doug went to bed, she met me in the cocktail. I think this is wonderful, Cam. But now, really, this isn't just a sudden impulse to take a boat ride. Doug, believe me, he didn't doubt me for a moment. Though. I'm older and wiser. Well, it's really quite simple. My firm had me down for a trip to France. And I thought you said Venezuela. I felt that now was as good a time as any to make it. All right. And now the real reason. Well, standing by while you went through all this horrible ordeal was as miserable for me as it was for you. I wanted you to know that. You're making this trip just to tell me that? It isn't one of those things you can say in one night while someone's packing trunks. 
Not if you want to sound convincing. Oh, I see. Still don't believe me, huh? You're a hard woman. And when did you decide to come along? When you first told me you were going to Europe. Why then? Because that was the moment when I realized how much I'd miss you. I wish I could believe that. No. No, I take it back. I want to believe you can. And I do. I do. My plan couldn't have been working more smoothly. It could have been a wonderful trip if only the circumstances had been different. There were moments when I was horrified by the enormity of what I was going to do. And those terrible moments of doubt when I wonder if Lynn weren't innocent. But at the bottom of everything was the overwhelming fact that Polly had been murdered. It was our last night at sea. My time had finally run out. Where's Lynn, Uncle Cam? She's waiting for me out on deck, Doug. I told her I wanted to come down and say goodnight to you. There's a big dance in the ballroom, huh? It won't be long now before you'll be getting all dressed up and going to dances, too. You want to bet? I hate dancing. Uncle Cam, can't you stay with us in England? Oh, I'd like to, Doug, but... Well, I've got to earn a living, you know. Well, then when will I see you again? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll get a chance to fly over during the summer. You promise? Okay, I promise. Oh, you'll have a wonderful time in Europe. I would if you were alone. Now, don't you worry about that. Right now, I want you to go to sleep. Okay. I'll see you in the morning before we dock. Good night, Uncle Ken. Have a good time tonight. Thanks. Good night, boy. <laughs> I went to my stateroom and put it in my pocket. That small bottle that I'd filled with poison I'd bought the day before the boat had sailed. I met Lynn. I suggested a cocktail in the lounge before we went to the dance. I'd rehearsed this scene a hundred times in my mind. But now my mind was numb. The idea of taking the life of a human being was like a hideous dream. Bacardi cocktail. Remember, Cam? Remember? Oh, of course, you wouldn't. It was just that you and I first met at the cocktail party, and they served Bacardi. But I do remember that the party was for you and Bill, mm-hmm. just before you two got married. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd met you first. I thought you were the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Why, I can... Hey, eat. be careful. What? Oh, <laughs> no. How clumsy can oh, I get? Oh, now, don't be so upset. I've spilled a few cocktails in my time. Wait for me, will you? It won't take long to change. I'll be back in a moment. The waiter brought another drink and went back to the bar. I put my hand on the little bottle in my pocket. It would be so easy. So simple. But my hand wouldn't move. It was if it belonged to someone else. I'd have to find another opportunity later tonight. But suppose I was wrong. But Fred agreed. Maggie, the DA, the police, all of them agreed. Only Lynn could have done it. If I could just be certain. Lynn was back now. We drank our cocktails and went to the dance. It went on and on as if it would never end. And then suddenly... Oh, no. No what? Oh, can't you hear old Lang Syne, silly? It means the end of the dance. The end of the voyage. And it's been wonderful. Do you like walking? Hmm. How about a turn or two around the deck? I'd love to. I'd better have a wrap, though, hadn't I? Yes, you'd better. Give me a key. I'll get you. I knew then that I just couldn't go through with it. Out on deck, I took the bottle from my pocket and dropped it into the water. I picked up a wrap in her stateroom, and then as I was leaving, my eye caught the bright array of fancy bottles on our dressing table. Perfume, lotions. It seems crazy, but somehow I sensed an association between those bottles and the one I had thrown away. I stood there looking at them. They weren't all cosmetics. There were others, too. Neatly arranged in a traveling kit. Medicines, things for first aid, and a bottle of aspirin. Suddenly, I was back in the store, and the clerk was talking to me. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Strong as duck we carry. Enough to kill a horse. I opened the bottle and dumped out the pills. They were all aspirin. All except three. 
three pills just a little different from any of the others and stamped with a W. Um, don't you think it's time to call it a night? This is the last night we'll be alone for a long time. How about a good night drink? Fine, I'd like that. Your stateroom's closer than mine. Let's go in. I'll order something from the bar. You're not drinking. What's the matter, Cam? Nothing, nothing really. I Just the unhappy thought that it's all over. Oh, the trip. I'm sorry it's over, too. But now tell me something, and I want the truth. Why did you really take this boat? You know why? I know the reason you gave me. It's all very flattering. It's a little difficult to believe. Why? Oh, I don't know. Of course, you are the sort of man who might do crazy, impulsive things. Like going to Europe so I could be with you for five days? Yes. Cam. Your hand, your hand's shaking. What is it? It's nothing. No, nothing's wrong. You know something? This drink tastes funny. It's, it's a bitter. Really? Mm. Uh, let me see. Mine seems all right. It's just my imagination, I suppose. No. No, not your imagination, Lynn. A few minutes ago, when I was in here getting your wrap, I found a bottle of aspirin over there. Oh? Three of the tablets in the bottle were different from the others. They had a W on them, Lynn. That's the trademark of a tablet containing strychnine. Cam, for heaven's sakes... Why were those pills different from the others? Because they were another brand. But I refused to go through all that again. Yet they were in the same bottle. Well, why not? I've been taking another kind of aspirin. I had a few left over, so I put them in a new bottle to save space. Is that so unusual? Lynn, the W is the trademark of a poison. Ah, so that's the real reason you came on this trip. You were behind all those ridiculous accusations from the start. You still say they were just aspirin? Of course they are. That's good. I'm relieved. I'm very relieved. Why? Because that's why your drink tastes a little peculiar. I put one of those pills in your cocktail, and you've just taken it. I don't think we have anything more to discuss. Ever. Get out, Cam. Just a moment, please. Who are you? My name's Connolly, Mrs. Cameron. I'm ship's detective. Uh, Mr. Cameron sent for me as a witness. You've been listening to it? Yeah. As a witness. So that's what you've been expecting. An hysterical admission that the pill contains strychnine. You never give up, do you, Cam? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. The, the tablet was harmless. Mr. Cameron, it seems you've made a very unfortunate mistake... If you'll excuse me, I'd like to leave. This sort of thing's getting to be a habit with him, Mr. Connolly. Connolly, wait a minute. Look at your watch, Lynn. It's been almost five minutes since you took that drink. Right now, your life can be saved. Even another five minutes, but beyond that, you'll die. You know all about strychnine, don't you? Lynn, please, please. If it was strychnine, let me call a doctor before it's too late. But on the other hand, if the tablet was nothing more than aspirin, there wouldn't be much point in calling a doctor now, would there? And if I were to admit that it did contain strychnine, there still wouldn't be any sense in phoning for a doctor. It's a sort of even Stephen, isn't it? Death by strychnine or death by the electric chair. Take your choice. Lynn, it's five minutes past one. Every second is bringing you closer to a horrible death. Don't be a fool. Strange, isn't it? You seem to be the one who's going to pieces, not I. You know, it just occurred to me, if I should die, you're the one who will be facing the electric chair. Or hadn't you thought of that? It must take nerve to kill someone, Cam, to sit by and watch someone die. How would you like to have a death on your conscience? My death. Uh, this is too much for me. Now, did you or did you not give this woman strychnine? I gave her a pill marked with a W that I took from that bottle on the dressing table. Then it was absolutely harmless, Mr. Conley. You have nothing to worry about. Then, please, you don't have much time. Tell me, Mr. Conley, what are your impressions of this man? Would you say he had character, honor, integrity? I'm sure you would. But I'm afraid his looks are quite deceiving. Let me tell you about him. He lived in my home as a guest, as a relative, as a warm friend. But all the while he was accepting my hospitality, he was taking everything I said, every incident that occurred, 
and was conniving to build up a case against me. Oh, but his betrayal didn't end there. Even after the court threw out his ridiculous charges, he kept on and on. But this last attempt, this is the most contemptible of all. You must really be proud of yourself, Cam. Only nothing's happening to me. Even you ought to be convinced by now you're being an idiot. A complete idiot. You were there with me the night that Polly died. You heard her screams. You saw the horrible agony she went through. Do you think that I, that anyone who'd seen that, would take the same chance of dying in that same horrible way? Do you? Well, I've been an even bigger fool than you. You took me in completely. I was even falling in love with you. All right, now. Get out. Get out or I'll call the person. I assure you that Mr. Cameron will leave at once. This is the most outrageous thing I've ever witnessed. You realize, Cameron, I'll have to make a full report of all this. Go ahead. Make your report. I went to my stateroom. I must have been sane. Blindly insane. How could I have been so wrong? Apparently, Polly's death was due to one of those impossible accidents that couldn't happen but did. A million to one shot. A mistake by a careless clerk in a drugstore. I was horror stricken at the thought that it was only by the merest chance that I hadn't murdered her. What a mess. What a complete, miserable mess I've made of everything. I wondered if I... Cameron! Cameron, come along, hurry. You're wanted in the surgeon's office right away. Mr. Cameron, I'm Dr. Wells. Mrs. Cameron is inside. Another few moments, and it would have been too late. She phoned Dr. Wells as soon as we left. Uh, doctor, she she live? Yes, Mr. Cameron. She live. Lynn Cameron was convicted of murder in the first degree. Her sentence, life imprisonment. And so the names of Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, and Lydia Trueblood, and all those other young, beautiful, but evil poison murderers was added that of Lynn Cameron. Something to remember? Perhaps. Doug and I, we're trying to forget. Our stars will return in a moment. That's so dense, new flavor. That's so dense, new flavor. has a brand new, wonderful place. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. Please step forward, Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire. <laughs> well, I must say, you both really stepped out of character tonight to play two unusual roles. There's nothing an actress likes better than to play a part entirely different from her last one. And what was your last one, Dorothy? The part of the secretary in Three Coins in the Fountain for 20th Century Fox. It's in color and cinema scope. And Clifton Webb, Jean Peters, and I went to Italy to make it. I wonder I'm not getting anywhere in this business. All the pictures of me are made in Europe. I saw Night People, which stars Gregory Peck and Broderick Crawford, one of the most exciting thrillers I ever saw. And that was filmed in Berlin. Now, why don't I get those parts? I wasn't even considered for an Academy Award this year. <laughs> what a terrible oversight. Why was that, Dad? Can't imagine, unless it's because it didn't make any pictures. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you do. You find a fountain, and you throw in a coin and make a wish. Now, where is he going to find a fountain around here? Then why not? Where are we going to find a coin? <laughs> I haven't been working. You'd have me in tears if I didn't know you're going into a picture tomorrow. Oh, yeah, we're making no business like show business now. 
Well, it isn't the money, Irving. I just missed the love scenes with those Lux girls. It's not the real thing on radio. <laughs> well, I can tell you that Lux is the real thing when it comes to complexion care. Lux soap is the favorite of our loveliest stars. Including Dorothy McGuire? I wouldn't be without it, Irving. Now I hear you have a delightful show for next week. You certainly think so. It's a charming romance and one of Paramount Pictures' most delightful screen comedies. Welcome, stranger. And we have a fascinating trio of stars. First, a brand new personality, Pat Crowley. Then, one of the most lovable character actors in Hollywood, Barry Fitzgerald. And one of the screen's most handsome comedians, Cary Grant. <laughs> it should be just great, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night. And all our thanks. Now, here's Art Linkletter with a word for the busy housewife. When you're at the store pushing that metal cart around, have you ever noticed how many detergents there are? My gosh, you get dizzy just looking at them. So what's a poor girl to do? Try all of them? Some people do. And generally speaking, they find that a good detergent gets things clean looking and... Well, then it doesn't make any difference which one you buy. Just close oh, your eyes. Oh, wait, wait just a minute there. Open your eyes when you buy that detergent. But when you're trying to find out if your wash is really clean, don't rely on looks alone, because your nose can tell you what your eyes can't see. Oh, you mean that things aren't really clean unless they smell clean. That's right. If things don't smell clean, they aren't as clean as they should be. And like I said, all good detergents will give you a wash that's clean looking, but surf, all-purpose surf, will do more. Surf gets things so clean they smell clean, too. So clean they smell like sunshine. And that means they're clean, clear through. One wash day with surf will prove that to you. And you won't go reaching blindly for just any detergent down at the store. You'll always reach for surf. Now remember, no matter how tough a laundry job you've got, greasy work clothes and overalls, towels, sheets, surf gets things really clean. So get the big money saver economy size box of surf, because I know you'll like it. Lever Brothers Company, makers of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Liquid Detergent, they invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Welcome Stranger, starring Cary Grant, Barry Fitzgerald, and Pat Crowley. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Cast tonight were Yvonne Patey as Maggie, Fred Mackay as Fred, Harry Shearer as Doug, Jonathan Hall as Dr. Stevenson, Barney Phillips as Captain Detective Pringle, Jack Crucian as Lieutenant Detective Cole, William Conrad as the District Attorney, Joyce McCluskey as the Nurse, Herb Butterfield as the Judge, and Jimmy Eagles, Charlie Seal, John Larch, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Don't forget Lever Brothers' pair and a spare plan, the smart, new way to buy stockings. You get three nationally advertised, first quality Canon nylon stockings, a dollar eighty-five cent value for just one dollar, plus box tops or wrappers from Lever Brothers products. Look for details on the packages. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Welcome Strangers, starring Cary Grant, Mary Fitzgerald, and Pat Crowley. Every Thursday, Ding Lever Brothers Company brings you the Lux Video Theater, the culture local newspaper for time and station. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Dana Andrews and Ruth Roman in The Blue Gardenia. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes in a moment of great emotional stress, we commit a foolish and regrettable act. In tonight's exciting drama, The Blue Gardenia, 
It's an impulsive telephone call that leads to an accusation of murder. As our stars of this intriguing mystery from Warner Brothers, we have Dana Andrews and Ruth Roman. Now act one of Blue Gardenia, starring Dana Andrews as Casey and Ruth Roman as Nora. Almost every large American city has a newspaper called the Evening Chronicle. But not every Evening Chronicle has a reporter and featured columnist whose byline is Casey Mayo. Casey's specialty is the human interest story, which you may find almost anywhere, even in the main office of the West Coast Telephone Company. At the moment, he's in the office of the Director of Public Relations. Oh, yes, Mr. Mayo. Our business has shown a phenomenal expansion since the war. For instance, I have some comparative figures in the file here. Well, that's all right, Mr. Mitchell. I'll take your word for it. Here we are. Now, comparing the year 1953... Oh, Mr. Mitchell. Hmm? Yes? Well, let's save that stuff for the financial page. My readers are interested in people. In your case, that means the telephone girl. Who they are, what they look like, what's behind the voice that says, Number, please. Ha! Well, I can show you some pictures of our girls that we're running in our new advertising campaign. Oh, and these are some pencil sketches made by the artist on the series. This one is Jane. She's our youngest operator. Uh-huh. And uh, Tanira, she was actually born and reared in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, the artist who did these drawings, was he Harry Preble? Why, uh, as a matter of fact, yes. Uh, he specializes in women, you know. He certainly does. Uh, come to think of it, uh, Mr. Preble's doing another sketch right now. One of our prettiest girls, too. Would you like to see him? uh uh-uh. I'd like to see her. No, Crystal, don't turn your head. I want a complete profile. Look, Mr. Parable, I can't do everything at once. Either I pose for you or I answer Mr. Mayo's questions, one or the other. Then let's concentrate on Mr. Mayo. It would be a pleasure. Now, where did we leave off? I see, you said you were from Chicago. That's right. Oh, and my phone number is Granite 7323. Granite 7323. Thanks, Crystal. Don't bother to call, Mr. Preble. I expect to be out every evening for the next five years. <laughs> what is this between you two? Love at first flight? <laughs> Come on, Casey. Finish up with the girl. I wish there was something you could write about me, Mr. Mayo, but I'm afraid my past is all in the future. Hey, maybe you better try Nora. Nora? What's so special about her? Well, she's engaged to one of the real heroes of the Korean War, that's all. Mm, that's good enough. Lead me to her. Uh, Mr. Mayo, uh, Mr. Mayo. Yes, Mr. Mitchell. Your office is phoning you. You can take the call in one of the booths in the hall outside. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Preble, there's a call for you, too. Oh, all right. Hello? Darling, I know you told me not to call you there, but I've just got to talk to you. Well, I... just a second. Who is this? Who do you want to talk to? Uh, don't hang up, Casey. Maybe that's for me. <laughs> Could be, Harris. He wants to speak to Darling. I guess my call must be in the next booth. Harry? Harry, is that you? Hello, honey. Harry, I've just got to see you right away. Look, Rose, I'm tied up now. Call me at home. I can't. You've changed the number and I can't get it from the operator. Harry, you promised me that if anything Rose, happens... Rose, I said I can't talk now, so take it easy. I'll call you sometime. Harry! Hmm... Oh, Harry. No, yeah, I got your call, Casey. Yeah, do me a favor, will you, Harry? Tell Crystal and her friend I had to go back to the office. The editor wants to see me on the double. Something big breaking? Something real big for me. I'll see you, Harry, and good luck with Granite 7323. Nora, are you listening to me? Yes, I can hear every word. No, I'll bet. Look, will you please come out of that closet? Just a minute. Go on, Crystal. Then what did Casey Mayo say? She said, lead me to where he said, meaning Nora. Then comes the phone call, and that's the last I saw of Mr. Mayo. Well, I don't see why you didn't introduce him to me. After all, I'm your roommate, too. You were busy on the switchboard, remember, Sally? So was Nora. All right, so I'm a beast. But Casey Mayo wanted a story, and it's Nora who's engaged to the big war hero. Oh, Nora? Yes? What did Bill say in that last letter about coming home? Oh, I don't know. I haven't opened the letter yet. Nora, where did you get that dress? And how much did they rook you for it? You like it? Oh, yes, I adore taffeta. And thanks for getting it in black. It'll look good on all of us. But you don't mind if I wear it first, just for tonight. Well, uh, seeing as it's your birthday, okay. Thanks a lot. 
Sure seems a waste of scenery to get all dressed up like this and then just spend the evening at home. It's the way I want it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, honey, Homer and I wouldn't mind your coming along on our date tonight. Homer might even forget the movie and take us dancing. Oh, I know. It's sweet of you, Crystal. Does anybody smell smoke? Oh, I know oh, it. Oh, Nora's roast. It's still oh, in the oven. Oh, Sally, you oh. forgot. Probably burned. Oh. Ruined. Sally, I asked you to turn off the oven. Oh, I'm sorry, Nora. You know I just can't concentrate. I ate dinner downtown, so well, so for me, that's the end of food until breakfast. Wait a minute. Maybe we've still got some hamburger in the refrigerator. Hamburger? On Nora's birthday? Not if I can help it. Sally, you're not going to the market. I just got time. It closes in ten minutes. Nora? Yes? Did you buy this bottle of champagne just for tonight? Oh, yes, it's been on ice long enough. I'll take it. Honey, a word of advice from a veteran. Drinking all by yourself is no good. I won't be alone. Oh, of course not. You've got Bill's photographs to keep you company. (laughs) Yes, I have. Sure. I've watched you set the stage. The dining table set for two, Bill's photo propped up by his napkin, and now champagne for a toast to the big man who isn't here. Well, what's wrong with that? I can pretend he's here, can't I? Oh, honey, it's your birthday. You ought to be with people. Well, I'll be with Bill, and I saved his letter, the one that came yesterday. I'll read it tonight. Well, maybe I'm the one who's stupid. Maybe pretending is better than the real thing. Well, it isn't, but it's better than nothing at all. Uh Uh-oh, that's Homer downstairs. You sure you won't come along? No, thanks, Crystal. All right, all right, I'm coming. Oh, Nora? Yes? Save me the champagne (laughs) cork. I will. Good night. To you, darling. And now to me. Wish me a happy birthday, Bill. No, wait. That's what your letter is for, isn't it? Dear Nora, I've been wanting to write this letter to you for so long, but instead I've written to you about other things. Things that aren't nearly so important as this. Remember when I collected that load of shrapnel in the leg? Well, they shipped me to the hospital here in Tokyo. That's how I met Angela. She's my nurse. We're in love. We're going to be married. Hello? Granite 7323? Yes. How are you, honey? Had dinner yet? No. Who is this? Harry Preble. Oh, the artist? Look, honey, let's stop playing games. You told me you'd be out every evening for the next five years, and yet here you are getting ready to have dinner with me. Oh, I- I'm sorry, Mr. Preble, but I'm afraid you've made a mistake. We'll discuss my mistakes over cocktails. Now, come on, hop in a cab and meet me at the Blue Gardenia. They've got the best Chinese food in town. Oh, Mr. Preble, you don't understand. Well, maybe I do. You've got a date. Well, no, I did have. And he stood you up, huh? Okay, then what's holding you back? Well, I... Nothing, really. All right. The Blue Gardenia. I'll be there in ten minutes. Gardenia? Blue Gardenia? Blue gardenia for the ladies, sir? No, sorry, May. I'm fresh out of blonde. Oh, Mr. Mayo. So nice to hear your voice again. Oh, thanks, May. How's everything? Oh, not like the old days, Mr. Mayo. No, I suppose not. I'll tell you what, May. Look me up at the bar after I've had a drink or two. Maybe I'll buy one of those gardenias. I will, Mr. Mayo. Thank you. Well, well, if it isn't Mr. Forth estate himself. Hey, Harry. Well, I was hoping I'd meet somebody I knew. Yeah, why? You remember this morning at the phone company when the editor called me back to the office? Yeah, you said it was something big. The biggest. I'm to cover the next series of H-bomb tests out in the Pacific. No more hack work for me, boy. Only top assignments. I see. 
Hey, you said you were hoping to meet somebody here that you knew. That's right. And I asked why. Well, when you have some good news, don't you like to have somebody to tell it to? <laughs> oh, no. It's so funny. <laughs> you, if you want an audience, why don't you get married? Because it's cheaper to talk to you. Oh. Mr. Purple, your young lady, she come now. Oh, thanks, Louie. Young lady, now at table. And hey, Louie, bring us two of your Polynesian pearl divers and heavy on the rump. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Preble. Yeah, this is a coincidence. I just talked to your friend Crystal. Oh, you didn't talk to her. You talked to me. I, I'm one of Crystal's roommates. No kidding. I told you you made a mistake. The sort I like to make, honey. Mind if I sit down? It's your table. That's right. I uh, probably shouldn't have come. It was just a silly impulse. You see, it's my birthday, and I just bought this new table. Your birthday? Then this is a real occasion. Uh, Louie, those drinks better be for us. Yes, Mr. Preble. Are those rum drinks? Uh, we call them Polynesian pearl divers. Mostly ice and pineapple juice, aren't they, Louie? Whatever you say, Mr. Preble. Can I get high on one of them? Do you want to? I don't know what I want. Only, only to forget the early part of this evening. Okay. Tonight starts as of now. To us. To us. What's the name of that tune? Blue Gardenia. Pretty. Was the song named for the cafe or the cafe for the song? Which I? Harry, you listening? Sure, sure. Uh, Louie, the lady will have another pearl diver. Okay, honey. Why not? Just ice and pineapple juice. And soft trade winds across cool ice. Have you saved one for me, May? Of course, Mr. Mayo. You've brought me luck. Oh, I have? How? Well, nobody's ever given me five dollars for a gardenia before. And Mr. Preble did tonight. Five dollars? His date must be pretty terrific. i got to see this dish. They just left, Mr. Mayo. Oh. I'm sorry to say it, but I wish that girl wasn't with Mr. Preble. You know something, May? So do I. What do you know? It's starting to rain. <laughs> rain, rain, go away. Come again another day. Still feel okay, <laughs> honey? Wonderful. Oh, it's so wonderful. Mm, smell this gardenia, Harry. What does it remind you of? Mm, South Seas, Southern Cross <laughs> above coral reefs. Lovely maiden bathing at the foot of a waterfall. <laughs> That's me, isn't it? Sure. Okay, hop out, honey. Where are we going? Up to my apartment. I've invited a few people in. Good. Every girl should have a party on her birthday. No more to drink, Harry, please. Oh, come on. One glass of champagne can't hurt you. Oh, then just one. Harry, where are all the people you invite? They'll be along. Such a wonderful place to give a party. You can see the whole city from these windows. And a real fireplace to make it cool. What was that? Just thunder. Harry, can we have some music? I can feel like that. Well, I'll turn on the phonograph. I've got a special record here to remember our first date. Do you remember it? Mm, blue gardenia. Oh, Harry, I've got to sit down. But you wanted to dance. Oh, I've got to sit down and show her. Oh. Yeah, take off your shoes, honey, and just relax. Everything's all right. 
Everything's all right. Oh, no, it, it isn't. You wrote me that letter. Letter? Oh, why did you have to meet that man? Oh, darling, you know I love you. You do, honey? I love you, Bill. I love you. That's what I wanted to hear. I knew you'd be a good kid. Oh, no, Harry, don't. Come on, baby, give me a kiss. Oh, it's late. I've got to go home. There's no hurry. Oh, there he is. My shoes. What happened to them? Maybe I've got them. Maybe I won't let you have them unless you act nice. Harry, please. Are you going to be nice? Oh, no, stay away if you don't. Yeah, what do you do? I'll, I'll, I'll use this. <laughs> hey, give me that poker. Get away. Give it to me. Harry, I warned you. Act two of the Blue Gardenia in a moment. You know, our servicemen overseas have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. They find, too, that these ideas aren't so strange after all. For instance, take this business of tattooing. On some of the islands of the Pacific, the natives adorn themselves with tattoo marks indicating the group they belong to or the gods they worship. Among the Brahmins and Mohammedans, a tattoo is used as a mark of caste although the caste system is rapidly disappearing. In Japan, skilled artists create truly beautiful designs using the human body instead of a canvas. Well, all this might sound strange, but tattooing is not unknown in our culture. However, as some of our servicemen have observed, it's, uh, well, it's a little embarrassing when the fellow with a tattoo that reads, John Loves Mary, takes as a wife a girl by the name of Josephine. Or the young man with a beautiful anchor on his chest finds himself in the Army or the Air Force. From another standpoint, the beauty marks worn by some women of Western civilization are nothing more than a form of tattoo. And the same thing is true about other customs and traditions of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. These customs are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Blue Gardenia, starring Dana Andrews as Casey and Ruth Roman as Nora. (laughs) Nora Larkin should never have gone out with Harry Preble. She should never have had all those drinks. And she should never have gone to Harry's apartment. But what was done was done. And when Harry came toward her with that look in his eyes, Nora reached out for the only weapon at hand, a fire poker. Harry, I warned you. The night and the rainstorm pass, and now it is morning. In Harry Preble's apartment, a group of sober-faced men are busy with cameras, tape lines, and fingerprint kits. Then she must have raised the poker over his head and let him have it. Who let him have it, Captain? Oh, hello, Casey. What are you doing on a routine murder case? Oh, I happened to hear the police called on the car radio. From the address, I thought it might turn out to be something for the society page. No, no, this guy was an artist. Oh, Oh, hey, Al, give uh, a look around and see if you can find some pictures of artist models. You know, something with... Yeah. Got you, Kate. Ah, so you're right an assistant now, I guess. Don't let Al hear you call him that. He thinks I just write the captions for his photograph. <laughs> oh, where's the body? Now, the coroner just took it. Uh-huh. Who found it? Cleaning woman. And I mean a real cleaning woman. She wiped the fingerprints off the cocktail glasses and the fire poker and then discovered the body. Oh, no clues then. Ah, a couple. A lace handkerchief. Pair of suede pumps, size five and a half. Must have been in a real hurry. Unless she's the kind of girl who always walks home in her stocking feet after killing the boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she always wears blue gardenias. Yeah. Blue gardenias? Uh-huh. We found one on the sofa, broken off at the stem. Hey, Al, leave that pornograph alone. Oh, I just wanted to listen to... Keep the... your hands off it. Maybe Captain Haynes hasn't checked it yet. Now we have. The cleaning woman said that record was still playing when she let herself in this morning. Oh, I see. 
Uh, Captain, you said uh, this guy was an artist? Yeah, that's right. A girl, a blue gardenia. By any chance would the victim's name be Preble? Well, I thought you knew, sure. Harry Preble. Huh. I, you knew him? Yeah, I knew him. And I know a story when I see one, Captain. Maybe you and I can write this together. I've got a pretty good idea for chapter one. <laughs> Yes, Louis, remember? Louis take young lady to table. Mr. Preble order many drinks for young lady. All right. And uh, what did she look like? Blue Gardenia very busy last night. Blue Gardenia always busy. That is why Louis not look close at ladies sometimes. But if you saw this girl again, uh, you'd know her, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you, Louis? Yes, Louis know. I know you can't see, May, but can you remember anything? Well, they, the girl's perfume, something about her voice, or... Well, it was a friendly voice, friendly and quiet. Mr. Mayo, her dress, it was taffeta. Taffeta? Yes, it rustles like no other material. Taffeta. Thank you, May. The police have already been here, thanks to you, Mr. Mayo. They questioned every single operator who posed for one of Preble's sketches. And did they find, Mr. Mitchell, that one of the girls checked in late this morning? They were on time, all of them. Sorry, Mr. Mayo, but you'll have to look elsewhere for your murderers. Perhaps. Operator, give me the number of the Blue Gardenia restaurant. I'm sorry I cut you off, sir. Please excuse me. Feeling any better, honey? Oh, no, my head's coming to pieces. You're still not talking about last night. Well, huh? there's nothing to talk about. I just went out and got tight. All by yourself, Nora? Who are you kidding? Well, well, visitors again. Who? Where? Down at the end of the board, Casey Mayo and some guy. Hey, isn't he Chinese? Casey Mayo? No, the other one. Crystal, I, I don't feel well. Will you take my calls for a moment? Why, well, sure, honey. Maybe you better go out and see the nurse. Yes, I will. Well, I've never seen Nora with a hangover before. No, and I bet you never will again. Long distance. Hello, long distance. Yes, sir, this is Operator 27. And better known to her friends as Gannett 7323. Ladies, may I introduce my friend, Louis Wong? Yes, sir, we have an appointment call for you. Glad to know you, Mr. Wong. Maybe you'll introduce your friend, Mr. Mayo. (laughs) Didn't I see you yesterday? If you did, you didn't make much of it. Sorry. Well, shall we go, Louis? Oh, Mr. Mayo. Yes? Maybe you can tell us why the police are suddenly so interested in a girl's nightlife. Such silly questions. Such as, madam, when was the last time you went strolling in the rain without your shoes? <laughs> and that was one of the dillies. Hey, what's it all about? I'm sorry, the answer will cost you seven cents. Check page one of the Evening Chronicle. Coming, Louis. We're ready, Salt Lake City. Please put on your time. Huh? What do you say, Louis? You looked at at least 50 girls. Which one was it? Louis did not see. Girl not here, Miss Mel. City room, Mayo. Casey, this is Haynes. Have you gone nuts? By that, Captain, I'd say you just read my story about Harry Preble. <laughs> you like it, huh? Oh, sure, yeah. Especially this line. Yeah. So here's a bit of information for my good friend, Captain Haynes of Homicide. The murderer you're looking for, Captain, was wearing a taffeta dress, probably black. Uh-huh. She probably was. I checked with the gal who does our fashion page. She says everything's black taffeta this year. Did she tell you that taffeta was a must for murder? <laughs> That's not bad, Captain. You mind if I use that line? Look, Casey, if you got any real clues, I want them. Now, you know what the penalty is for withholding information from the police. Who's withholding? Just keep reading my column, Captain. You'll find it all there. Well? Al? Yeah, Case. I want you to go back to Preble's apartment and photograph everything in sight. I've got to find a new angle, some new gimmick for the next edition. I don't get what's so important about this story, Case. Well, it's news. Beautiful girl kills the defender virtue. That's big news. Mm. And maybe something extra in case you may always pay him a little. Okay, but how do you know that this this blue gardenia girl's beautiful? Maybe she's a dog. Uh-uh. They're always beautiful. What did you call her? The uh, blue gardenia? <laughs> That's it, Al. That's my gimmick. 
The blue gardenia murder case is expected to break wide open within a matter of hours. The clue that may well lead police to the murderess is a tabata dress, probably black. <laughs> Probably black. Probably black. Probably bright red. That type of girl doesn't wear black. What type of girl? The type who would go out with Harry Preble. Well, maybe she was just lonely, bewildered. Huh? Maybe she was tired of drugstore food and one-room apartments and a career in an elevator or at a switchboard or behind a manicure table. Maybe she wanted more excitement. Hey, gee, that Casey Mayo sure knows how to write. Listen to this. Her voice was quiet and friendly as she drank half a dozen Polynesian pearl divers in the blue gardenia. She was just Harry Preble's kind of doll, a flashy blonde putting on an act. Oh, stop la- it. Stop it, will you? Huh? No, honey. Well, gee, what did I do? No, I'm sorry. I'm just so tired. After all day on the switchboard, my nerves are... Same here. We've had enough blue gardenia. Let's turn in. Okay, I'm first in the bathroom. Aren't you always? Nora. Yes? I know what's wrong with your nerves. You do? Yeah. When I woke up this morning and saw you passed out on the couch, your dress soaking wet and everything, I knew something had happened. Oh, honey, I don't blame you for doing it. Doing it? Yes. I found Bill's letter on the dining table. I read it. If a guy joked with me like that, I'd go out and get tanked, too. Thanks, Krista. Oh, it's nothing, really. All right, Sally, ready or not, here I come. The clue which may well lead the police to the murderer is the tap of the dress, probably black. Crystal? Sally? Hey, you there. Who, who, who are you? Night watchman, ma'am. Don't you know it's against the law to burn incinerators after dark? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot. Oh, you forgot that? You, you're not going to make me put it out? No, looks like it's too late now. But don't let it happen again. It won't. No, never again. Gardenia case? Yeah, I need a new angle. Something that'll drag that dame into this office before the cops get her. Why? Why what? Why should she come to you? Because I want her. An exclusive. That's simple, isn't it? Casey, isn't there anything in life for you besides a headline? Yeah, two headlines. Do you realize, Al, one week from now, I'll be out in the South Pacific. I can't just walk out on this dame. You've left dames before, haven't you? Yeah, that's something else. That kind of deal is easy. Not for me. I always hate scenes. I stall the bus up until I'm leaving town, then I write the dame a letter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not what? A letter. Listen. An open letter to an unknown murderer. Dear Blue Gardenia, I hope you'll read this letter 
Because I want to help you. Because I want to help you. When I say I, that means my newspaper and me. Tell us your story. If we get it first, we'll go all out for you. That includes hiring the best trial attorney in town. Hiring the best trial attorney in town. By now, you must be frightened out of your wits. You don't know which way to turn. There's no place to hide, nowhere to run except to me. So take my advice, Bruce. Take my advice, Blue Gardenia. Go to the nearest phone booth and invest a dime in the rest of your life. Dial Madison 60025 and ask for it. Yours, very earnestly, Casey Mayo. Where are you going, Nora? No place, just out. But my dinner's almost ready. I don't want any dinner. Please leave me alone. I, I'm sick of you two watching everything I do and everything I say everywhere I go. Honey, what's gotten into you? Sally and I, we're just concerned about you. You're not yourself these days. Oh, I'm not. So you've both been spying. You admit it. No, this is silly. Well, leave me alone and don't try to follow me. Well, what was all that about? I don't know. Sally, I'm beginning to be afraid, terribly afraid. Mayo. I read your ad in the paper, Casey. If you'll just tell me what size police badge you wear, I'll come over and pin it on your chest. <laughs> How are you, Captain? Fine. Just burning to meet your pen pal. Hold on a second, will you, Captain? Mayo. You know how I killed him? You want to know why? Because I loved him. With a passion that was bigger than both of us. The size of the passion is very important, lady. But tell me first, what size shoe do you wear? Shoe? Eight and a half C. But I could wear an eight if it was... Sorry, lady. You are not our Cinderella. <laughs> Captain Haynes? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. That last call makes the tenth confession so far. How many phonies are there in this town? Hello. Mayo. Mr. Mayo, I read your letter. Okay, lady. Tell me how I can be sure you are the blue gardenia. The newspaper said the police found his shoes. Weren't they suede shoes? Maybe. Go on. They were size five and a half B. The rubber heel was loose on the left shoe. Am I right? Look, where are you calling from? A phone booth on the street. It's, it's right next to the service station at hey, the corner. Hey, fellow, where's the watch room? Yeah, yeah. Go on. No. No, I'm not ready yet. Hello. Gardenia. Are you still there? Hey, fella. The phone's off the hook. Hello? Gardenia? Gardenia. Who? Gardenia? Who is this? Highway Patrol, Officer McManus. Where's the girl I was just talking to? What girl? I don't see any girl around here. Yeah, of course, she saw you first. Okay, officer. Thanks for the near miss. Uh, hey, Case. Yeah? You think she'll call again? How do I know? Well, it's been a couple hours. Uh, All right, Al. I get the message. Go on home. You mean it? I, I hate to leave you here alone. It's almost midnight. Go on, I said. You're lousing up my game of solitaire. Okay, okay. See you in the morning. Hello, Mayo. Mr. Mayo, do you remember a phone call earlier tonight? The one that was interrupted? Uh, just which call was that? Uh, about the shoes, size five and a half feet. I know the girl who phoned you. I, I'd like to talk to you about it. Uh-huh. Where are you now? A, a block from your office. Okay. Come on up here. There's a self-service elevator on the side street. Get off on the second floor. That's the city room. You'll be alone? Yeah, alone. All right. In five minutes, Mr. Mayo. In a moment, Act Three of The Blue Gardenia. 
The story is told about a couple of tourists who are going through an art gallery in Italy. One man, obviously tired of sightseeing, announced to everyone within hearing, Ah, you call this art? Nothing but faded paint and cracked canvas. We got better stuff on our calendars at home. An American serviceman overheard this and saw how it offended the Italians. He turned to the man and said, Sir, the paintings here are not on trial. The people who come to see them are. Well, the frowns of disapproval on the faces of the Italians were erased by smiles of understanding, and the incident was widely repeated. It was a small thing, but even small things can have tremendous results. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of The Blue Gardenia, starring Dana Andrews as Casey and Ruth Roman as Nora. In the dark and deserted city room of the Evening Chronicle, Casey Mayo waits tensely for the minutes to pass. And then in the corridor outside, the automatic elevator. Casey reaches for the light switch. Oh. Hello. Won't you uh, sit down? Please. Right here. Cigarette? Yes. Thanks. Local girl? What? Are you a local girl? You born and raised here? Does it make any difference? No, not really. Just making conversation. Well? Uh, Mr. Mayo, I, I want to explain about the first phone call, why my friend didn't call you back. She was too frightened? Or maybe she didn't trust me? That was it. So she asked me to to talk to you. Look, I don't want to sell myself to you or to your friend. I told you, I mean her, all we want is an exclusive story. We'll pay for it with the best criminal attorney in town. But perhaps the police will never find it. Oh, they will. And they won't be so generous either. How did your friend meet Preble? At the phone company? No. She didn't tell me. Well, anyway, they were good friends. No. She went to his apartment, didn't she? He said there'd be other people there. Mm-hmm. Mr. Mayo, she had a lot to drink. She, she wasn't thinking. She wasn't thinking, period. That's what she told me. She doesn't even remember killing. Oh, the old amnesia alibi. Now, well, maybe you're worrying too much about your friend. <laughs> Sounds to me like she can take care of herself. I don't know what to say. Oh. Look, how about a hamburger? What? I've been cooped up in this office here all night. No dinner. There's an all-night joint up the street. Oh, no, that... no, I don't want to be seen with you. <laughs> Believe me, it's perfectly safe. It's one of those hangouts that's either empty or you can't get in. Hmm. Just the thought of one of those juicy hamburgers and a cup of coffee. Coffee? Yeah, a whole pot if you want. Come on, let's go. You know, when you first walked into my office, I thought you were the blue gardenia. What changed your mind? You are coming here with me. You wouldn't have risked that. Besides, you just aren't her type. Oh? What type am I? The type that looks very becoming with a dab of mustard on the tip of your nose. I have not. <laughs> but I have. <laughs> Do that again. What? That. It's the first time since you walked into my office. It's the first time since I found out about... about my friend. You haven't found out very much. It's clear up till the time she went to Preble's apartment. The rum drinks flower he bought her. Even after that, when he put the record, the blue gardenia. Yeah, pretty song. Let's see. I think it's listed here on the jukebox. Yeah.
Oh, that's a nice song. It's too bad it was background for murder. Mr. Mayo, you're not going to print any of what I've told you. Not until I've talked to the Blue Gardenia herself. And it better be soon. The police have her shoes. They're checking the stores to find who bought them. Oh, Mike, what do we owe you? Uh, two hamburgers and five coffees. Uh, dollar forty, Mr. Mayo. Okay, it's here on the table. Thank you. Mr. Mayo, I, I'm going to talk to my friend. If if I can get her to call you... No, no more phone stuff. You tell her to meet me here at 3.40 tomorrow afternoon. Why 3.40? Because that gives me just time to make the sunset edition. Hi, honey. Oh, Crystal, I, I hope you didn't wait up just for me. No, I just got home. Homer took me to the Blue Gardenia tonight. What a mob. Everybody wanted to sit where the murderer sat. And everybody thinks that he did. Want some milk? No, I'm turning in. Good night. Nora? Yes? After Homer phoned for the date, I decided to borrow your new black taffeta dress. I couldn't find it. I, I sent it to the cleaners. Then I noticed your pumps were gone. The black suede pump. Really? Honey... I've been putting everything together. That big mystery about the night of your birthday. Where you went, who you were with. And your jitters ever since. Nora, baby. Was it you? <laughs> oh, Nora, baby. <laughs> Mr. Mayo. Oh, Mike, has a girl come in who... Hello, Mr. Mayo. Oh. Ah, Granite 7323. You know, I, su I suspected you from the start. You did. Yeah, I did. That's funny. You look smart enough to have gotten rid of trouble some other way. Oh, I could have. But it just happens that I didn't do it. You see, I'm allergic to gardenias any color. Now, what are you doing here? Because the real girl is ready to give herself up to you. But before she does, I want to be sure you meant what you told her last night. Oh. Where is she? Who's behind us? Treat her right, Mr. Mayo. Well, now you know. Yeah. Now I know. <sighs> Mike, some coffee over here, strongest you got. When Harry Preble called, I made the date, Crystal's date. And Nora Larkin, a country kid in the big city, winds up killing a man she'd never been out with before. But last night you said your friend, well, I mean you, that you, you didn't remember doing it. I must have. There's no other explanation. More coffee, Mr. Mayo? Oh, thanks, Mike. Okay, just holler if you do. Mr. Mayo, I know I should have told you the whole story last night, but I wanted time to think. I... I had to be sure I could trust you. And you're sure now? I'm sure. So what do we do? I... I don't know. You don't know? Nora, I, I didn't expect you to be the girl. Oh, what's that got to do with it? You promised him that letter you'd help me. Didn't you mean what you said? No. But don't you see, Nora... I thought the killer was just another cheap dame. If I'd had any idea that it was you... No more lies, please. I've had enough. Oh, Nora. That's okay, Casey. My boys will escort her. It was a hand. trap. You led me into a turret. Take her along, boys. Haynes, wait a minute. You made a mistake. No, it's the other way around, isn't it? You have a cozy twosome with a wanted killer and forget to let homicide know about it? Or am I wrong? Did you tell Mike to tip us off? Mike? No, sir. Rain. That was all my idea. You see, first I read Mr. Mayo's letter to Blue Gardini in the paper. Then last night I see him come in here with some dame. It's 3 a.m. And then here they are again now. So I begin to figure, see? I add up. Then I go to the phone. <laughs> Pretty good detective work, huh, Mr. Mayo? Maybe you'll do a story about me, huh? Yeah. An obituary, I hope. Some headline, eh, Case? Yeah. Paper, mister? 
No. Beautiful killer caught by columnist. Go on, beat it. Oh, what's wrong with you, buddy? Yeah, that's a good point. She can't mean that much to you. She might have. Let's go in this drugstore a minute. I need an aspirin. Long time since you've needed aspirin because of some dame. Will you shut up about her? Okay. Now, listen. Hmm? That's music. What about it? You heard canned music before? They pipe the stuff into half the stores in town. Oh, yeah. When we first checked over Preble's apartment, you turned on his phonograph. You played this record. Huh? Yeah, that's right. The cleaning woman said that was the record on the phonograph when she found the body. Well? Well, don't you see? It isn't the same record that was playing when Nora blacked out. Come on, Al. Let's forget about the aspirin. Now, do you see what I mean, Captain? No, I don't. You drag me up here to Preble's apartment, you play his phonograph and say, this is the wrong record, but where's the proof? Nora's the proof. She said she heard only one piece of music played here, and that was a blue gardenia. Casey, she's confessed. I've got the evidence to convict her. I'm happy. Captain, a woman's life is involved. We can't let her go to the chair because of a wrong piece of music. All right. Where do we go from here? Where? Take a look at the label on this record. What? See where it was bought? Melrose Music Shop. <laughs> Uh, we hope so. Uh, did you ever hear of Harry Preble? Well, who hasn't? A good customer of ours. <laughs> oh, was. You know anything about this album of records he bought here? Police? Mm-hmm. The Haynes Homicide. Oh. Well, Miss Miller handled Mr. Preble's account. Just a second. Uh, Rose, can you come up front, please? I'm unpacking that new ship for Mrs. Miller. Well, let it go. There are some policemen here to see you. Police? The police. It's about Preble. I'm afraid, Casey, this is just a wild goose chase. We're not going to learn anything here. Okay, so we keep trying. Oh. oh, wait a minute. What was that? It came from out back. Come on. Yeah. Rose. Rose. Hold on, where's the washroom? Uh, that door right there. Uh, uh, Rose. Uh, Mr. Smith, you better call an ambulance. A police ambulance. Uh, yes, sir. I want to die. I want to die. No, you don't, Miss Miller. You want to get those cuts bandaged, and then when you feel better... No. I want to be with Harry. Harry Preble? Yes. You were in love with him? Yes. I knew I didn't have a chance with all his other women. When he walked out, I crawled after him. Then that night I went to his apartment. I still had the keys. I walked in and found him with that... with that woman. You mean Nora Larkin? Yes. She was passed out on the floor and Harry was holding the fire poker. He said they'd been fighting. I told Harry he had to take me back. He said he would, but all the time he was pushing me toward the door. I knew he wanted to be alone with her. I grabbed the poker away from him and then with all my might... Miss Miller... Now, Miss Miller, I'm Casey Mayo of the Chronicle. I wrote a letter to you on the front page of the paper. Maybe you read it. Yes. I promise to help you to be your friend. That promise still goes. On your call to Providence, Rhode Island, sir, to P.O. Baker, there will be a short delay. Hello, operator. Yes, Yes, sir. I'd like to place a person-to-person call, please. Oh, you? Very cute, Mr. Mayo. Gee, we thought you were still out in the Pacific watching all those H-bomb tears. My plane got in this morning. Now, uh, how about my person-to-person call? Oh. Would you repeat the name of your party, sir? Miss Nora Larkin. Thank you, sir. I'll try to... Operator. Yes, ma'am. Will you please tell your party that Miss Larkin is not ready to talk yet? Then would you please leave a message, operator? Yes, sir. Say that Mr. Casey Mayo deeply regrets certain mistakes he made in the past. 
You'd like another chance. Another chance? Boy, if you only knew... Sally. Well, I heard you the other night. Operator. <laughs> yeah? Please tell your party that Miss Larkin is not free to talk now. But she suggests an appointment. Call later. Tonight? Seven o'clock. Dinner? Of course. Mr. Mayo? Yes. Maybe a human interest story? Uh-huh. Very human and very interesting. Read all about it in the Evening Chronicle. In a moment, our stars will return. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Louis Cass knew how important friendship is. In 1836, he resigned as Secretary of War to accept the post of Ambassador to France. It wasn't too long after his arrival there that he became friends with King Louis Philippe. But making friends with the French people was another story. Anti American propaganda had been too well planted over the years. But one day, Cass witnessed a street fight. With the appearance of armed troops, the fighters fled, leaving a group of bystanders about to be fired on. Stepping out in front of them, Cass told the commanding officer that he, as well as the Frenchmen with him, were innocent spectators and that to fire on them would be murder. The officer apologized and ordered his men to put up their guns. The incident marked the beginning of Louis Cass's friendship with the French people. Gradually, despite the attempted smears by other nations, Cass strengthened the understanding between his country and France, and he was eventually responsible for the signing of a treaty by America, France, and England, a treaty which guaranteed freedom of the seas to all nations. Once more, an American had proved to the world that by helping others... You help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And they're coming forward for a bow. Dana Andrews and Ruth Roman. <laughs> now I know you must have a hit for next week, Irving. Isn't it another of your 20 great... Yes, one of our greatest war pictures. The story of the foot soldier of World War II. Battleground. Winner of the Photoplay Gold Medal Award for Metro Goldwyn Mayor and a stirring tribute to our fighting men. And as our stars, we'll have that fine actor and first citizen of Hollywood, George Murphy, and one of our most talented and popular artists, Van Johnson. An excellent choice, Irving. Good night. Night. Good night, and do hurry back. Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Blue Memorandum, starring Lionel Barrymore. Ricardo Montalban is your host.
more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Here is your family theater host for tonight, Ricardo Montalban. We as parents sometimes think we can measure the happiness and security of our homes by the amount we spend on food or housing or clothing or even by what we can spend on fun. (laughs) No, it isn't how much we spend on our homes that determines the happiness of our families. It's how much we give of ourselves, what we give our children of the true values of life. These are the things that make a real happy home. And the greatest gift we can give our children is an understanding of the important and powerful part that our faith and trust in God play in our own lives. The best inspiration and example we can give them is the simple and sincere expression of that faith by the daily practice of family prayer. Family prayer is a sure way to happiness, security and peace in most vital and wonderful way because it's God's way. Now, the Family Theater presentation of Blue Memorandum, starring Lionel Barrymore. Now take words, for instance. Consider their inflection, their enunciation. A few simple words like, good night. Maybe it was the way J.J. Rowland said, good night, that accounts for it. Lemon, J.J.? Yeah. You were saying something about Johnson. Johnson's the fourth chauffeur I've had in three months. Yes. And he's the most abominable one of the lot. Fire him, darling. I've already fired him. Good for you. He ran me into the thickest, foulest traffic I've ever seen. No excuse for it. I told Johnson, I told him exactly, explicitly, Route 57 was a bottleneck. You'd think the dunce would learn. Twenty minutes completely wasted in a crawling mass. Stupidity. Crass and stubborn stupidity. And how about the contract, Doc? Oh, I swung the contract personally. Good for you. I don't know what I'm paying those monkeys for down the office. Who is it now, darling? Bibbins. Bibbins? Edward J. Bibbins, my general manager. Fire him, darling. Bibbins tried to advise me on pig iron. Wouldn't you know? (laughs) Tried to tell me I shouldn't pull a pig iron deal under the present market trend. You showed him, J.J. (laughs) Pig ironed him. (laughs) Trying to tell me about market trends. Bibbins must be a dolt. I don't know where he studied business administration, but if brains were altitude, that boob's ten miles below sea level. You made him see your point, though. Listen, Ethel. When J.J. Rawlins says do, it's done. Good for you, darling. Where's Millicent? She's getting dressed. There's a birthday party. Oh, here she comes now. Oh. Good evening, Millicent. Good evening, Dad. Good evening, Mother. Uh, did you study your French today, Millicent? No, Dad. Why not? It's that new tutor, dear. She's incompetent. I'll get another tutor. We've had seven tutors this past year. I got a better idea. Send Millicent to that bobolink on Bampton College. But it's so far away, J.J. Well, only 200 miles, a few hours' trip. Darling, would you like to go to bobolink on Bampton? Well, I don't know, Mother. I was hoping to stay near home this year. Oh, it's a lovely school, Millicent. A very, very lovely college. Oh, really? I don't want to go away, Mother. What did you say? Are you questioning my decision? Oh, it's not that, Jay. It's just that she is a bit young to send away to college. She's only 17. I don't care if she's 70. Millicent? Yes, Dad? You're not a child anymore. You understand that. Oh, Daddy, I was only trying to say that... And you want to grow to be a lady someday? You want to make me proud of you, don't you? Yes, Dad. All right, then. Go to Bobolink on Bampton like a good girl and learn how to speak French. Mother and I'll have you home for your birthday. (laughs) Now, you like that, won't you? Yes, Dad. Yes, girl. Now, you better run along. Oh, 
Dad? Yeah? I'd like to go to Mary Scott's birthday party. Eddie Oliver promised to take me, and if it's all right with you... Now, Millicent. I'm not saying that recreation isn't necessary. It's good. It has its place. But wasting time and a lot of parties is a different matter. But, Dad, I haven't been to a party in three months. Please, please, Millicent. It pains me to see you so headstrong when I say that you, a girl of your position, you, your background, rearing, and uh, training, when I tell you that it's a complete waste of time to be running around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry to parties, I expect to be listened to. You understand? Yes, Dad. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you'd better go to your room, Millicent. All right. Good night, Dad. Good night, good night, good night. <laughs> Yes, maybe it was the way J.J. said good night that accounts for it. And consider two other words, happy birthday. Maybe it was the way J.J. said happy birthday that accounts for it. <coughs> Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down, Bibbins. Gentlemen, I call this conference to remind you that we're supposed to be running an organization. At least I was always under the impression that J.J. Rawlins, Incorporated, was supposed to be an organization. Now, Bibbins. Uh, yes, sir? Bibbins. <clears throat> In my absence, I've been made to understand that the gentleman of the board commissioned you to close the Eddington contract. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. It was imperative that we get the plant One before... moment, please, one moment. You purchased the plant. As your representative, yes, sir. On whose appraisal? Why, uh... On the regular licensed appraisers. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. I'm employing you to tell me what the licensed appraisers tell everybody else. Yes, but Mr. Rollins, under the circumstances, acting as I did as your purchasing agent, the only logical routine was Routine? To... Don't talk to me about routine, Bibbins. I appraise that plant. I, personally. I made it my business. You signed the papers for $40,000. Yes, sir. That plan's not worth 40000 Mr. Rollins, the licensed appraiser... I, I don't give a tinker's toot about your licensed appraisers. You, Bibbins, you sold me down the river for at least $4,000. Mr. Rollins, and gentlemen of the board, it may be that I've made a mistake. I'm merely trying to be, and I believe I have been, a competent manager in this. Uh, I didn't ask for a speech, Bibbins. But well, excuse me, sir. We were discussing that Eddington contract. I was coming to that. Mm. Now, as for this contract, I wish to say only this. I consulted the best real estate brains. I even went to the trouble to investigate six prior bank estimates. In my opinion, sir, 40000 was the fair and equitable disposition. Is that all you got to say, Bibbins? Yes, sir. All right. Now I'm telling you something. That deal doesn't go. But the contract is signed. I'll sir. handle that contract, Bibbins. Well, the courts can be pretty strict. Never about... mind the courts. Another thing, Bibbins. Yes, sir. One more mistake like that and you'll be getting a memorandum. Yes, sir. You won't be the first. And you probably won't be the last to get a blue slip. I see, sir. A blue... That's blue. all, gentlemen. You were late tonight, darling. Oh, that new show was worse than Johnson. Fathead can't read. Mint sauce with your lamb, darling. Yeah. Another hard day at the office, I suppose. Oh, so, 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 so. I finally gave that parasite a going over. That Bibbins creature? <laughs> yeah. Good for you. <laughs> it's about time that you brought him to his senses, dear. I don't know why you tolerate such... We tried to put on a sister act, too. He Some did? Sister. Yeah. Wouldn't you know? He said I was unfair. The insolence. J.J., why do you stand for it? Ah, I told him off. Don't worry. I said to him, Bibbins... Like, wait, wait till you hear this, Ethel. It was inspired. I said, Bibbins, as far as I'm concerned, you've been nothing but an embolism in the artery of progress. Touche. <laughs> Touche, darling. <laughs> yeah, stopped him cold. Oh, you should have seen his face. It floored him. <laughs> for the count. I think that's so cute. <laughs> embolism in the artery of progress. <laughs> J.J., you're a demon. <laughs> then I straightened out that little contract detail, too. Uh, the Eddington plant I was telling you about. 
You're buying it? Oh, sure, I'm buying it. Yeah, but not for 40000 They thought they could scare me with the lawyers. Oh, high pressure stuff. Yeah, can you beat it? The cheap. But I told them, when J.J. gets on the phone, they come to terms, and they come to terms fast. They saw your point. They had my point. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I could break that Eddington outfit tomorrow morning if I wanted to. Wouldn't you think they'd learn? Ah, human nature, Ethel, human nature. But you'd think that people would... People! As old Jay Sr. used to put it, what can you expect from a pig but a grunt? <laughs> people. Oh, but by the way, it's Millicent's birthday. Oh, so? How old is she now? Seventeen. I thought it would be nice if we had her home for the entire weekend. Oh, good, good. Where is she now? Upstairs, resting. Hmm. I'll have Frida tell her to come down. Yeah. Yes, madam? Me listen, Frida. Yes, madam. So who cooked this lamb? Elsie. Elsie? She came yesterday. A Green Star Agency recommendation. What's the matter with her? I don't know, darling. I... You know how it is with the help these days. Well, there is no excuse for a piece of meat like this. The stuff tastes as if it was basted with arsenic. I, I did think it was a little on the dry side. Get rid of her. See if you can't get a little civilization into that kitchen for a change. Get a mix master. I've got enough worry to the office without coming home with something like this. Uh, th there's some ham in the refrigerator. Ah, I hate ham, Ethel. Now, you know that. Hello, Dad. I didn't know you were home. Oh, good evening, Millicent. Well, you look quite the student. Wearing glasses now? Jay, it's her birthday. Wish her a happy birthday. Uh, uh, happy birthday, Millicent. Thank you, Dad. And thanks also for the beautiful fur coat. Fur coat? What? The fur... coat you bought her, Jay. Oh, oh, yes, 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 the fur coat. It's mm. a beautiful coat, Jay. Mm. A cute mink. Mm. Got it at Bond Taylor's. Fine, fine, good. Yeah, you, you needed the fur coat, Millicent. Oh, really, Dad? It's the most beautiful coat I've ever seen. Good, splendid. But, well, uh, how is school coming, Millicent? Okay, Dad. You put in a good day at the books? Well, today... I mean, Mother told me to... Her birthday, Jay. Yeah. Oh. We thought we might have a little celebration, didn't we, Millicent? And we're going to have a party tonight, Dad. Huh. Oh, wait, I'll bring in the birthday cake and let you see how lovely the frosting that's looks. That's all right, that's all right, Millicent. That's all right now. Don't bother. As a matter of fact, I, I, I won't be here tonight. Oh. <laughs> uh, got to look after a deal upstate. I see, Dad. Uh, run along now and enjoy yourself. Yes, Dad. Good night. Happy birthday, darling. Wish you a happy birthday, Jay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Millicent. Yes, maybe it was the way he said happy birthday that accounts for it. Maybe. Or maybe it was that inflection in his voice when J.J. said, Bibbins. Bibbins! You bought 12 plywood monstrosities billed at $1,240. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Rollins. I think I know a good desk when I see one. And I can tell you that these are genuine white mountain... I don't care if they're genuine Pike's Peaks. Your responsibility around here, General Manager, is to see that we function as a going concern instead of subsidizing a lumber yard to the tune of $1,240. All right. All right. This is just another example of your incompetence. Mr. Rollins, I've worked for you for over two years. In that time, to the best of my knowledge, I, I've done a good job. Mm. If at any time I've consciously, deliberately failed to carry out your... Well, we're talking about desks, Bibbins. I didn't ask for a backlog on your life. Well, as for the desks, I bought them. I installed them. If you don't approve them, that's your privilege. All I'm trying to say is... That you can't get good desks any cheaper. I can't, can't I? Well, Bibbins, let me tell you something. First of all, those desks are going out of here tonight. Tonight? Tonight. And another thing, Bibbins, I want to teach you one more lesson in the art of business administration. Take a good look at your own desk tonight, Bibbins. Maybe you'll find something there that'll interest you. Is that all, sir? That's all, Bibbins. Did you have a hard day, JJ? Oh, routine, routine, routine. I got rid of that boob at last. You mean that horrible bookkeeper you were telling me about? No, 
Bibbins. I fired him. Well, I should say it's about time you asserted yourself, darling. I told him. I suppose he tried to raise the usual objections. What objections could he raise? Oh, how do you do it, darling? <laughs> Simple. Slap him with a memorandum and sign it J.J. Rollins. <laughs> <laughs> the wheels turn when they see that blue flip. <laughs> oh, J.J. J.J., you're marvelous. Really, you are. <laughs> yes, when J.J. says do, it's done. Want me to take it, darling? No, no, I'll get it, I'll get it. Yep. J.J. Rollins. Speaking. Can you locate some ready cash? Ready cash? Right. Cash in a hurry. Who talking? I'm asking you the questions. Can you locate some ready cash? I don't like your tone, mister. Well, you're going to like my tone, Rollins. You're going to like it with no questions asked. I want cash, and I want it in a hurry. Hey, look here. What are you trying You've to do? You've got a daughter, haven't you? Yes, I have. Well, she's up... Uh, she's supposed to be up at some fancy college. Uh, Barber Link on Bampton. Yes, I sent her there. Oh, 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 now wait a minute. Now you're getting the idea, Rob. Do you mean to say I didn't you... say anything. Where's my daughter? Where is she? I'll ask the questions you understand. I warn you, if anything's happening... I have also done the talking runners. Now get this straight. Don't you make any phone calls. I want no monkey shines. You follow my orders. I want forty thousand dollars in a paper bag, a brown paper bag, and I want you. What did they say? No trace bird, Bobbling. She's been missing since this afternoon. The fools! What do they think I'm paying them for? Oh, they let her go off any time she wants to. Jay. What do we do? Shut up! Let me think. No. Mr. Rawlings? Yeah? Mrs. Phillips of Bobberlink speaking. Well, what about my daughter? I'm frightfully upset, Mr. Rawlings. We've continued to check all possible sources of information. Yes, 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 yes. What'd you find out? We have another witness, one of our girls here at Bobberlink, who claims she saw Millicent enter an automobile this afternoon. She got into a car this afternoon? A blue or a black sedan. As for other details... Well, whose car was it? That we don't know. Ah. But we are continuing to check all possible... Uh, there you are. Missing for hours and nobody knows anything. Nobody reports anything. I can't stand this much longer, Jay. I'll sue that college. I'll drag him into court just as sure... Hello. Hello. Rollins. Oh, it's you. About that 40,000. Where's my daughter? Don't ask questions, Rollins. I'll do the talking. What do you want? I want you to make it 50,000. But you can't... I said 50,000, you understand? If anything has happened to my daughter, I'll... Easy, mister. Talk like that can make a fellow nervous. All right, all right, all right now. All right, what do you want? I want 50,000, I just told you. All right. And I want it in a manila envelope. You said a brown paper... Follow instructions. I said a manila envelope. Do you understand? Yes, 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 yes. I'll do anything you want. Only tell me. Tell me where my daughter is. Where is she? What's happened? Quiet, Robert. I can't afford to waste any time on this phone. Yes, sir, yes. Right now, I don't want you to do anything except get that manila envelope ready. All right. And I want you to wait until you hear from me again. Yes, yes. Did you do what I told you, Rollins? Yes, yes, yes. Where where do you want me to deliver? Everything's on the up and up. Yes, yes, I'll pay you anything, anything. Only get my daughter here. You'll get final instructions at 7 o'clock tonight. All right, all right. Please, mister, give me a break, will you? My wife, my daughter. But, oh, wait a minute. Please don't hang up now. 7 o'clock. What did he say, Jay? 7 o'clock. We've got to wait till 7. <laughs> Five minutes past seven. Why doesn't he call? I got everything ready. Money, the envelope. Why doesn't the phone ring? What's the matter, Jay? What's holding him? He said seven. I don't know. I don't know. Ethel. Oh, please don't keep asking me questions. I don't know what... I don't know where I am. Stop bothering me, will but you? But he said seven. Seven o'clock and it's eight minutes past. Will you be patient? You just sit there and be quiet. We have to wait, that's all. We have, just have to wait. Further instructions. That's what he said. Maybe we'll have to wait another 50 or 60 minutes. Maybe another 50 or 60 days. I don't know. I wish you'd do something. It's waiting. I'm doing everything I can. All I can do is follow orders. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, Ethel. Oh, I don't know what I'm thinking. That 
phone. Why doesn't it ring? The door, Jay. Yes, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. Simon, just a minute, just a minute. This jaw lock. Oh, it's you, Millicent. Hello, Dad. Oh, Millicent, my baby. Oh, what are you crying for, my You all right, Millicent? You all right, aren't you? You're not hurt? The man didn't... That, that, that man who drove you here, where is he? He just drove away in his car. He didn't want to come in. Well, who is he? What's his name? Oh, I can never remember his name, and I didn't like to ask him. But you know him. Daddy works for you. Works for me? What's he look like? Oh, middle-aged, thick glasses, and sort of bald. Wait a minute. Wait. Thick glasses, and a slight scar along his chin? Yes, that's the man. Bibbins. He's one of the nicest men I've ever met, Dad. Why, that... That criminal? I'll have the police. Just a second, please, Jay. You say Mr. Bibbins took you away from Bobberlink this afternoon. Well, he didn't take me exactly. He drove by the college this afternoon and asked me to hop into his car. He said you wanted to see me because there was a big surprise at home. Millicent, how could you? Oh, but Mother, he was always so kind to me at Dad's office. I'll have that moron in jail in less than 24 hours. Help me. I'll get the police. What in the world is the trouble, Dad? Do you know that you have almost been the death of your father, Millicent? Oh, Mother, I'm trying to tell you. I merely thought that... Didn't you have sense enough to see through, Mr. Biffins? I don't know what you mean. You sat there in the car and let him take you. A, a, a man who was almost a stranger, you let him take you wherever he wanted to go. Oh, Dad, please believe me. Mr. Bibbins is a kind man. I know he's kind. I knew he was taking me home. Didn't you expect me? Maybe he does have a peculiar sense of humor. He gave me this for you. What is it? It's a note. Some kind of message. For me? Mr. Bibbin said I should give it to him. What is it, J.J.? It's a memorandum. Read it. It says, uh, there wouldn't be any use telling my name. You wouldn't want to remember me anyway. You wouldn't want to remember me anyway. I happen to be only another number in your files. That's about all any of us were, J.J. Just numbers in your files. You remembered only numbers. I don't think you ever really got to know people. The fellows and the girls who worked with you and for you. Looking back over all the weeks, the months that I spent in your employ, I can say this now. The office was swell, J.J., the workers, the fellows and the girls in the office, they were friendly, kind, a great gang. And the wages were good. There's no kick there. It was only you, J.J. You're a man of distinction, your friend said. But you ranted and bullied, J.J. Oh, sure, I took orders. When you have a wife and kids to support, when you have bills to pay and a house to keep going, you learn how to take orders, your kind of orders. And then... And then you... You broke me with a blue slip. A blue memorandum. My services were no longer required. Okay. Okay, J.J. Now I'm giving you a memorandum. I had my innings, too, for a few hours today. I had you taking orders, and you took them, and why? Because for the first time in your life, you had something else besides numbers to worry about. Your daughter's a sweet girl, J.J. I hope you never stick that kid in the miscellaneous fire. And I hope you remember this. Numbers don't sweat and bleed and cry for you. People, people do those things. People. And this is my memorandum to you. This is my memorandum to you. P.S. Give my love to Millicent. <laughs> you like the way I tell a story, Milton? That's the funniest story I've heard in years, Dad. <laughs> yeah, you're marvelous. You're a genius. Uh, speaking of geniuses, Ethel, I must tell you about my special genius. Splendid worker. Magnificent instincts. Who is he, darling? Bibbins. Oh, uh, he's back again. Of course he's back again. When J.J. says come, they come. Bibbins is the swellest guy, Dad. <laughs> oh, good old Bibbins. Yeah.
Yes, maybe it was the inflection of J.J.'s voice when he said, Bibbins, that accounts for it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am not posing as an authority on human relations when I say there is a nice capacity in people for being kind. It's a virtue, really. It means being helpful and considerate. In the truest sense of the word, it is actually loving our neighbor. And that's important. It's fundamental elementary procedure, as J.J. would put it. And it's the procedure that J.J. forgot for a time. You know, we'll never be able to solve the real problems until we stop talking about numbers, about majorities and minorities. We'll never solve our domestic, social, even economic problems until we get away from numbers and get back to flesh and blood, back to people. Our country takes in just about everybody. It takes in all the segments of the land, high and low, rich and poor, capital and labor, all one family. To work together, all of us, as one big family, should be our ideal. And there is no better way to reach these ideals than to work together and pray together. To pray not only as individuals, but as a family. It's important, family prayer. For families that pray together, stay together. Before saying good night, I would like to thank Lionel Barrymore for his performance as J.J. Our thanks to Timothy Mulvey for writing tonight's play and to Max Turr for his music. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Lila Webb, Howard McNear, Barbara Fuller, and Nancy Shields. Next week, our Family Theater star will be Mark Stevens in The Hound of Heaven. Your hostess will be John Caulfield. This is Ricardo Montalban saying good night and God bless you. This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt a need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by a friend of the New York Foundling Hospital which cares for homeless and motherless babies without distinction of race, creed, or color. Join us next week at the same time when our Family Theater star will be Mark Stevens. Joan Caulfield will be your hostess. Tony Lafrano speaking. Remember, next Sunday, September 28th, daylight saving ends for this year. For those of you who are on standard time, Family Theater will come to you one hour later. For exact time in your community, consult your mutual station or newspaper radio listing. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mr. Burns Mantle. To follow Barry's Peter Pan with Maeterlinck's The Blue Bird is to follow one children's classic with another. In a series of great plays designed to entertain and inform the whole family, that seemed the wise thing to do. Maeterlinck, whom you probably have seen referred to as the Belgian mystic, or perhaps as the Belgian Shakespeare, is not the Barry type of dreamer at all. The Belgian is much more profound. But when he is dealing with a fairy story adventure told by children, as he is in the Blue Bird, he too can be simple and direct and altogether charming. Metterlink is another of the world's great dramatists who came to the theater after he had studied law. He was in his late twenties when he took to writing. Born in Ghent, Belgium, 77 years ago of Flemish ancestry, he naturally inherited a vast respect for the mysticism of the Middle Ages. His schooling was religious and his bent poetic. From the first he preferred to work with symbols, exciting the imagination by giving body and soul to thoughts and moods. A little puzzling to you and to me, perhaps, but quite simple to the true Metterlinkians. In The Blue Bird, he is telling the story of two dreaming children who, with the aid of a fairy god's diamond, 
brought the whole world to life, including the food they ate and the light by which they saw that world. The cat, who was not to be trusted, and the dog, who was just naturally a great friend of man, were their intimates. Maeterlinck did not care greatly for the conventions of the theater and not at all for the average play of commerce. His thought was deeper than that. Once he wrote, I have come to believe that an old man seated in his armchair, waiting patiently, interpreting without comprehending, submitting with bent head to the presence of his soul and his destiny, does yet live in reality a deeper, more human and more universal life than the lover who strangles his mistress, the captain who conquers in battle, or the husband who avenges his honor. Metterlink the mystic has been content to let those who would worry about what his meanings might be. He knows, and a large number of his followers have pretended to know, and he is content. He has written some of the most beautiful passages known to the drama. In one way, he is the perfect dramatist for radio. In our armchair playhouse, we don't have to worry about the scenery or pretend that we recognize all the strange people and scenes paraded on the stage. We can sit back, close our eyes, and let our imaginations fill in the pictures more beautifully. It isn't hard to visit the land of memory or the realm of night or the kingdom of the future in this playhouse. So now we start with the woodcutter's little boy and girl in a search for the bluebird of happiness. Mittle and Tittle are their names. As our fairy story begins, they seem to have just awakened from a sound sleep. Mittle, Tiltil, are you asleep? Are you? No, how can I be asleep when I'm talking to you? Say, is this Christmas Day? Not yet, not until tomorrow. But Father Christmas won't bring us anything this year. Why not? I heard Mommy say that she couldn't go to town to tell him. But he'll come next year. Is next year far off? Good long while. But he'll come to the rich children tonight. Really? Uh-huh. Hello, Mommy's forgotten to put out the lamp. Hey, I have an idea. What? Let's get up. Oh, but we mustn't. Well, there's no one about. Do you see the shutters? Oh, how bright they are. It's the lights of the party. What party? The rich children opposite. It's the Christmas tree. Let's open the shutters. Can we? Of course, there's no one to stop us. Do you hear the music? Let's get up. We can see everything from this window. I see the tree. What tree? Why, the Christmas tree. Oh, I say, what lots and lots of lights. What are those people doing who are making such a noise? They're the musicians. Are they angry? No, but it's hard work. A and what's that all around the table? Cakes and fruit and tarts. I had some once when I was little. So did I. It's nicer than bread, but they don't give you enough. What's that? It's Daddy. Or the bird that is blue. We have some grass, but it can't sing. Tilto has a bird. But I can't give it away. Why not? Because it's mine. Well, that's a reason, no doubt. Where is the bird? In the cage. I don't want it. It's not blue enough. You'll have to go and find me the one I want. But I don't know where it is. No more do I. That's why you must look for it. I must absolutely have the blue bird. It's for my little girl who's very ill. What's the matter with her? We don't quite know. She wants to be happy. Really? Do you know who I am? Well... You're rather like our neighbor, Madame Berlingo. Not a bit. There's not the least likeness. This is intolerable. I'm the fairy berry loon. Oh, very well. You will have to start at once. Are you coming with us? I can't because I put on the soup this morning and it always boils over if I leave it. Will you go out through the ceiling, up the chimney, or by the window? Well, I'd rather go out the door. That's quite impossible and it's a shocking habit. We'll go out through the window. Well, what are you waiting for? Get dressed at once. I'll help Mittel. Oh, we have no shoes. That doesn't matter. I'll give you a little magic hat. Where are your father and mother? They're asleep in there. And your grandpapa and grandmama? They're dead. Would you like to see them again? Oh, yes, at once. Show them to us. I haven't got them in my pocket. But this is very lucky. You will see them when you go through the land of memory. It's on the way to the bluebird, just on the left, past the third turning. What were you doing when I knocked? We were playing at eating cakes. Have you any cakes? What are they? In the house with the rich children. Come and look, it's so lovely. It's no more beautiful there than here. Oh, it's darker here and smaller, and there are no cakes. It's exactly the same, only you can't see. Yes, I can, and I have very good eyes. I can see the time on the church clock, and Daddy can. I tell you that you can't see. How do you see me? Perhaps you'll say I have a hump. Oh, no, no. It's not a big one. Oh, yes, to look at you, anyone would think it's enormous. Have I a hooked nose, and have I lost one of my eyes? No, I don't say that. Who put it out? But it's not out, you wretched, impudent boy. It's much finer than the other. Human beings are very odd. Since the death of the fairies, they see nothing at all, and they never suspect it. Now, what am I taking out of my bag? Oh, it's a little green hat. 
What's that shining in the cockade? That's the big diamond that makes people see. Really? Yes. When you've got the hat on your head, you turn the diamond a little, like this. Do you see? It opens your eyes at once, and you see even the inside of things. The soul of bread, of wine, of pepper. Can you see the soul of sugar, too? Of course you can. I hate unnecessary questions. Oh, oh, I was almost forgetting. Uh, when you hold the diamond like this, do you see? Mm -hmm. One little turn more, and you behold the past. Another little turn, and you behold the future. Oh, oh but Daddy will take it from me. He won't see it. No one can see it as long as it's on your head. Will you try it? Uh -huh. Now, turn the diamond. <laughs> Who are all those pretty ladies coming out of the clock? Don't be afraid. They are the hours of your life, and they're glad to be free and visible for a moment. <laughs> Who's that big red fellow with a nasty smell? Shh, don't speak too loud. That's fire. He's dangerous. <laughs> good morning, good morning, my dear little god. At last, at last, we can talk. Bark and wag my tail as I might, you never understood. But now, good morning, good morning. I love you. Shall I do some of my tricks? Would you like to see me walk on my front paws and dance on my hind legs? Who is this gentleman with the dog's head? Don't you see? It's the soul of Tylo, whom you've set free. Good morning, miss. How well you look this morning. Good morning, sir. Who is it? Why, don't you see? It's the soul of Tillette, your cat, offering you his hand. Kiss him. Me too. I've kissed the little guard. I've kissed the little girl. I've kissed everybody. Oh, what fun we shall have. I'm going to frighten Tillette. Sir, I don't know you. Keep still, will you? Or else you'll go back into silence until the end of time. And who's that wet lady? Don't be afraid. It's water just come from the tap. A sweet good day to you, little miss. What does he want? Why, he is the soul of sugar. Has he any barley sugar? His pockets are full of it, and each of his fingers is a sugar stick. It's the queen. She broke the lamp. It's the blessed virgin. No, my children. It's light. Oh, that's Daddy. He's heard us. Turn the diamond from left to right. Oh, not so quick. Oh, heavens, it's too late. You turned it too briskly. They will not have time to resume their places, and we shall have a lot of annoyance. <laughs> What's the matter, Bread? There's no room in the van. My little god, I am still here. I can still talk. I can still kiss you. Once more, once more, once more. What, you too? Are you there still? What luck. I was too late to return to silence. What is going to happen? Is there any danger? Well, I'm bound to tell you the truth. All those who accompany the two children will die at the end of the journey. Oh, come, come, let us go back. No, 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 I won't. I want to go with the little god. I want to talk to him all the time. Idiot. <laughs> to die at the end of the journey. I want to get back at once into my bag. Oh, I can't find my chimney. I can't get into the tent. I burst my packing paper. Oh, goodness me, what fools they are. Fools and cowards, too. So you would rather go on living in your ugly boxes, in your taps, than accompany the children in search of the bird? Yes, yes, yes. My, 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 my chimney. And you, Light. What do you say? I will go with the children. I, too. I, too. That's right. Besides, it's too late to go back. You have no choice now. You must all start with us. But you, Fire, don't come near anybody. You, Dog, don't tease the cat. And you, Water, hold yourself up and try not to run all over the place. There's Daddy again. He's getting up this time. I can hear him walking. Let us go out by the window. You shall all come to my palace where I will dress the animals and the things properly. You, Bread, take the cage in which to put the bluebird. It will be in your charge. Quick, quick, let us waste no time. <laughs> This way, I know every inch of the fairy's palace. Let us make the most of our last minute of liberty while the children and light pay their visit to the fairy's little daughter. Now, I have brought you here in order to discuss the position in which we are placed. Are we all here? I see the dog coming out of the fairy's wardrobe. What on earth has he got on? He has put on the livery of one of the footmen of Cinderella's coach. It was just the thing for him. He has the soul of a flunky. Strange how I mistrust him. He'd better not hear what I have to say to you. It's too late. He's discovered us. Look, here's water also coming out of the wardrobe. Goodness me, how fine she is. There, there. Aren't we fine? Just look at these laces and this embroidery. It's real gold and no mistake. That catskin's color of time dress, I seem to recognize it. Yes, this is the one that suited me best. Oh, she's not brought her umbrella. What's that? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, I thought you might be speaking of a great red nose I saw the other day. Oh, come, come, come. Don't let's quarrel. We have more important things to do. 
They're only waiting for bread. Where is he? He was making an endless fuss about choosing his dress. Worthwhile, isn't it, for a fellow who looks like a fool and carries an enormous stomach? At last, he decided in favor of a Turkish robe adorned with gems, a scimitar, and a turban. There he is. He has put on Bluebeard's finest dress. Well, 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 what do you think of this, eh? How nice he looks. What a fool he looks. How nice he looks. How nice he looks. Are the children dressed? Yes, but the great thing was the dressing of light. Why? The fairy thought her so lovely that she didn't want to dress her at all. Thereupon, I protested in the name of our dignity as a essential and eminently respectable elements. And I ended by declaring that under those conditions, I should refuse to be seen oh, with come, her. Come, 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 I... stop chattering. Our future is at stake. You've heard the fairy has just said that the end of the journey will mark the end of our lives. It is our business, therefore, to prolong it as much as possible. Here, here, the cat is right. Here. Now listen to me. All of us here present, animals, things, and elements possess a soul which man does not yet know. But if he finds the bluebird, he will know all, he will see all, and we shall be completely at his mercy. It is to our interest, therefore, at all costs, to prevent the finding of that bird, even if we have to go so far as to endanger the lives of the children themselves. What's the fellow saying? Just say that again, will you, to see if I heard right. Order, order. Who made you chairman? Hold your tongue, fire. What are you interfering with? I shall interfere where I choose, and I want none of your remarks. Uh, don't let's quarrel. This is a serious moment. I quite agree with Sugar and the cat. This is ridiculous. There is man, and that is all. We have to obey him and do as he tells us. Man forever, in life or death, all for man. Man is God. No, I quite agree with the dog. But at least give us your reasons. There are no reasons. I love man, and that is enough. Excuse me, let us not embitter the discussion. There is something to be said on both sides. Oh, I quite agree with Sugar. Are we not, all of us, water, fire, and you yourself, bread and the dog, the victims of a nameless tyranny? Oh, look out. I see fairy and light coming. Light has taken sides with man. She is our worst enemy. Baker, as you would me, and everyone to his post. I was ready for tomorrow's little bullet, the blue bullet. Are they there in the land of memory? You shall see them at once. But how can we see them when they're dead? How can they be dead when they live in your memory? Men do not know this secret because they know so little. We are about to see that the dead who are remembered live as happily as though they were not dead. Is light coming with us? No, it is more proper that this visit should be confined to the family. I appear indiscreet. They did not invite me. Which way are we to go? Over there. You are on the threshold of the land of memory. But don't forget that you're to be back, both of you, by half past eight. It's extremely important. Now mind and be puffed if you are late. Goodbye for the present. Come, cat, head dog, light bread. Come this way, and the little ones that way. Granddad and Granny sitting by their cottage. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have a notion our grandchildren who are still alive are coming to see us today. They are certainly thinking of us. Yes, 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 Granny, yes, 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 yes. Oh, what did I tell you? I was sure they would come Till, today. Till, Till, it's you. How are Daddy and Mummy Till? Quite well, Granny. They were asleep when we went out. <laughs> Why don't you come to see us oftener? Makes us so happy. We couldn't, Granny, and today it's only because of the fairy. Oh, you're always here waiting for a visit from those who are alive. Oh, they come so seldom. Last time you were here was on All Hallows, when the church bells were ringing. All Hallows? Mm -hmm. We didn't go out that day, for we both had very bad colds. No, 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 but, but you thought of us. Yes, well, every time you think of us, we wake up and see you again. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Is it nice here? Oh, yes, not bad, not bad. And if one could just have a smoke... Aren't you allowed to smoke? Oh, yes, it's allowed, but I have broken my pipe. Oh, you haven't changed, Granddad, not a bit. And Granny hasn't changed a bit either. Oh, but you're both better looking. Well, we feel all right. We have stopped growing older. <laughs> oh, nothing has changed. Everything is in its old place. Only everything is prettier. Oh, there's the clock with the big hand which I broke the point off of. And here's the old blackbird. Does he still sing? He's <laughs> blue. Why, well, that's the bird, the blue bird, which I'm to take back to the ferry. Oh, he's blue, blue, blue as a blue glass marble. Granddad, Granny... Will you give him to me? Yes, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, what do you think, Granny? Oh, certainly, certainly. I'll what put him in my cage. Us? How pleased the fairy will be, and light, too. Mind you, I won't answer for the bird. I'm afraid that he will never get used again to the restless life up there, and it will come back here by the first wind that blows this way. However, we shall see. Oh, what is that? I don't know, I'm sure. It must be the clock in the cottage. Oh, it can't be. It never strikes. Because we no longer think of the time. Was anyone thinking of the time? Yes, I was. What 
What is the time? I'm sure I can't tell. I've forgotten how. It struck eight times. So I suppose it's what they call eight o'clock up there. Well, I'd expect me at half past eight. It's because of the ferry. It's extremely important. Come on, Middle, we've only just got time. And goodness gracious, how tiresome the living are with all their business and excitement. Goodbye, Granddad. Goodbye, Granny. Oh, don't cry, Granny. We'll come back often. It's our only pleasure, and it's such a treat for us when your thoughts visit us. We have no other amusements. Oh, quick, quick, my cage, my bird. Here they are. You know, I, I don't want him, and if he's not the right color... Goodbye, goodbye. 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 Is this way, Middle? Where is light? I don't know. Oh, the bird is no longer blue. Look, he's turned black. Give me your hand, little brother. I feel so frightened and so cold. Who goes there in my palace of night? It is I, the cat mother night. I'm worn out. Why, what's the matter, child? You look pale and thin, and you're splashed with mud to your very whiskers. Oh, mother night, I've managed to escape for a moment to warn you, but I greatly fear there's nothing to be done. Why, what's the matter? I've told you, little Tilt Hill, the woodcutter's son and of the magic diamond. Well, he is coming here to demand the bluebird of you. He hasn't got it yet. He will have it soon, unless we perform some miracle. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I never have a moment's peace. I cannot understand man these last few years. Must he absolutely know everything? Oh, I know, Mother Night, I know. The, the times are hard and we are almost alone in our struggle against man, but I hear them coming. I see only one way. As they are children, we must give them such a fright that they will not dare to persist or to open the great door at the back, behind which they would find the birds of the moon. The secrets of the other caverns will be enough to distract their attention and to terrify them. Are there many of them? It is nothing. It is our friends, bread and sugar. Water is not very well, and fire could not come because he is related to light. The dog is the only one who is not on our side. But it is never possible to keep him away. Oh, this way, little master, this way. I have told Knight, who is delighted to see you. Uh, good day, Mrs. Knight. Good day. Huh, I'm not used to that. You might say good night, or at least uh, good evening. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I didn't know. But let's talk of something else. The cat tells me that you've come here to look for the bluebird. Yes, ma'am, if you'll allow me. Will you tell me where he is? I don't know, dear. All I can say is that he's not here. I have never seen him. Light told me that he was here, and Light knows what she's saying. Will you hand me your keys? But you must understand, my dear, that I cannot give my keys like that to the first comer. I have the keeping of all nature's secrets, and I'm absolutely forbidden to deliver them to anybody, especially to a child. You have no right to refuse them to man when he asks you for them. I know that. Who told you? Light. Light again. Always light. How dare she interfere? How dare she? Shall I take them from her by force, my little god? Hold your tongue, Tylo. Keep quiet and try to behave. Come, madam. Give me your keys, please. Well, have you the sign, at least? Behold, the diamond. Hmm. Well, then, here is the key that opens all the doors of the hall. But I will not be responsible. Uh, is it dangerous? Dangerous. All around the hall, in each of those basalt caves, are all the evils, all the plagues, all the sicknesses, and all the terrors that have afflicted life since the beginning of the world. You've seen what happens when one of them escapes and shows itself on Earth. Knight, permit me to ask you a question. Certainly. In case of danger, which is the way of escape? There is no way of escape. Now, let's begin here. What's behind this bronze door? I think it is the ghosts. It's long since I opened the door and since they came out. I'll see. Quick, quick, shut the door. They'll all escape and we'll never be able to catch them again. Help me catch them. Here, here. Help me, Tyler, help them. Here, yeah, this way goes. Open the door a little. There, there, that's it. And these two, come quick, in with you. You know you're only allowed out on all hollows. Well, what's behind this door? Open it if you like. It's the sicknesses. Must I be careful in opening? No, no, it's not worthwhile. They're very quiet, the poor little things. They're not happy. Man for some time has been waging such a determined war upon them. Open. You'll see. Don't they come out? Oh, they're all poorly and very much discouraged. The doctors are so unkind to them. The bluebird isn't there. Oh, they look very ill. Oh, look, there's a little one escaping. Which one is it? It's nothing. One of the smallest. It's cold in the head. 
It's one of those which are least persecuted and which enjoy the best of health. Come here, dear. It's too soon yet. You must wait for the winter. Let's look at this one. What's in here? Take care. It is the wars. Heaven knows what would happen if one of them escaped. I don't think that they have the bluebird. You may be sure they haven't. Well, have you had enough of it? It'll be worse presently if you go on. And behind this door, is this terrible also? No. No, there's a little of everything here. It is where I keep the unemployed stars, my personal perfumes, and the song of the nightingales. Just so. The stars, the song of the nightingales. This must be the door. Open if you like. There's nothing very bad inside. Oh, my pretty ladies. Those are my stars. And how well they dance. And how sweet they smell. And how beautifully the nightingales sing. What are those whom one can hardly see? Those are the perfumes of my shadow. But enough. It's the devil's own business to get them back once they begin to dance. Now, stars, quick, quick, quick. Come in with you. Come in or I will go and fetch a ray of sunlight. Here's the great middle door. Do not open that one. Why not? Because it's not allowed. And it's here that the bluebird is hidden. Light told me so. Listen to me, child, and believe me. Relinquish your quest. Go no further. Do not tempt fate. Don't open that door. But why? Because not one of those, do you hear? Not one of those who have opened it has ever returned alive to the light of day. <laughs> don't do it, don't, Master Deirdre. You're sacrificing don't the lives of all of us. I must open the door. Run please. for your lives. Come quickly. At don't least please. wait until we're at the end of the door. hall. Don't, 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 don't. I shall stay with my little god. I shall stay. Oh, that's right, Tyler. That's right. Kiss me. Oh, you and I are too. Now steady. Oh, heaven. What a beautiful garden of dreams. And they're here. We have them at last. Thousands of bluebirds. Millions. Come, Middle, come, Tylo, help me. You can catch them by handfuls. They aren't shy, they aren't afraid of us. Well, they fly into my hands. Oh, look, they're eating the moonbeams, Middle. Don't bite them, Tylo, don't hurt them. Take them very gently. I have caught seven already. Oh, how they flap their wings. I can't hold them. Nor can I. I have too many of them. Tylo has some, too. Quick, let's go out this way. Light is waiting for us. Oh, please, children. This way, this way. Come on, quick. Did they get him? The real bluebird. No, Mother Night, I see him up there on that moonbeam. They could not reach him. He kept too high. Uh. Well, have you caught him, Tiltil? Oh, yes, yes, light as many as we wanted. Here they are. Oh, they're dead. Yours too, Middle? Tallow's also? Oh, this is too bad. Who killed them? I'm too unhappy. Do not cry, my child. <laughs> you didn't catch the one that is able to live in broad daylight. He's gone elsewhere. But we shall find him again. <laughs> the trees and animals here present in the dark forest greeting this is a great day a day of days our enemy is coming to set free your energies and to deliver himself into your hands it is till till the son of the woodcutter who has done you trees so much harm he can compel us to hand over the bluebird and thenceforth we shall be definitely at man's mercy we must take the opportunity he must be done away with Yes, he is with his little sister. She must die, too. Light alone is on man's side, but she won't come. I made the children believe that they ought to steal away while she was asleep. There never was such an opportunity, but hush. Here they are. Is this the place? Ah, there you are, my little master. How well you look and how pretty this evening. I have brought together here in the forest the principal animals of the country. You can see them already among the foliage. Oh, but why have you brought the dog? I've told you, he is on the worst terms with everybody, even the trees. I... His odious presence will spoil... Ah! 
Ah, men, little men. That is the oak, leaving his palace. He has the... a hat. It is the oak. Who are you? I'm Tiltil, sir. When can I have the blue bird? Tiltil, the woodcutter's son. Yes, sir. Your father has done us much harm. In my family alone, he has put to death 600 of my sons and 12,000 great grandsons. I know nothing about it, sir. He didn't do it on purpose. What have you come here for? And why have you made our souls leave their abodes? I beg your pardon, sir, for disturbing you. The cat said that you would tell us where the bluebird was. Yes. I know that you are looking for the bluebird. That is to say, the great secret of things and of happiness, so that man may make our servitude still harder. Oh, no, sir. It's for the fairy berry loom's little girl who's very ill. Enough! Are all here present? You know, my brothers, the nature of our business. The child you see before you, thanks to the talisman stolen from the powers of Earth, is able to take possession of the bluebird, and thus to snatch from us the secret which we have kept since the origin of life. It is a serious moment. The child must be done away with before it is too late. What is he saying? Do you see my teeth, you old cripple? Oh, the dog is insulting the oak. Is that the dog? Drive him out. We must suffer no traitors among us. Send the dog away. Send him away as quickly as you can. Will you be off? It would be a good thing to chain him up, Tiltillo. He will commit some folly. The trees will be angry and all will end badly. What can I do? I've lost his leash. Well, here's the ivy just coming along with strong bonds. Cat, you're at the bottom of all this. You sneak, you tiger, you Judas. You see, he insults everybody. Yes, one can't hear oneself speak. Mr. Ivy, will you chain him up, please? Won't he bite? Come along, you old ball of twine, you. Come along and see. Tylo! What am I to do, my little god? Lie down flat. Obey the ivy. Let him bind you. Hangman's rope. Look, my little god. He, he's cutting my paws. He's choking me. I don't care. It's your own fault. Hold your tongue and be quiet. You're wrong for all that. They mean mischief. Take care, my little god. He, he's closing my mouth. I can't do... Where shall we put him? I've muscled him finally. He can't utter a word. Fasten him tight down there. Behind my trunk. To my big root. Is that done? Well, this is the first time that it is given to us to judge man and make him feel our power. Help! Help! Talo! Talo! Where's the cat? Talo! Tillet! Tillet! Come! I've strained my paw. Look at too many of them. Here! Talo. Here, my little Talo. dog. Don't be afraid. I know it through the ivy. Here! Here. There's one for you, bear, in your fat hands. Now then, who wants some more? Here, that's for the pig. Ow! That's the willow. She's broken my paw. Look out, it's the wolf! But help is coming. I heard them. I smell them. Where? Who? There, there, it's light. She's found us. Kiss me, my little king. We are saved. Look, they're retreating. They're afraid. Light, light, come quick. Hurry! What is it? What has happened? They've rebelled. They're all against us. But my poor boy, didn't you know? Turn the diamond. They will return into silence at once. There, you see? What was the matter with them? Were they mad? No, they're always like that. But we do not know it because we do not see it. I told you so before. It's dangerous to wake them when I am not there. Well, what for the dog and if I hadn't had my knife? I would never have believed that they were so wicked. You see that man is all alone against all this world. Are you very badly hurt, my little god? Oh, nothing serious. For middle, they haven't touched her. Oh, but you, my dear Tylo... Your mouth is all over blood and your paw is broken. It is not worth speaking of. It won't show tomorrow. But it was a tough fight. Oh, I should think so. Oh, the ox caught me a blow with his horns in the stomach and the oak broke my paw. I should like to know which one. My poor Tillette, did he really? Where were you? I didn't see you. Oh, Mittel, my dear, I was wounded at the first while attacking that horrid pig who wanted to eat you. And then the oak gave me a great blow which struck me senseless. I want a word with you presently, cat. But it will keep. Mummy, dear, he's insulting me. He wants to hurt me. Leave him alone, will you? You want me beat? Now we are at the entrance to the enchanted palaces where all men's joys, all men's happinesses are gathered together in the charge of fate. Are there many of them? Are they little? Oh, some are little and some are great. Here come some amiable and curious joys who will direct us. Do you know them? Oh, yes, I know them all. There are many more happinesses on earth than people think. <laughs> oh, here are some little ones. How very pretty they are. They are the children's happiness. 
Do you want to speak to them? Oh, it would be no use. They sing, they dance, they laugh. But they do not talk yet. Besides, they're in a hurry, you see. There, they've already passed. They have no time to waste, for childhood is very short. How do you do, Tilda? Who are you? Don't you recognize me? Well, no, I, I don't know you. I don't remember seeing any of you. Ted, do you hear? He has never seen us. <laughs> Why, my dear Tilda, I am the chief of the happinesses of your home. And all these are the other happinesses that live there. And there are happinesses in my home? <laughs> you heard him? Why, you little wretch, it is crammed with happinesses in every nook and cranny. Let me introduce myself first. The happiness of being well at your service. I am not the prettiest, but I am the most important. This is the happiness of loving one's parents, who is always a little sad, because no one ever looks at him. Till, till, you might inquire about the bluebird. It is just possible that the chief happiness of your home knows where he is. Oh, yes. Where is he? He doesn't know where the bluebird is. No, I, I don't know. And there's nothing to laugh at. Oh, come, don't be angry and let us be serious. He doesn't know. Well, what do you expect? He is no more absurd than the majority of men. Oh, now the great joy is becoming toward us. Oh, how beautiful they are. Why aren't they laughing? Aren't they happy? It is not when one laughs that one is really happy. Who are they? They are the great joys. Do you know their names? Of course. We often play with them. Here, first of all, before the others, is the great joy of being just. Behind her is the joy of being good. Who is the happiest? But the saddest. And there, far away in the golden clouds, the one whom I can hardly see when I stand as high as I can on tiptoe, that is the great joy of loving. You are ever so much too small to see her all together. What do the others want with us? Why are they standing aside? It is before a new joy who is arriving. Perhaps the purest that we have here. Who is it? Don't you recognize her yet? It is your mother's joy. It is the peerless joy of maternal love. Hildil and metal into my arms, the two of you. Oh, there is nothing on earth that can give greater happiness. Till, till, aren't you laughing? No, you are the metal. Don't you know your mother's love when you see it? Oh, you are like mummy, but you're much prettier. Why, of course. I've stopped growing old. And every day brings me youth and happiness. Each of your smiles makes me younger by a year. And that beautiful dress of yours, what is it made of? Is it silk, silver, or pearls? No. It is made of kisses and caresses and loving looks. Each kiss you give me adds a ray of moonlight or of sunshine to it. How funny. I should never have thought that you were so rich. Where used you to hide it? Was it in the cupboard of which Daddy has the key? No, no, I always wear it. But people do not see it. Because people see nothing when their eyes are closed. All mothers are rich when they love their children. There are no poor mothers, no ugly ones, no old ones. And when they seem to be most unhappy, it needs but a kiss which they received or give to turn all their tears into stars. Why, well, yes, it's true. Your eyes are filled with stars. They are really your eyes, only they're much more beautiful. Oh, it's wonderful, Mommy. You have the same voice also, but you speak much better than you do at home. At home, one has too much to do. There is no time. Do you understand, Tildil, dear? You believe yourself in heaven. But heaven is wherever you and I kiss each other. There are not two mothers, and you have no other. Every child has only one. And it is always the same one, always the most beautiful. But you have to know her and know how to look. But how did you manage to come up here? To find a road which men have been seeking ever since they began to dwell upon the earth. She brought me. Who is she? Light. I have never seen her. I was told she was very fond of you both and very kind. Why does she hide herself? Does she never show her face? Oh, yes. But she's afraid that the joys might be frightened if they saw too clearly. Light, you have been very good to my poor little one. I shall always be good to those who love one another.
right? We are in the kingdom of the future, in the midst of the children who are not yet born. We shall very probably find the bluebird here. Certainly the bird will be blue since everything here is blue. Oh, heaven, how beautiful it all is. Look at the children running up. Are they angry? Not at all. You can see they're smiling, but they are surprised. <laughs> They call us little live children because they themselves are not yet alive. What are they doing then? They are awaiting the hour of their birth. The hour of their birth? Yes. It's from here that all the children come who are born upon earth. Each awaits his day. When the fathers and mothers want children, the great doors which you see there on the right are opened and the little ones go down. What a lot there are. And may one talk to them? Certainly. You must make friends. Look, there is one who's more curious than the rest. Go up to him. Speak to him. How are you, Telltale? How are you, Telltale? Hello. How does he know my name? Come give me a kiss. And you too. Come give me a kiss. And you too, Mickle. It's not surprising that I should know your name, seeing that, that I should know your name, seeing that I shall be your brother. They have only just told me that you were here. They have only just told me that you were here. I was at the other end of the hall packing up my ideas. Packing up my ideas. Tell Mummy that I'm ready. What? Are you coming to us? Certainly. Next year on Palm Sunday. Tell Daddy to mend the crazy. Tell Daddy to mend the cradle. Is it comfortable? Is it comfortable? Is it comfortable in our home? Not bad. Comfortable in our home? Not bad. Comfortable in our home? Not bad. Go. Is it comfortable in our home? Not bad. Comfortable in our home? Not bad. Comfortable in our home? Not bad. What have you got in that bed? What have you got in that bed? What have you got in that bed? What have you got in that bag? Are you bringing us something? I am. What have you got in that bag? Are you bringing us something? I am paying three illnesses. Skylight Hank, are you bringing us something? I am bag, are you bringing us something? I am paying three illnesses. Skylight Hank, three illnesses. Skylight Hank, three illnesses. Skylight Hank, Tina, hoping cough and measles. Tina, hoping cough and measles. Tina, hoping cough and measles. Oh, that's all, is it? Oh, that's all, is it? Oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? Oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? Oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? Oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, and after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, and after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, and after that, what do you do? After that, oh, that's all, is it? And after that, what do you do? After that, and after that, what do you do? After that, and after that, what do you do? After that, I shall leave you. It'll hardly be. I shall leave you. It'll hardly be. I shall leave you. It'll hardly be worthwhile coming. We can't pick you worthwhile coming. We can't pick you worthwhile coming. We can't pick and choose. And choose. And choose. What's that? That's time. 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 While coming, we can't pick and choose. And choose. What's that? That's time. 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 He is going to open the gate. He is going to open the gate. Government. Where does that noise come from? Where does an old man who comes to call time? An old man who comes. True. Nothing at all. We have only 100. We have only 20. Enough! Enough! The anchor's raised! What is that? It's not they singing. It sounds like other voices. Yes. 
is the song of the mothers coming out to meet them. What are you doing here? Who are you? Why are you not blue? Do not answer. Blue. Do not answer. I have the blue bird. He's hidden under my cloak. Turn the diamond and let us escape. never guess where we are now. No, right, because I don't know. Don't you recognize that wall and the little door? It's the dear old house of your Philef just a year ago today. What is it, Light? You look quite pale. You look ill. <laughs> Nothing, child. I feel a little sad because I'm leaving you. Leaving us? Oh, I must. Yeah. The year is over. The fairy is coming back to ask you for the bluebird. But I haven't got the bluebird. The one of the land of memory turned quite black. The one of the future turned quite pink. The nights are dead and I couldn't catch the one in the forest. Is it my fault if they change color or die or escape? We've done what we could. It seems likely that the bluebird does not exist or that he changes color when he's caged. Where is the cage? Here, Master. And now I crave permission to add a few words. The lady's not been called upon to speak. Order! The uh, malevolent interruptions of a contemptible enemy, of an envious rival... Oh, would bread be without fire? A lump of shapeless and indigestible dough. Order! I won't be shouted down by you, Water. Uh, I Mr. wish, Bates. therefore, in the name of all, to take leave of the two distinguished children whose exalted mission ends today. What? You're bidding us farewell? Are you leaving us, too? Ah, I'm leaving you, but the separation will only be apparent. Come, the... come, the minutes are passing. The hour is at hand which will send us back into silence. Be quick and kiss the children. I first, I first. Goodbye, Tilt. Goodbye, little. Goodbye, my darlings. Think of me if ever you want anyone to set fire to anything. Oh, oh, he's burning me. Oh, oh, he's scorched my nose. Come, oh. fire. Moderate your transports. Remember, you're not in your chimney. But don't forget me. I'm the friend of man. I shall always be there on the hearth and in the oven. I shall kiss you without hurting you tenderly, my children. Now take care, you'll get wet. Love the wells, listen to the brooks. I shall always be there. Oh, she's flooded the whole place. I can say no more. My tears choke me and prevent my speaking. Doesn't sound like it. Think of me when you see the cistern in the tap. Is everybody going? Ah! Oh, 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 there, have you had enough? Do you want any more? There, there, there. Stop, down, Tylo, down, Tylo. Get away from your house, dear. It's the dog, Mrs. Light. He pulled my tail. He beat me, and I'd done nothing at all. Nothing at all. Never mind, you've had some, and you're going to have some more. Oh, my poor Tillette, where has he hurt you? Tell me, I shall cry too. Your conduct is all the more unworthy, Tylo, since you have chosen for this disgraceful exhibition the already most painful moment when we are about to part from these poor children. To part from these poor children? Yes, the hour is at hand. We are going to return to silence. We shall no longer be able to speak to them. Oh, no. No, no. I shall always talk. You will understand me, will you not, my little god? Yes, yes, yes. And we shall tell each other everything, everything. And I shall be very good. And I shall never steal anything in the kitchen again. Would you like me to kiss the cat? And you, Tillette, have you nothing to say to us? I love you both as much as you deserve. Now, let me and my turn, children, give you a last kiss. Oh, no, no. no. Oh, no, I shall tell Mummy. Do not cry, my dear little one. Never forget that I'm speaking to you in every spreading moonbeam, in every twinkling star, in every dawn that rises, in every lamp that is lit, in every good and bright thought of your soul. Listen, the hour is striking. Goodbye. The door is opening. In with you. In with you. Ooh, 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 ooh. You little lazy bones. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? It has struck eight and the sun is high above the trees. Wake up. Wake up, Tilltail. Hmm? Light, where is she? No, no, don't go away. Light? <laughs> Why, of course it's light. It's as bright as noonday. Mummy, Mummy, it's you. Of course it's I. 
pretty to think it was. I haven't changed my face since last night. Why do you stare at me in that wonderstruck way? Oh, how nice it is to see you again and how comfortable my bed is. Well, I'm back at home after my journey. What journey? Well, last year. Last year? Well, yes, at Christmas when I went away. When you went away? But you haven't left the room. I put you to bed last night, and here you are this morning. Oh, but you don't understand. It was last year when I went away with Mittel. Oh, dear. What? Oh, what in the world are you talking about? Ask Mittel if it isn't true. Oh, we've had such adventures. But, but why ask Mittel? What on earth do you mean? She was with me. We saw Granddad and Granny. With you? You saw Granddad and, and Granny? Yes, in the land of memory. It was oh. on our way. They're dead, but they're quite well. Tilville, have you found the key of the cupboard where, where Daddy hides, hides the brandy bottle? Does Daddy hide a brandy bottle? Certainly. One has to hide everything when one has little meddlesome good-for-nothings like you. Mommy, I don't know where it is. Oh, dear heaven. What is the matter with them, then? Oh, shall I lose them, too, as I lost the others? Daddy, Daddy Till, come quickly. The children are ill. Uh, They're very it? ill. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Oh, well, what's the matter? They don't look ill. They look very well. Oh, you can't trust their looks. I put them to bed quite quietly last night. And this morning when, when they woke up, everything was all wrong. They keep talking about a journey. They've seen light. And Granddad and Granny, who are dead, but who are quite well. Granddad still has his wooden leg. And Granny, who will the There, do you hear? Oh, run and fetch the dust. Why, quickly. no, no. They're not dead yet. Come, let us look into this. Come in. Well, good morning, and a Merry Christmas to you all. It's a very, very loon. <sighs> I've come to ask for a bit of fire for my Christmas stew. It's very chilly this morning. Good morning, children. How are you? Oh, very, very loon. I couldn't find the bluebird. What? What is he saying? Oh, don't ask me, Madame Bellingo. They've been like that since they woke up. Oh, they must have eaten something that wasn't good for them. Why, Tintil, don't you remember good Bellingo? Your neighbor, Berlingo? Well, yes, ma'am, you are the fairy Berry Loon. You're not angry with us. Berry? Berry what? Goodness gracious me. Berry Loon. Berlingo. You mean Berlingo. Berry Loon or Berlingo as you please, ma'am, but Middle knows. Oh, dear. That's the worst of it, that Middle also... Oh, that will soon go. I'll give them a smack or two. Oh, I know all about it. it it's only a little fit of dreaming. They must have slept in the moonbeams. My little girl who's very ill is often like oh. that. Oh, by the way, how is your little girl? Oh, only so-so. She can't get up. The doctor says that it's her nerves, and... Well, I know what would cure her. She was asking me for it only this morning, for her Christmas box. Yes, yes, I know. It's Tiltil's bird. Well, Tiltil, aren't you going to give it to her at last? What, Mommy? Your bird. It's no use. You don't even look at it now. And she's been dying to have it for ever so long. That's true, my bird. Where is he? Oh, there's the cage. Oh, he's blue. But it's my turtle dove. Much bluer than when I went away. Why, why, that's the bluebird we were looking for. He was here all the time. I'll take down the cage. There, Madame Berlingo. There you are. Oh. He's not quite blue yet, but that'll come. You shall see. Oh. Take him off quick to your little girl. Oh, do you mean it? Oh, I must give you a kiss. I fly, I fly. Yes, yes, be quick. Some of them change their color. I'll come back to tell you what she says. Daddy, Mommy, what have you done to the house? It's just as it was, but it's much prettier. How do you mean, it's prettier? Well, yes, everything has been painted and polished. It wasn't like that last year. Last year? Oh, how happy I feel here. Where's Fred? Oh, and then here's Tylo. Hello, Tylo. Oh, you had a fine fight. Remember in the forest? And Colette? Wow. Oh, he knows me. But he has stopped talking. Oh, fire. He's a good one. He crackles and laughs to make water angry. And water. Good morning, water. What does she say? He still talks, but I don't understand her as well as I did. Oh, Lord. How happy I am. Happy, happy, happy. So am I. So am I. Oh, dear. What are you spinning around for like that? Oh, don't mind them. And don't distress yourself. They're playing at being happy. Oh, how glad I feel. But why? I don't know, Mommy. Come in. Come in. Do you see the miracle? Oh, impossible. Can she walk? Can she walk? When she saw the bird, she jumped just like that with one bound at the window to see by the light if it was really Tiltil's dove. And then whoosh! 
bounced into the street like an angel clasping the dove in her arms. Oh, it was as much as I could do to keep pace with her. Oh, how like light she is. She is much smaller. Yes, indeed, but she'll grow bigger. What are you saying? Oh, haven't they got over it yet? Well, they're some better. It will be all right when they've had their breakfast. Oh, come along, child. Come along. Come and thank Tiltil. Thank you, Tiddle. Is the bird blue enough? Yes, I am so pleased with him. I've seen blue ones, but those which are quite blue, you know, do what you will, you can't catch them. That doesn't matter. He's lovely. Have you had anything to eat? Not yet. What does he eat? Anything. Corn, bread, Indian corn, grasshoppers. How does he eat? With his beak. Here, let me take him. I'll show you. Oh, Mother, he is gone. You flew away and out of the window. Oh, dear. Never mind. Don't cry. I'll catch him again. And if any of you who are listening should find him, would you be so very kind as to give him back to us? We need him for our happiness later on. So we have learned two things, or I hope we have learned two things from Mr. Metterlink's dutiful story. One, that the bluebird of happiness can usually be found close at hand, even if we possess it only for a moment. And the other, that after all, the fun is in the search for happiness as much as in its possession. Next week, we go back to the realistic drama with a ringing clang of jail gates. John Galsworthy's Justice will be the play. Same time, same theater. Today's performance of The Bluebird was produced under the direction of Mr. Joseph Bell, who also adapted the play for radio. Miss Irene Wicker was featured in the three parts of Maternal Love, Granny, and Mummy Till, while Mr. Burns Mantel presided as the commentator. The music was arranged and conducted by Mr. Joseph Hunty. Our distinguished cast included Kingsley Colton as Till Till, Patty Chapman as Mithill, Agnes Moorhead as the fairy, Barbara Weeks as Light, Eric Dressler as the Cat, Donald MacDonald as the Dog, John McGovern as Fire, Ian Martin as Bread, Burford Hamden as Sugar, Catherine Anderson as Water, Ara Gerald as Knight, Harry Neville as Gaffer Till, Charles Webster as the Oak, Arthur Hughes as Time, Winifred Toomey as the Willow, Lister Chambers as the Ass, and Ted Bergman as Luxury. Others included Peter Hughes, Ronald Liss, Lawrence Robinson, Joy Terry, Jeannie Elkins, Renee Terry, and Madeline Pierce. The Great Play series is an educational feature of the National Broadcasting Company. Next week, at this same hour, Justice by John Goldsworthy will be presented. A study manual, part one, giving complete background material for the great plays by Blevins Davis, who arranged for the series, is available to our radio audience at the cost of 10 cents. Send coin or money orders to the National Broadcasting Company in care of Great Plays, Radio City, New York. Consult your local library for reading material on the remaining great plays of the series. The Bluebird was a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. From Hollywood, Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake in a hard-hitting story of love and murder, The Blue Dahlia. Yes, transcribed by Ampex in Hollywood, the Screen Guild players brought to you each Thursday night by Camel Cigarettes.
night, Screen Guild Night, when Camel Cigarettes bring you your favorite stars in their greatest motion picture roles. Tonight, it's a thrill-packed, suspenseful murder yarn with the two great stars who made the picture so exciting. The Screen Guild players are proud to present The Blue Dahlia, starring Veronica Lake and Alan Ladd, with Will Wright and Gerald Moore. I don't know what I expected that night. Coming home suddenly like that after three years in the South Pacific. I don't know what I expected. I only know what I found. I walked in on a party. Very loud and very wet. I walked in and my wife was kissing another man. Johnny, you didn't let me know. I never dreamed. Daddy, I want you to be my husband, Lieutenant Commander Johnny Morrison. Hello. Johnny, this is Eddie Harwood. He owns that nightclub, the Blue Dahlia. You must have heard about it. Misty, you got the wrong lipstick on your face. I like it. Well, I don't. Don't. Well, that sort of broke up the party, I guess. He, he got rid of them fast and then came back to me. I remember I was standing by the table with little Dickie's picture in my hand. What are you doing with that? Just looking at Dickie. Why? Nothing. I need a drink. Helen, sit down and let's try to talk to her. I'd love to. I'm a girl that tries and tries. Why not begin by putting that glass down? Maybe I will when I finish this. You'll put it down now. Let go of my wrist. Take that pose off me. Okay. I'll put that glass down. Maybe you've learned to like hurting people. Well, I could tell you something about Diddy that would hurt you. A plenty. What about this? You owe me died of diphtheria. What happened? I said, what happened? Tommy, this could happen to anybody. I went to a cocktail party. I'd taken this for long. We were in a smash up. Why, you, I ought to... Take it easy, mister. A little noisy in here, ain't you? So you. My name is Newell. Most folks call me Dad. I'm paid to keep order in this hotel, and that includes these bungalows. Just doing my duty. Walking in without knocking? Those doors of the patio are open. Better close them. It's going to rain. Okay. Maybe you'd better close the blinds, too, if you're going to push your wife around. And never use a gun, sonny. Makes too much noise. Good night. I'd had enough. I couldn't take any more. I tossed the gun on the table, picked up Dickie's picture, and walked out. I walked out into the rain. I, I didn't know where. I, I just walked. And then later I was standing on Coringa Pass, standing there in the rain and watching the cars race out of Hollywood. And I guess I looked like I needed a lift because suddenly this convertible draws up and the door swings open and somebody says, Get in. Well, are you going to get in or not? You know, you could get wetter if you lay down on the gutter. Now you're making sense. I, uh, I wasn't trying to get wet. And you shouldn't be taking chances with strangers. Funny. Practically all the people I know were strangers when I met them. I'm going to Malibu. Is that any use to you? What's at Malibu? Houses, people. I have friends there. Any hotel? There's an inn. Why? You, uh, you pick up many people at night like this? Mm, not many. Only one or two at a time. You're right. Right. It wasn't funny. I'm sorry. Nothing's very funny to me tonight. I know. Sometimes it all blows up in your face. Hmm? What does? Life. Whatever you're doing. Wherever you're going. I thought you were going to Malibu. I flipped the coin. Heads I go to Malibu. Tails I go to Laguna. What happens if the coin rolls under the Davenport? Is that a Long Beach? <laughs> it's not bad. Oh, you can smile. Yeah. But I'd have to remember something. Remember what? Whatever it is, I'd rather forget. Hello, Eddie. It's Helen. I... What? What about Joyce? Just walked out on you, huh? Said she was going up the coast. 
That puts us in the same boat, I guess. Johnny walked out on me. Yeah, about an hour ago. How do you look, not scared? I gotta see you. No, not tomorrow, tonight. You come right over, you hear? That's what I said, and that's what I mean. You'll be over here in 30 minutes. Oh! <laughs> Look out of the truck. Pretty good idea to watch where you're driving. Sorry. I was looking at your bag. Those initials. Wondering what the JM stood for. You don't have to wonder, I'll tell you. Well, that's no fun. Let me guess. Jimmy? Why? Do you like Jimmy? I knew a boy named Jimmy once. He had rabbit teeth. That worry you? No. You, um... You sure that coin you flipped came up here? Why? Well, we passed Malibu 20 minutes ago. That worry you? No. This is the little towel I was telling you about. That's the inn. Sort of cute. I'd better go in and phone Malibu. They'll think something's happened to me. Oh, wait a minute, Doc. I'm getting out, too. Why? This is the end of the line. Is it? It has to be. It's a long way back to Malibu. All it takes is time. What about you? There's a motel sign up ahead. And tomorrow? I'll get a bus to somewhere. Just anywhere? As long as it's not back. Well, <laughs> this is why I'd say thank you if I, if I knew how. I didn't do it for thanks. Yes, I guess I know that. Don't you even say good night? It's not good night. It's, it's goodbye. I uh, I don't like to say goodbye. You don't have to. But it's been nice knowing me, hasn't it? No, it's over. It's just as though you'd never seen me before. Every guy's seen you before. Somewhere. The trick is to find you. I uh, I guess I didn't find you soon enough. So long. The hotel was clean and comfortable, not as it mattered. I couldn't have slept much anyway. I checked out in the morning, walked back to the inn to get some breakfast on the bus schedule. I left my raincoat and my bag at the cashier's desk and took a table overlooking the ocean. I was sitting there minding my own breakfast, trying not to think of the night before, and suddenly it jumped up and hit me right in the face. Good morning. Sleep well? What's the matter? Don't you remember me? I'm trying to. Say, uh... Whatever happened to Malibu? Oh, I guess it's right where we left it. I stay here at the end. What? Do I have to have a reason? No. Jimmy, why don't you go back and fix it up before it's too late? It's already too late. Fix what up? Whatever it is that sent you on a cruise to nowhere last night. Maybe you'd like me to mind my own business. Do you think you could? I could try. It's, um, uh, my wife. I have no idea it might be. And there's nothing to fix up. Even if there was, I wouldn't want to fix it up. How about you? Me? You weren't going to Malibu last night. You were just running out on yourself. Same like me. Maybe you're right. So, where do we go from here? We don't go anywhere. We said goodbye last night. Are you sure? That's the way it has to be. You will. I didn't say it was the way I wanted it to be. But still, you catch the bus up north. In an hour. I'll go back to Malibu. I can't think of anything better. That's right. Well, we could go for a walk along the beach first. Tide is out. Sure. You can go in waiting if you like. If I run upstairs to change my shoes, will you be here when I get back? Mm-hmm. Not like last night? No. Go ahead. I'll pay my check at the desk. All right. I'll only be a minute. You want to take this, miss? Oh, miss. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get some news on the radio. That awful thing last night. Now it... There it is now. Wilshire Boulevard Hotel. It has not yet been established that she was murdered. But police have been unable to trace her husband, Lieutenant Commander John Morrison. Huh? Lately returned oh. to the South Pacific. Yeah, miss, you, you want to take this check? Hmm? Oh, of course. Thanks. Can I get my bag now, please? Uh, yes, sir. Here you are. Anybody else from Los Angeles? What's this ready to leave? Anybody else? Uh, uh, wait for me. I, uh, I'm going with you.
Camel Cigarettes now present Act Two of The Blue Dahlia, starring Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake with Will Wright and Gerald Moore. It was 10,000 miles and 100 years to Los Angeles. If that bus had made one more stop than it did, I think I'd have tried to get out and walk. All the way back, I knew what I was going to do. I, I kept thinking of that house stick, Newell. He might know something. But then we got in, I ducked into a phone booth and put in a call. Newell? Yeah, he works here. But not this morning. Where is he? I, I've got to talk to him. He's downtown, mister. He's in conference with the police. You're sure that's the way it happened, Newell? You saw Harwood go up to the Stames bungalow and ring the bell. That's right, Captain. No answer, so he went away. Went away where? Well, Lieutenant, there's a side gate to the hotel grounds. He went out through that. Well, what time was it? About 7 o'clock. It was raining. You, uh, like to stand out in the rain? I have to make my round. See if anything's okay. That's a house detective's job. You got a pass key to the bungalow. Yes, I have it. Oh, wait a minute, gentlemen. You don't think that I... Why not? Lots of genial old parties like you commit murders. That ain't a very nice thing to say, Captain Hendrickson. Mrs. Morrison's lights were on. Her radio was going. Why would I try to get in? You tell us. She didn't answer when Harwood rang. Didn't that interest you? Would that be any of my business? <laughs> say, Captain, you and Lloyd here got a nice technique. Had me going for a minute. No hard feelings, of course. That's all, no. For now. You know, this is a terrible thing for the hotel. Yeah. Kind of tough on the Morrison game, too. Go on, beat it. Good afternoon, Mr. Harwood. No. Who let you in? Well, a house man's used to getting into places. I came in the back door. I thought... You thought what? I thought I'd better not be seen. I told the homicide boys a good straight story. I think they're satisfied, but you know those dicks? Tomorrow, they might get to figure and I was holding something back. Were you holding something back? Well, last night I kind of hung around for a while. I mean, after you rang Mrs. Morton's bell. Pretty wet, wasn't it? <laughs> Weather don't bother me. I used to be a copper myself. I didn't know you had a key to a bungalow. How much do they pay you on that job, Newell? Twenty a week and found. Not very much, is it? No, it's not the fact. It'd be nice if you could make a little more. By coming here. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Howard. You've got me all wrong. I just thought maybe you liked it. Shut up. I've only got a hundred on me here. Thanks, Mr. Howard. This show is nice of you. Did you say you were leaving? Leaving? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, it was. You're going out the back way, of course. Of course. Maybe next time I'll use the front entrance, huh? Yeah. Maybe. If there is a next time. I was running around in circles. I couldn't find Newell, so I went after Harwood. I put in a dozen calls for him that day. Always the same. Mr. Harwood isn't in. It was getting dark when I headed for his place, but I guess I wasn't the only one. Just as I was starting up the stairways into the lobby. Jimmy! Huh? What's you? What are you doing here? Never mind, get in. Get in, please. Here we go again. Do you want to be caught? How do you know anyone's trying to catch you? You had a navy raincoat in your initials. I read the papers. Jimmy, are you mad at me for trying to help? The name is Johnny. All right, Johnny. Johnny's a nice name, too. But Jimmy didn't have the cops after him. I think we'd better talk. Where? Up in the hill someplace. Go ahead. It's your car. <laughs> I've always liked it up here. Stand and look down at the whole city. Takes a lot of lights to make a city, doesn't it? Johnny, I know you didn't kill your wife. Do you? How? Just from knowing you. You don't know me that well. Well enough. But you think you have to find out who did kill her, don't you? Something like that. Maybe you're wondering why I don't leave it to the police. Have I asked any questions? You got a tag out for me. If they get me, they won't bust their brains trying to pin it on anyone else. But I'll get it. It's got to 
guy who killed my wife isn't getting away with it. He just thinks he is. You mean Eddie Harwood? I didn't mention any name. Who else could it be? I wouldn't know. Would you? Wasn't he playing around with your wife? You seem to know a lot of things. Do I? Like how to wait for me in front of Harwood's place. To get around him. And your timing's good. It was good last night when you picked me up. Or was it? I don't know. I don't know anything. I, I don't even know your name. You, you have to trust me, Johnny. I've got something to straighten out, too. You'll have to trust me a lot. I don't have any time to play games. Suppose you keep your secrets and let me keep mine. Okay, Johnny. That's the way you want it. Coming back? Hello, Mr. Harwood, please. Mrs. Harwood, calling. Eddie? Yes, it's George. Brad? Yes, I just got back from Malibu. Would you like to take me out to dinner? No, I want to go to my place first. I'll have to change. Yes, the blue dagger. About an hour. It was pretty dark walking down that hill alone. Somewhere along the way, I, I just and fell. Smashed the glass on Dickie's pushed in my pocket. Right on the boulevard under a street lamp, I took the picture out of the frame. I don't know what made me turn it over, but I, but I did. There's some writing on the back. Helen's writing, and it said, Johnny, if anything happens to me, Eddie Harwood, for your name, is Alice. The New Jersey police would like to know the charge is murder. Just a minute. Yeah, make it snappy, I... Mark, close the door. Nice to see you again, Martin. Am I allowed to ask why? Cut it, Howard. You know why I'm here. I don't. Would you mind if I finish dressing while we talk? In here. I don't like to seem rude, but I have a date in a little while, and I... What's the matter? Nothing, Howard. I just happened to notice that picture. On the way. My wife. She's pretty, isn't she? Yeah, she is pretty. You know... I don't figure you, Morrison. You stand there and look at a pretty girl, and half the cops in L.A. are looking for you. Only half? Well, all I have to do is pick up that phone. Oh, why don't I guess I'm not that kind of a rat. What kind of a rat are you? You rate yourself a pretty tough boy, don't you? Tough enough to find out who killed my wife. Everybody seems to think you killed her. Not everybody. I think you killed her. Don't be a dope. What reason would I have? Plenty. Take a look at this. A picture? Yeah. This one's pretty, too. See what's written on the back? Turn it over and read it. Mr. Bauer? Bauer. Might have known she'd stash it somewhere. Ellen wasn't the kind of a girl to toss this kind of information away. Should have found that out before you killed her. I didn't kill her. On the level, I didn't kill her, but I think I know who did. You better have proof. I expect to have it within an hour. Somebody's meeting me at the Blue Dahlia. If I figured it right, I... Oh! Where'd that come from? Stop! Hey, you stop! Back door. The alley. Yeah. Here, take it easy. Is it bad? I haven't got a chance. Listen, Morris. You've got to get over there. The, the blue dial. The blue... Howard. Howard. Hello, Chief. It's Lloyd. I'm at the Blue Dagger. Say, that hunch of yours was right on the beam. We've got a regular convention here. Yeah, they both came in. Yeah, okay, I'll wait, but hurry, will you? I'm kind of anxious for school to start. All right, now let's have it again, just for the record. Why did you come to the Blue Dahlia tonight? Speak up, no. Oh, this is silly, Captain. I told you once. Isn't that enough? We'll decide what's enough. Start talking. Okay. So Mr. Howard told me to come over. He used to hand me a few bucks every now and then, so I'd keep my mouth shut about him seeing Mrs. Morrison. Mrs. Howard, you'll have to excuse me. Under the circumstances... That's quite all right. 
I don't like this any better than you do. I'm afraid your likes and dislikes don't count at the moment, Mrs. Harwood. You still haven't told us where you were last night. Captain Hendrickson, you really don't believe I did it. All I know is you had plenty of reason. And it was a setup for you. The whole thing was easy. Easy? Sure, the gun was there. All you had to do was grab it, jam it up against your hat, and squeeze the trigger. He never even had time to scream, did she? How should I know I wasn't there? Then where were you? Why don't you tell us? Because he's trying to cover up for me. Johnny. Uh, Johnny who? Johnny Morrison. Hello, Morrison. Glad to see you. You're way off the course. You didn't kill my wife. She was 75 miles up the coast. Says who? Says the clerk at the end where she stayed all night. You can check it any time you want. How do you know all this, Morrison? He was with me. Got at the inn. I stayed at a motel up the road. I'd given him a lift. Picked him up in the rain. You can check that, too. We will. <sighs> Mrs. Harwood, you could have saved us a lot of trouble. Why didn't you tell us this before? Johnny was trying to find the murderer. He needed time. Sort of puts us in a hole, I guess, if your story stands up. No, well, we got Sadie Howard. Yeah, well, you haven't got him either. He was washed out tonight. Better send somebody to his apartment. All right. Yeah, I'll put in an answer. Well, I guess that wraps it up for tonight. You mean we can go? Yes, but you and Mrs. Howard better stay in sight till we check your story. After all, it is a coincidence. I mean, her picking you up. But it was raining. That's right, Captain. It was. It rained all the time. It was making my rounds. Must have gotten pretty wet, though. You sure did. Maybe you should have left your umbrella on the porch instead of letting it drip all over Mrs. Morrison's cup. I did leave it on the porch. I... Well, I mean, that is... You told us this morning you didn't go in. Well, yes, I know I did. But... What were you after? A little blackmail? Now, wait a minute. You got me all Maybe wrong. raising the ante because her husband came home. I resent that, Captain. What was she going to do? Report you to the management? Or was she going to let Harwood take care of you? Or maybe she was going to blow a hole in you herself. The gun was right there. All you had to do was grab it from her. Even a cheap little squirt like you could do that. Cheap, huh? Sure. A smile, a pat on the back, and a couple of dirty bucks. That's what they thought, her and Howard both. Well, maybe they found out a little different. Maybe I could be expensive for once, even if I end up in a... No, don't anybody move. You're crazy, no. Put on that gun. One more or less wouldn't matter now. I'm getting out of here, and I'm going alone. And if anybody wants to... Oh. Gentlemen, wait a minute. You've got me all wrong. Lloyd. Yes, Chief. He was backing out with that gun in it's his okay. hand. Uh, Better make that ambulance call a double. Well, here's my car, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. I guess it is. We seem to be saying goodbye again. I guess it's not the top this time. Oh. Look, uh, Last night when I made myself walk out on you, remember, I, I said every guy had seen you before, somewhere. I remember. But the trick was to find you. I remember that, too. Get in. Thanks. Now that we've settled back to comparative calm, here are our stars, Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake, to accept a final word of thanks for their exciting performances. Well, Vern, it's always a pleasure to appear with the Screen Girl players. All of us in Hollywood know how much this radio program contributes to the Motion Picture Relief Fund and to its country house and hospital. And we all consider it a privilege to share in that work. Right, Veronica? Absolutely, Alan. And for more reasons than one. Each week, our sponsors, the makers of Camel Cigarettes, send free smokes to servicemen's hospitals. Among other hospitals, free camels are being sent this week to Veterans Hospital Amarillo, Texas, U.S. Naval Hospital Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and U.S. Marine Hospital Savannah, Georgia. Happy smoking, fellows. Your cigarettes are on the way to you now with the compliments of camels. The Screen Guild players are directed by Bill Lawrence and transcribed by Ampex. The adaptations are by Harry Cronman. Remember, Thursday night is Screen Guild night. 
And next week, one of the most hilarious comedies ever brought to the screen. You'll laugh, you'll chuckle, you'll roar with delight. Yes, it's Bachelor Mother, starring Joseph Cotton, Lucille Ball, and Charles Coburn. Don't miss it for anything. The Blue Dahlia was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is Bride of Vengeance. Alan Ladd will soon be seen in the Paramount production, The Great Gatsby. Veronica Lake will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Flattery's Hurricane. One way to make your dreams of a new home, of travel, or of a college education for your children come true is to invest regularly in United States savings bonds. Start saving regularly now by buying United States savings bonds through the payroll savings plan where you work or through the bond a month plan where you bank. For fun and hilarity, don't miss Camel Cigarettes' other great show over these same stations. Tomorrow night, the Jimmy Durante Show with Dominici. And remember, Thursday night is Screen Guild Night. The greatest stars and the greatest stories brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. This is Burns Smith speaking. Music by Fred Waring follows next on NBC. <laughs> We present The Blue Cross, adapted by John Scotney, with Andrew Sachs as Father Brown. Parrots and Fox and Docks and Harbour Board Key Number 5, no admittance except on authorised business. Well, that's us, sir. Uh, this can't be the one, there's no one about. Uh, there wouldn't be nothing this way. No, I'm, I mean a big passenger ferry. There'd be customs, porters, people milling about. We are very late, Inspector. Thank you, Sergeant. How was I to know there were two flipping harbours at Harwich? Look, sir. What? There's someone. What? There were the parcels. And the umbrella. Yeah, that is a Catholic priest, Sergeant, and therefore almost certainly a foreigner. Oh. Anyhow, he looks as lost as we are. Still, there's no harm in trying. Um, excuse me. Uh, hey, who? Monsieur, excusez-moi. Oh, no. May have you... Pardon me, monsieur. Uh, je, je ne... Je, um, oh. Well, that is, um, parliamo l'italiano. Oh, God, what's Italian? Um, are you a uh, speaker to English? English? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I am English. What? I thought you were French. Uh, well, now, look, in that case... Hey, I I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sir. We're, we're in a hurry. Do you know where we can find the ferry boat from Holland? We've got to meet someone off it. Oh, oh well, yes, indeed. Now... Uh, you see that green funnel? Over green the, funnel, yes. Over the shed there? Yes. Well, that's yes. it. Oh, right. Thank oh, you. but oh. I'm afraid you've missed your friend. What do you mean? You see, I think... Uh, no, I'm certain I was the last one off. Oh. Uh, we docked an hour ago. An hour ago? Oh, oh, this is very quick nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike the last uh, time I came back from Rome this uh, way, it was... Yeah. Well, oh, it must have been ten years ago. Yeah, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. Oh, yes. Yes. And, and the next thing you know, we'll all be going by flying machine. Uh, right, uh, Now, look, we've got to get to the train station quick. Come on, Sergeant. Oh, thank you train much, station? Stephen. I was going to get to the... <laughs> Hurry up, please. Hurry along there. Uh, is this the uh, boat train, Porter? Yes, sir. Hurry up, though. It's going in a few minutes. All oh, right. Uh, well, we'd better get on the train and hope our man's on it. Half a mo, Inspector. Hmm? Isn't this him? Here, what? by the ticket barrier. He fits the description. Boater, blazer, black beard. Yeah, yes, right you are, yes. Um, excuse me, sir. Are you uh, Monsieur Valentin? Monsieur Aristide Valentin? I am. Ah, oh, I am Inspector Bagshaw of Scotland Yard. I've got my card here. Yeah. Somewhere or other. Uh, th this is uh, Sergeant. Um, what, what did I do with my oh, Inspector sorry. Bagshaw, you are extremely oh. late. Oh. Fortunately, I managed to be the first off the boat and have been checking the passager. He has not passed. Oh. Who exactly are you looking for, sir? Uh, I mean, uh, Commissioner? Not Commissioner. Prefect of Police, or to my men, Chef. Chef, sir. In France, it does not mean cook, Sergeant. No, the man is called Flambeau. Uh, Flambeau? It means the torch. Well, I knew that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> His real name, they say, is Duroc. Maybe he has many names. He is a colossus of crime. Indeed, in the Paris underworld, he is all-powerful. Oh. I follow him from Paris to Gaunt to Brussels to Rouen. Yeah. I am certain he is on the packboat. Oh, definitely. All night, all morning, I search the passager. Hmm? Nothing. But... He is a master of these guys, this one. Any particular disguise, sir? Anything, Sergeant. <laughs> Once he disguised himself as a post box. <laughs> sir? Well, to be exact, he set up a false post box and hid behind it to await a particular letter. 
Mostly, though, he's a priest. A priest, of course. It is said he once studied for the priesthood. That priest we saw with the umbrella and the parasol. Hang on, sir. That priest we saw. I just said that, Sergeant. Uh, no, sir. Look. Huh? Here he comes now, what? through the entrance. Of course. Strike me. Uh, grab him. Aris, I will. Aris, I will. What is it? What is it? Oh, please. don't speak no, no, French, no, no, eh? Don't you, monsieur? Flombo. Uh, uh, pick up that parcel, uh, sergeant, uh, and watch out. It looks like a gun. No, be I, careful. I, 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 please, please. Oh. Uh, 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 no, sir. No, it's a... It's a crosser. Uh, this man cannot be Flombo. Uh, He's what, uh, somewhat on the short side, and Flambeau is what, uh, somewhat more than two meters over six foot four. And he is a magnificent athlete, almost an acrobat. <laughs> Why, this gentleman... Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, I'm very sorry, Your Reverence. Oh, no, no, please, it's yeah. quite all right. What is this, oh. Father? Oh, this cross? Oh, may I? Oh, yes, please do. Magnifique. Uh. Romanesque work. What, about uh, uh, 1160? Uh, yes, yes. The silver is worked uh, so, and, and the stones, uh, see, Sergeant, uh, they must be sapphires, you? uncut sapphires. Uh, nicked, is it? Uncut. North French work? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, you see, it was supposed to have belonged to the Blessed St. Thomas. Uh, Aquinas. Uh, no, no, Beckett. Ah, uh, English, Martyr, you know. Yes, And yes, as I was yes, coming back to work in London, I was asked to bring it from the papal treasury. It's, yes. it's for the exhibition in Canterbury. Yes. You, you may have seen the advertisement in the Catholic Times. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Here, Father, you must take care of it. Thank you. It is valuable. Yes, thank you. These are, you say, precious yes. stones. Oh, precious, oh. Yes, well, that would be the word, precious. Yes, now, my train, you must excuse me. Oh, thank, you. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au Well, that's it, I suppose. Hey, wait a minute, sir. Hmm? Weren't we supposed to get that train? Was that the London train? Um, Matt. Oh, no. Um, no. Uh, Porter, yes, sir. when's the next London train? Uh, one in half an hour, sir. But it's rather slow, I'm afraid. Oh, yes, it would be. Inspector, have oh, you uh, a cup? Uh, now, now, uh, Porter, uh, did you notice a very tall gentleman getting on the train dressed as a priest? Or a postman? Uh, Sergeant. Uh, uh, sorry, sir, a, a priest? Yes. No. Uh, no, that gentleman's the only priest I saw. Uh, no, the only tall man was one of the sailors. Now, he really was tall. What? But I was the first on the boat. Why did I not see him? Ah, you might have been the first passenger, sir. But any crew members who want to go to London, we always let them on the train early. It keeps them out of the bars, you see. <laughs> Why did I not think of the crew? Fool, I was on a ship. Yeah. So it has sailors. <laughs> uh, one, one minute, Porter. Uh, that train is direct to London non-stop, is it? Yes, sir. Good. Where is your telegraph office? Just at the end of the platform, sir. Okay. There, you can see it. Right. I'm going to telegraph the railway police at Liverpool Street to tell them to hold that tall sailor. At last, Liverpool Street Station. He was right about it being slow. That porter. It is uh, very flat, your East Anglia. Uh, oh. Uh, well, we'll soon know if they got him. Oh, no. No. Oh, what is it? What shall we do yes, with it? all right, thank you, Sergeant. It's that us with the whole crew, that constable's got me. They don't look very cheerful, do they, Inspector? <coughs> Constable? Yes, sir. I'm Inspector Bagshaw. All present and correct, sir. What on earth is going on here? I only wanted one sailor, not all of them. Yes, sir. Well, we weren't quite sure which one you wanted, sir, oh. so we thought it best to hold them all. Oh. I mean, none of them exactly fits your description. <sighs> I mean, they're none of them what you call tall, are they? No. Sir. Did any tall man get off that train? No, sir. Well, I'll tell a lie. Ah. There was one very tall gentleman, but he was a You won't believe this, sir, but he was he was a Roman Catholic priest. Tell me about this priest. Well, it was funny. <laughs> Ridiculous, really. He was... 
not the same, very tall. And with him was this short, plump, yeah, little priest. Frankly, sir, I think the short one was a bit, you know... Simple? Yeah. He got into a terrible muddle with this brown paper parcel and his big umbrella. He dropped one parcel looking for his ticket. Worried him, he burst open. And this blue cross in it. Mm. That? That's when the tall one appeared. And came to the little one's aid. A nice gentleman, French, I think. They went off together. I didn't see which way they... Oh. He changed. On the train. Before. Uh, you can dismiss your naval review, Constable. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, move along there. Oh, I right. think uh, I need uh, a nice cup of tea. Uh, Monsieur uh, Valentin. Uh, tea? No, no. Ah, hmm? oh, but perhaps a cup of coffee? There's a tea room in the railway hotel, yes, sir. Yes, very well, Sergeant. Lead the way. <laughs> One black coffee and one large pot of tea. Yes, thank you. Ah. <clears throat> oh, this is terrible, terrible, absolutely terrible. Are you all right, sir? Oh, I don't worry, Sergeant. They're very emotional, the Latins. I'll handle this. Uh, come now, Monsieur Valentin. We'll find him. The Metropolitan Police, finest police force in West... Find him? Who? Flambeau? Oh, he's always escaping. No, no. I was complaining it was the coffee in France. They warned me about English coffee, but this is unbelievable. I put sugar in. It still tastes awful. Well, sir, you should have had tea. When in Rome, eh? Warm the pot, let it stand three minutes, put the milk in first... And now the tea. Finally, exactly one and a half teaspoonfuls of sugar. Stir. And uh, cheers. <laughs> oh, it's terrible, terrible, absolutely terrible. It's, it's poisoned. I don't think so. When you were putting the sugar in, I noticed... Uh, mm. Waiter, sir. I want you to taste the sugar in that bowl. Sir, go on, taste it. Mm, salt. It's salt. I'm most terribly sorry, gentlemen. Oh, may I just check? Yes. Uh, yes, there's sugar in the salt cellar. Oh, well, I demand to know who's responsible. Uh, uh, oh, you know, I do believe it must have been those two clergymen. Well, the ones that threw soup at the wall. Threw soup at the wall? Yes, sir, you can see the mark over there. <laughs> they came in earlier and had coffee. Both very quiet, respectable people. <laughs> one paid the bill, and the other one dragged behind, and, and suddenly he threw some soup from a half-empty cup against the wall. <laughs> and the funny thing was, one was very tall, and the other was very Stop. short. Stop. And, Stop. And, Stop. and he carried a big umbrella, umbrella yeah, and some brown, brown paper, paper parcels. Yes, sir, exactly. Do you know that? And it was the tall one who threw the soup. No, sir, the short one. Oh. I went after them. They were too far off, though. I could just see them in the distance going round the corner into Carstairs. Carstairs, Kate. Out the front, right and then left. Oh, I know this. Yes, Sergeant. Keep the change. Thank you very much, sir. But they must have left half an hour ago. Somewhere a man must begin. Look carefully. Who knows? Perhaps some oddity that might have caught the eye of the pursued might also catch the eye of the pursued. Oh, Speaking of oddities, sir, what? look at this green grocer's store. Lovely apples. See, best tangerine oranges, two of ten. Finest Brazils, fourpence a pound. Yes, they are expensive, Sergeant, but I confess I don't see the relevance. But, but, sir, the price tickets for the oranges have been put on the nuts. And the one for the nuts substituted for the ticket for the oranges. And where have we met this highly subtle form of humour before? Excuse me, my good man. Yeah? There are two price tickets wrongly placed on your store. I ask, is there some connection between these nuts and oranges? And you two are. clergymen, one tall, the other short? What? Oh, I didn't notice that. There. As for those clergymen, I don't know what you've got to do with them. But if you're one of their friends, you can tell the short one I'll knock his block off if he upsets my apples again. Yes, I'm Inspector Bagshaw here. My car... Um, my car... Um, is it something? And, and never mind, what's this about upsetting your apples? Oh, uh, it's uh, not a police matter, Inspector. Huh? If you ask me, that little parson was drunk. <laughs> he knocked over all my apples. Hmm. Did you see which one they uh, went? Sergeant, yeah, they excuse me, did you... Yeah, they took one of them uh, yellow horse omnibuses over there. Them was going to Hampstead. 
It was just leaving. That's why I didn't catch him. And so, shall we take one of those buses? Well, come on, Inspector. Oh, uh, uh, well, well, wouldn't it be uh, better uh, to take the motor taxi, sir? Well, it's full time to squint. Besides, I've never been in a... Well, that's too late. Oh. If only we knew where we are going. If you know what a man is doing, get in front of him. But if you want to guess what he's doing, keep behind him. Here, we'll go upstairs. I'm afraid it's not the time of year for an open bus stop. I'm sorry. All we can do is to keep our eyes skinned for some strange thing. What sort of strange thing, sir? Any sort of strange thing. We will have, I think, very soon one of your famous London fogs. Yes. This journey seems to have lasted for hours. That last place, the draggled taverns, the dreary scrubs, it seemed it was the end of the universe. No, sir, cams in town. Look, they're lighting the gas. Five and twenty to five. Oh, yes, yes. The nights really are drawing in now, what with the fog and the dark. We won't be able to see a thing soon. It's all right. Sir. Look! Look there! That restaurant place where the lights were lit. Our queue at last. The broken window. Stop the bus driver. Sir? Si, senor, si. It was the padre. He broke my window. Uh, The, uh, the short one. Si. Uh, He and his friends, they have tea here. After they're leaving, I find the big one pays six, seven times to wash. I call after the other priest. He come back. I pick up the bill to show him. Mm -hmm. And madre mia, I could have sworn I put one shilling and sixpence on the bill. But there was eleven shillings and sixpence. Now, the small priest, he say, I am sorry to confuse your accounts, but the extra ten shillings will pay for the window. What window, I say? The one I am going to break. He say, and he push his umbrella through the glass. He marched out to join his friends in they go so quick up to Bullock Street. I went on, but I, I did not seem worthwhile to follow. And the other one, he was a priest, but he was a very he big man. Thank you, Signor Gabrielli. Bullock Street. Bullock Street. Bullock Street. Bullock Street. Yes, Bullock Street. Yes. Well, there we are. This is it. Bullock Street. Dead as a dodo. Yes. Well, but what? what what do we do now? I am flummoxed. I, I, I think it's time for another of your brilliant intuitions, sir. I'm afraid, Inspector, I too am flummoxed. Oh. In that case, gentlemen, might I suggest that we try more routine police methods? Huh? We could make inquiries. How so? Well, we could ask in this shop here. Um, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's a good idea, Sergeant. Yes, yes. Uh, good thinking. Well, uh, now, leave this to me. Oh. Can I help you, gentlemen? Yes, uh, good evening, madam. We are police officers. Uh, here is my... Ca- um, I've got, no, I'm show the lady your warrant card, oh, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, yeah, in pursuit of... If you come inf- about the parcel, I sent it off already. Parcel? I mean the parcel the gentleman left. The clergyman. Two clergymen? Yes, sir. These two clergymen, they came in about 20 minutes ago. Y- yes, yes, and, and, and then what, yes? They bought some peppermints. Bought some pe- Anyway, a few minutes later, one of them came back. Have I left a parcel? Well, yes, yes. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't see one. So he says, never mind, but if it should turn up, please post it to this address. And he left me the address and a shilling for my trouble. Well? Well, sure enough, I thought I'd looked everywhere, but I found he had left a brown paper parcel. Ah. So I posted it, somewhere in Canterbury. Oh. But as and the thing seemed so important, I thought perhaps you police had come about it. Well, so we have. Oh, yes. Have you any idea which way they went, the clergyman? Oh, yes, sir, the one that came back. Oh, I should think he was up from the country, a bit slow, you know. Yes, but simple. Yes, he asked me the way to Amsterdam. Eve. Straight up there, I said. But you want to be careful, what with the dark and this fog. And the rain. Yes, I must, he said. Got me to draw him a map, show him the best way across... 
Then he dashed off and forgot it. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, oh that's funny. I don't remember that cross, funny. Mm -hmm. You see that little cross? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is funny. Yes, it is. Thank you. You have been most helpful. Yes. Um, I'll take the map, if I may, madam. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good night. Oh, it's a tall order, isn't it? Hampstead Heath on a night like this. Oh, look. look at the fog now. What a piece, super. Well, what do you think, sir? It's obvious Flambeau sees the sapphire cross when the priest drops it. Mm -hmm. What an opportunity. He is disguised as a priest. Quite naturally, he falls into conversation with his brother priest. Uh, Flambeau does not know London, but he knows Hampstead Heath. It's one of the very few empty places in this crowded city. A mm. place where he can get the priest on his own and commit the robbery without attracting attention. Precisely. That's good point. He lures the priest here. A man like Flambeau could lead that gullible, innocent little simpleton by the nose to the North Pole if he wanted to. Yes, yes that's all very well, but I still don't understand. The soup on the wallpaper, the, the, the apples, the broken window. And what about the cross on the map? The cross! You have to make a wish in the place marked at once. Charge the church with lowering reason, but it's just the other. Look, way. I'm afraid that I there they are. Them. There on the bench, you can just make them out through the fog. Exactly the spot marked on the map. Oh, exactly. yes. We'll creep up on them. Oh, yes. These modern infidels appeal to reason, but who can look at those millions of stars and not feel that there may well be wonderful universes above us where reason is utterly unreasonable? No, no reason is always reasonable. And alone on earth, the church makes reason really supreme. Alone on earth, the church affirms that God himself is bound by reason. Yet who knows if in that infinite universe No, there's... no, no, no. Reason and justice grip the remotest and the loneliest star. You can imagine any mad botany or geology you please. Think of forests of adamant with leaves of brilliance. Think the moon as a blue moon, a single elephantine sapphire. But don't fancy that all that frantic astronomy would make the smallest difference to the reason and justice of conduct. On plains of opal, under cliffs cut out of pearl, you would still find a notice board, Thou shalt not steal. Hmm. So, you know, little priest. Well, then, you had better hand over the sapphire cross. <sighs> no. We are all alone here. I could pull you to pieces like a straw doll. Oh, I'm sure you could, but you see, I don't have it. I left it behind in the sweet shop. Eh? You remember I went back to ask if I'd left a parcel? Well, I hadn't, but I did then, if you see what I mean. Uh, I, I don't believe you. Uh, give me those parcels. Uh, uh, oh, oh. 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 j'ai un pistolet. Sacré nom d'amis. Oh. Valentin, oh. qu'est-ce que vous faites ici? All right, stay where you are, oh. both of you. <laughs> Well, well, my little bumpkin. It seems you are remarkably fortunate. Who could have expected the head of the Paris police here? Well, as a matter of fact, I rather expected him. Put away that gun, will you, Monsieur Valentin? Please, that's not our way in this country. What do you mean you expected me, father? Well, I recognised you from the newspaper, so I realised you must be pursuing someone. And then this gentleman... Only I wasn't sure, and uh, it would never do to make a scandal against one of our own clergy. I, um... I had to test you, Monsieur Flambeau. How long? <laughs> Is a man generally makes a small scene if he finds salt in his coffee? Mm. If he doesn't, he has some reason for keeping quiet. I changed the salt and sugar. You kept quiet. Yes. A man usually objects if his bill is six times too large. If he pays it, he has some motive for being unnoticed. I altered the bill, you pay. And, and what about the, the soup and, and the apples, the, the window? Ah, well, Mr. Flambeau would not leave any tracks for you to follow, so somebody had to. But, as a matter of fact, another part of my trade, too, made me sure you weren't a priest. What? You attacked reason. That's bad theology. <laughs> Priest, I salute you. And now, monsieur, adieu. Tally ho! Oh, 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 I see! Oh, what a jump! What a, oh, quick, oh, open, sergeant! What a jump! Hey. I'll bring him down. No, 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 no gunplay. Sergeant, go that way. I'll go this way. No, I'll tell you, stay there. Oh, fools, yes. fools, fools, fools. I had him in my... Oh. Oh. Still, after all, 
Perhaps I could not wish to have shot the famous flambeau. Oh. <laughs> Tell me, priest, what made you suspect him? Oh, well, <laughs> well, there was, there was a little bulge up the sleeve of his cassock. Ah, I thought, the spiked bracelet. The spiked bracelet. How in Tartarus did you ever hear of this spiked bracelet? Oh, one's little flock, you know. <laughs> well, when I was a curate in, uh, in Hartlepool, uh, there were three of them with spiked bracelets. <laughs> yes. You know, a man who spends half his time hearing confession is um, unlikely to be unaware of human evil. Yes, perhaps it's you police who are the more innocent. Your duty is to arraign men in the public court before a judge. Mine is to absolve them in the sealed secrecy of the confessional before the highest judge of all. And naturally, they conceal their evil deeds from you. To me, they tell them. <laughs> Ah, here's the inspector. Oh, are you hurt? Are you hurt, inspector? Twist me ankle. Oh, oh, oh just, just, just sit down. Yes, oh. please, yes. Oh. Oh. oh, oh, that's better. Oh, this fog. We'll never get him now. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, sir, I'll, uh, I'll have to make a report on this. I'll need your name. Uh, just oh, me. well, yes, yes, of course. No, but, uh, it's, it's Brown. Where's my name? Jay Brown. Uh, it's a father, um, Brown. Of course, I suppose that's... Um, damn it. I, I say... Well... Have you... Well, I, I seem to have... Look, my umbrella. Well, I, I can't find my notebook. Uh, can I... Uh, borrow your... Uh, notebook? Oh, oh, In The Blue Cross by G.K. Chesterton, the part of Father Brown was played by Andrew Sachs. Flombeau, Olivier Pierre. Bagshaw, Bill Wallace. Sergeant, Alan Thompson. Lady shopkeeper, Ellen McIntosh. Restauranteur, Trader Faulkner. Valentin, John Abineri. Constable, Trevor Nichols. Porter, Graham Blocky. Waiter, Robin Summers. The Blue Cross was adapted by John Scotney and directed in Bristol by Alec Reed. <laughs>